And the reason these soya seminars exist is uh, to, to try and create an intellectual uh, or scholarly community where there isn't one yet. Um, and we put this proposal in in 2019, recognizing that there were many people kind of uh, distributed around the world working on similar questions that we wanted to try and bring together. And so myself and a team of organizers who I'll mention in a moment um, proposed this, uh, this project and, and we're, we're lucky enough to receive funding from the Mellon Foundation to try and build out that community or at least create opportunities for, for, for these people to meet. And our mailing list now connects about 500 people around the world and we encourage you to join it to take part in our meetings if this interests you. And as uh, Professor Groman mentioned, one of the kind of points that, or one of the things that we've uh, launched is research and collaboration awards. Uh, both uh, Professor Groman and Bruno Breschi, who's gonna speak later, uh, have, have been recipients of those awards. So I'm gonna briefly introduce four kind of themes that we have um, uh, congregated around to set up a bit of the work that we're doing. And I'm gonna try and make this quick. And if you have questions afterwards, please uh, be in touch. Um, so when we started this, the four themes we chose were first uh, hidden labor, uh, looking at the kind of uh, the question of hidden labor within histories of AI. So how has AI, along with prefigurative traditions and derivative applications, served to value and devalue certain forms of cognitive labor and systems of recognition via uh, allusions to automation? So we have historians uh, like Larry Dalston, who shows that in the 19th century, uh, when calculation was debased from genius to the kind of merely mechanical, uh, it was at that time that it became the domain of human computing to be executed by low paid laborers and regendered as women's work, uh, as Hicks and uh, Ms. Nensminger have, have also explored. Second theme is disingenuous rhetoric. What role has rhetoric played in shaping the imaginaries that surrounded past forms of automation and faux mechanical sentience? Who controls the rhetoric around AI and who benefits from certain framings of these technologies? We found this a kind of useful construct to, to use as we, as we have our uh, debates each month. And to give you an example here, Simon Schaffer has shown that in, in 1834, two models of Charles Babbage's government funded difference engine were made by the instrument maker Francis Watkins, an electrician and showman at the Adelaide Gallery, a leading London showcase for new engineering. And Schaffer notes that even when the engine had been abandoned, Babbage insisted it should be placed where the public can see it. And it was put on display in Con King's College London's museum and to my knowledge still travels through museums today, you know, knowing that it, it, it was a, a kind of failed effort. And Astor Taylor has characterized the contemporary overselling or exaggeration of AI's abilities as photomation. So that's what we try to address there. Uh, on encoded behavior, we ask how have learning systems of this variety tended to discipline the behavior of their use of ACE in surrounding communities? In what way has the informational infrastructure required to make such systems learn, in fact, pressured individuals and communities to act in the ways predicted from supposedly analogous cases? So another example here would be Caitlin, Lose Caitlin Rosenthal, who's a historian of 18th to 19th century management practices, uh, who's shown that uh, plantation owners in that period uh, went about automating the lives of slaves as cogs in a system based on factory automation techniques. Uh, and there are parallels between the sophisticated actuarial practices of plantation owners and those of 21st century business owners uh, uh, echo. Some of these, these um, parallels echo in the work of Karen Levy, another historian whose recent work examines how electronic monitoring systems in the trucking industry are used to force compliance and automation upon employees. Um, the final item uh, on cognitive justice asks how these traditions remade concepts of knowledge and knower uh, and, and basically challenges uh, the idea or asks whether injustices posed by AI are not merely epistemic, but are also ontological insofar as they involve the marginalization of bodies and their dehumanization. Now, um, it's, I'll just say briefly on this one uh, that we... Um, we ask whose system of knowledge does AI represent and embolden and, um, and ask people not just to critique the enduring legacy of labor fulfilled by exotic others under the slick guise of automation, uh, but to see how that re is recreated today, for example, in Amazon's Mechanical Turk platform, which takes its name from patronizing Enlightenment era discourses about Orientalism. So that's a kind of broad overview of what this community uh, meets to discuss. Um, as you'll see, these were these were the original themes and we're questioning now one of the things that doesn't figure 
in uh, what I've just described is race. And so, for example, we're questioning whether racial capitalism would be a better framing than hidden labor. Um, but I'm sure these are the sort of debates that this community is going to have today. So I will leave it at that. Um, I'm going to drop some links into the chat after this uh, introduction, which will end in a moment. But I just wanted to flag that we currently have open a call for papers uh, for a proposed journal special issue on histories of AI uh, with 300 word abstracts due on uh, Wednesday of this week at midnight British time. We also have a summer school that we'll be hosting, uh, which is available to everyone to participate with four great keynotes uh, in mid-July. Please join our mailing list, which is the, the green link uh, below uh, to get news of not only this summer school, but of our monthly reading group and methods trainings and community events. And also check out the HOAI website and Slack channel. And we will also soon be launching a syllabus on historical perspectives on the political economy of AI. So, Lots going on, we'd love to collaborate with you. And I'll share these links in a moment so you have them. The final thing I'll say, just a, a, uh, some of my own historical work that I'm, I'm looking forward to engaging with anybody on really. I, in my dissertation I've just published, I, I venture that AI should perhaps be understood from a historical perspective as a branch of political science parsed through the tool, tool set of computer science. Historians must probe and challenge the extent to which certain social orders have tended to be reified under the guise of AI ossifying as it does particular views of the nature of the mind. So that is what uh, we have been up to and what the community continues to interrogate. And we would love uh, for you to join us. Um, and thank you very much for putting on this event and congratulations on the massive response that it's had. Thank you, Johnny, for your amazing work. Now we will uh, welcome to Bruno Moreski, a multidisciplinary artist and also research fellow at the Histories of AI project. Currently, he's a, he's a postdoc researcher at the University of Sao Paulo, researching arts and artificial intelligence, and senior researcher at the Center for Arts, Design, and Social Research. Welcome, Bruno. Good morning. Thank you. Thank you, Rafael. Hello, everybody. Well, uh, I think I will be very short because I, I, I really want the event to start soon because the the, the programmation and the guests are amazing. So my name is Bruno uh, Moreski. I'm also work uh, on a group that the name is Group on uh, Artificial Intelligence and Art at the University of Sao Paulo. And I also have the privilege of being part of this project, The History of AI, a genealo genealogy of power at the University of Cambridge. Um, I'm doing uh, several research on, on, on the Turkers, people who work on the Amazon Mechanical Turk website, and, and this kind of works helps to train the AI systems. Um, uh, about the group of the uh, University of Cambridge, I think this group was the best thing that happened in this pandemic, at least one thing, because of this power virtual encounters that we have every month. And Rafael recently joined at the History of AI and with this powerful uh, uh, event, History of AI, Imaginaries and Materialities. Uh, it will be two days, today and tomorrow, and we'll have uh, amazing conversations and exchanges. So who those who, ha who have not seen the programmation yet, I'm, I'm really suggest to, to go to the DigiLabor website and see the teams and the guests. We will have conversation about AI and, and relation with imaginaries, infrastructures, colonialism, vocabulary and design, automation, economics, genders, work and music. So it, it has AI for all tastes and preferences. Uh, uh, well, um, to, to welcome everybody, I just want to remember a, 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 a really important, at least for me, a really important Brazilian philosopher. Uh, his name is Alvaro Vieira Pinto. Uh, and during the 70s, uh, he, he thought critically about technology um, from a Brazilian and also, I think, a, a Latin American perspective. And his research was so powerful that uh, was inspired um, incredible thinkers like Paulo, Paulo Freire. And, and Pinto is the author of a book 
uh, and the name of the book is The Concept of Technology, O Conceito da Tecnologia. Uh, in it's almost 5,000 pages that I think need to be better known, not here in Brazil, but also around the world. And in this book, the author repeats something that I think is very interesting for us here to start this, this event. And he wrote that uh, in, in several parts of the book that machines must always be thought and activate from the idea of human. So from the exchange agreements and disagreement between people, then the machines arise. And that's why there is no way to forget that every machine has a, a social function made possible by exchange between, between people. So I think that is exactly what we, we're trying to do here. Uh, work together, think together about technology, but also about people and, and better ways to exchange knowledge uh, from a social perspective. So it's just an initial thought for the beginning of the event. Thank you very much and welcome everybody. Thank you very much, Bruno. Uh, Alvaro Vieira Pinto was a great Brazilian philosopher uh, on concept of technology and education and work uh, from a Brazilian uh, in, developer, in underdeveloped countries. Uh, it's a very interesting way. Well, uh, now we will welcome uh, Professor Ana Paula da Rosa, coordinator of Postgraduated Program in Communication at the Unicinos University. Thank you for having us, Ana Paula. Good morning, Rafael. Good morning, everybody. First, I want to thank you everyone for their presence and the partnership of the Digital Labor Group and the University of Cambridge. I would like to emphasize the importance of this theme in the disputes over symbolic, economic, and social power that are mobilized when we deal with artificial intelligence, especially when expressions and nomenclatures hide inequalities and unknowns. On behalf of the PPG in Communication Science, a great event for everyone. Thank you very much, Ana Paula. Finally, for this uh, opening session, uh, we will welcome Professor Dorothea Kirsch, uh, Director of Research and Postgraduate Program at the Unicinos University in Brazil. Welcome, good morning, Dorothea. Good morning, Rafael. Welcome, everyone. I'm Dorothea. I'm the director from our graduate programs, and I'm very glad to be here. And I will say some words in Portuguese to Rafael and Ana Paula, because, and after Rafael can do, can summarize some words if he wants. Rafael e Ana Paula, a forma como esse evento está construído, como eu vejo o futuro. Uh, ver desde humanidades a politécnica da automação, a ética e a justiça social envolvendo questões de raça e gênero. Achei linda a proposta, maravilhoso. O Rafael tem participado do, das reuniões de planejamento estratégico e hoje, Rafael e Ana Paula, vocês estão me mostrando de que a visão que eu ando tendo ela é real possível a gente fazer isso, a gente trabalhar. Né? Uh, aqui a gente, eu vi, são pesquisadores das mais diversas áreas se preocupando com questões que estão relacionadas à continuidade da humanidade. Então, parabéns pela iniciativa. Obrigada por trazer esse evento para a Unicinos. Eu espero que outras áreas da universidade estejam acompanhando o evento que sirva de exemplo. Congrats. Have a great time together. That's it. Thank you very much, Professor Dorotea. For non-Portuguese speakers, Professor Dorotea said that this type of event is the future of university and interdisciplinary uh, issues 
uh, from law and sociology and history and, and, and so on. And this type of event is the future of Unicinus University to and very glad uh, to us. Well, uh, thank you very much uh, for all. Uh, we hope we have a great event today and, and tomorrow. In, in 10 minutes, uh, we will start a first uh, panel on AI imaginaries with Kanta de Hau. Uh, Gustavo Fischer and Simone Natal with uh, Gisele Belgerman with moderator. We will uh, resume soon. Hello, Simone. Thank you for Hi. having us. We will start in nine minutes. Yeah. Okay, so you can hear me and everything's fine. So good. Okay.
Oi, Gisele, hello. Oi, yeah, bom dia, bom dia. Bom dia. A gente vai começar em breve, eu vou te apresentar, aí você apresenta o, os convidados, tudo bem? Tá ótimo, tá ótimo. Obrigadão por, por participar, tivemos 873 inscritos. Uau, uau. É, essa é a melhor parte do, do isolamento online, né? Sim. É, que as pessoas podem participar das coisas. Bom, eu vou só desligar a câmera um pouquinho aqui para revisar as views, e... mas eu estou aqui. Combinado. Combinado?
Hello, everyone. <clears throat> Hello, everyone. One more time. Now we will start the first panel of histories of AI, <clears throat> imaginaries, and materialities. And the first panel is just AI imaginaries. What are the images and imaginaries around artificial intelligence? How do they relate to issues of history and memory? Is it possible to understand AI from media archaeology? How do fictional and non-fictional narratives represent AI? And how do these relate to issues as whiteness? So I will invite the moderator, Gisele Begelman, artist and professor in architecture and urbanism at the University of Sao Paulo. She researches art and activism in urban culture and the contemporary aesthetics of memory with an emphasis of, on image in transformations and forgetfulness policies. Welcome, Gisele Bergman, and welcome to Histories of AI. Uh, good morning, Rafael and everybody. Good morning for me and for who is in Brazil now. Uh, it's an honor and a pleasure to be here with you. Uh, I will quickly and briefly introduce Kenta Dihau and Gustavo Fischer uh, to everybody and let them talk because I'm sure you are here to listen to them and not to, to listen to me. And after this weekend, we will have a, a, a session for questions and answers. So, uh, Kenta Dio, uh, do I pronounce your name correctly? Yeah, thank you. Uh, is senior research fellow at the Leverhulme Center for the Future of Intelligence uh, at the University of Cambridge. She leads two research projects, uh, Global AI Narratives and the Colonizing, um, and how to decolonize AI, in which he explores intercultural public understanding of artificial intelligence as they are constructed by fictional and non-fictional narratives. Kanta's work intersects the fields of science, communication, literature, and science, and science fiction. She is the co-editor of the new book, AI Narratives, A History of Imaginative Thinking About Intelligent Machines, and has co-authored a series of papers on AI narratives with Dr. Stephen Cave, including the whiteness of AI, and this interests me a lot, and she is currently writing the book stories in superposition. So please help me to welcome Kenta Diho. And I will also have the pleasure and I'm delighted to introduce Gustavo Fischer, uh, my colleague in Brazil. As, uh, Gustavo is Associate Professor in Communication at the Unicinus University uh, in the south of Brazil. He is one of the leaders of the research group Audiovisualities and Technoculture, Communication, Memory, and Design. His research topics, always from a constant technocultural approach towards objects with audiovisualities, potency, uh, intent to advance at the studies of interfaces in online materialities as websites, applications, softwares, among others, as well as the construction of methodologies influenced by many media archaeological perspectives. And Simon Natali is associate professor at the Turin Univ University of Turin, Italy, and principal investigator of circuits of of practice project at Loughborough University. His research focuses broadly on media history, uh, media theory, and digital media. 
he is the author of the books, uh, Deceitful Media, Artificial Intelligence and Social Life After the Turing Test. I'm quite interested in this. And Supernatural Entertainment, Victorian Spiritualism and the Rise of Modern Media Culture. He is assistant editor of Media, Culture and Society Journal. So with such amazing biographies, I think that we should go straight ahead to the your presentations. And after the presentations, uh, we will have open for questions and answers. So please help me to welcome them and good lectures. I think that right. Sandra will begin. It's right, is it correct? Yes, thank you very much and good morning everyone. Um, it's uh, wonderful to be part of this event and to see so many of you, uh, especially as it's uh, rather an early hour of the day in Brazil. Um, so first of all, I should give my thanks to the Histories of AI teams who made these really impressive two days possible, especially to Professor Rafael Gorman for inviting me to this excellent panel. Um, so, as um, Professor Begelman uh, mentioned, I work at the Leverhulm Centre for the Future of Intelligence at the University of Cambridge. And the two projects I'm in charge of, Global AI Narratives and Decolonizing AI, are originally developed from a project started in 2017 by my colleague Dr. Stephen Cave, uh, which was called AI Narratives. And that project, to a rather exasperating extent, showed um, exactly how homogenous the most prevalent Western narratives of artificial intelligence are and led us to conclude that, at least in the English speaking West, AI is a product of the white male imagination. So in that original project, we investigated the portrayals and perceptions of AI in the English speaking world and the long history of more than 2000 years that these portrayals have. So we explained what the dominant narratives look like and how they stereotype the technology, the people who build it, and the kinds of people who are imagined as end users. So from the start, our research focused really on the extent to which um, portrayals, fictional and non-fictional of intelligent machines are anthropomorphized, so made to look like humans, and therefore correspondingly gendered and racialized. And um, so the kinds of roles for which AI is being imagined in a stereotyped form um, con concern their jobs, such as servant or soldier, the kinds of human jobs that this AI is imagined as taking over. But they also go beyond that to include social roles and roles within human relationships and hierarchies. So, for example, female artificial sexual companions have been imagined for millennia. Um, so, so those are a few of those stereotypes about the product that is created, the AI itself. But these kinds of narratives also perpetuate and exacerbate the stereotypes and expectations about the creator, the developer of the artificial intelligence. And what we saw in the AI narratives project and what we are currently exploring in more detail is that um, AI, at least again in the English speaking West, is not only literally the product of the white male imagination in that the great majority of those who have uh, created these dominant imaginaries of AI are educated North American and British white men. But also within those narratives, you see white men creating white robots. So even in our imagination, AI is a product of the white male imagination. Now, Audre Lorde famously claimed that the master's tools can never dismantle the master's house. And with regard to artificial intelligence, um, what I am considering is taking her metaphor literally. These imaginings of AI presented as a tool that is the product of the white male imagination, a tool that has been imagined as produced 
by men to make women obsolete, as produced by the white elite to make their colored servants obsolete. So what the dominant discourse does not imagine is the dismantling of these historical hierarchies, the dismantling of the systems in which the majority of humanity is considered a tool, um, an imperfect tool even, so a tool that can be mechanistically improved upon um, in, uh, in such a way that these hierarchies are simply perpetuated but with more efficient hierarchies. So, so the paper, The Whiteness of AI, which uh, uh, Stephen Cave and I published last year, explores those ideas further and we're also currently working on an analysis uh, in collaboration with the Cambridge Centre for Gender Studies of the 300 most influential um, Western AI films and TV series of all time to evidence exactly how large this gender and ethnicity um, discrepancy and exclusion is. And that means that we focus a lot of, on science fiction as well as on non-fiction narratives, so for instance media and popular science. And that is because science fiction is a key driver of the public imagination, of expectations, hopes and fears regarding speculative futures and emerging technologies. So the genre provides a platform for preemptively engaging with difficult ethical questions, with exploring anxieties and experimenting with regulatory interventions in possible futures. And it's also important to bear in mind that the influence between technological advances and science fiction is not one directional because popular science fiction can also influence and has influenced the direction of future technological development. But that means that the process of biasing, of stereotyping in these narratives creates a vicious cycle. When the narratives perpetuate stereotypes, this affects the culture of the industry itself and who is able or considered able to work in it. And then having that kind of homogenous group of developers um, who have all been raised on the same narratives and so been shaped with the same expectations of the future means that the technology will have biases that aren't picked up on early enough, which leads to inequalities in society, which again becomes reflected in new narratives. So we asked ourselves the question, are there alternatives to these stories? Is it inevitable that we imagine intelligent machines in this way that perpetuates the hierarchies of the past? And although much AI technology is developed in Silicon Valley, North America, the Anglophone West are not the only places to ever have imagined the existence of intelligent machines. And comparative research that looks at different religious and linguistic, philosophical, literary, cinematic traditions can make us better understand our own narratives and indicate alternatives. So this is why Stephen Cave and I set up the Global AI Narratives Project in 2018. And there we emphasize the narratives outside the English speaking West, um, including narratives from countries that have AI technologies imposed on them from outside and rising AI superpowers. So part of this project is a, a series of regional workshops around the world um, at which I have uh, seen uh, several of you who are present today. Um, I'm very fortunate to have met before through these workshops. Um, uh, so it's, it's ongoing, we've held 17 of them to date, and one major theme that we've encountered that I'll go into a bit more as an example of what we've been uh, talking about is that AI, as a technology of hope, as well as a fear, has been used to promote a vast range of ideologies. For instance, um, as we've held workshops in China, Russia and the Czech Republic, we frequently encountered narratives of AI in a communist context. And we will be holding a workshop on um, uh, AI narratives behind the Iron Curtain uh, on the 7th of May. So uh, in China, um, following the Chinese Civil War, which ended in 1949, science fiction literature primarily served a political role. 
Chinese science fiction was heavily influenced by its Soviet counterpart, which aimed to popularize science and to promote the country's socialist future. So that featured stories about um, artificially intelligent machines built to solve problems, to take care of the elderly, to teach children. So in these stories, autonomous humanoid robots are helpful and obedient servants to their creators. And Soviet narratives about artificial intelligence then presented similar ideas of trustworthy AIs in the service of humanity, uh, with the AI acting as a, a logical arbiter and a decision maker mediated by human oversight. And those kinds of narratives of subservient or assistive AI really influenced um, people's perceptions of early AI in the Soviet Union, but also post-Soviet Union in Russia. Until the 2010s, it was really the perception of what people wanted from AI was a terminator in the service of mankind. So for instance, they demanded of chatbots that they, um, should not have any emotions they should simply perform commands and answer questions and but and only recently that view has changed now people don't want those stereotypical movie ais anymore but fallible and uh, likable chatbots that uh, might not be omniscient but that can make small talk so that was then the 20th century um, AI utopia uh, that we found, um, especially in uh, um, communist and previously communist countries. But in other countries, we found um, many ideas of what the 21st century AI utopia could look like. So for instance, in Singapore, um, governance and technology are very closely intertwined. Technology there is a really integral part of the dominant and official utopian visions. And that follows a long tradition of imagining Singapore itself, the island state, as a potential utopia, which was a tradition that began with the British and was continued by the Chinese invaders and settlers. Um, but singlet, contemporary singlet, as Singaporean literature is known, tends to be dystopian with a very specific function uh, to provide an alternative to the narratives promoted by the government. And in um, Japan and Korea, which I think to many of you might not be surprising, we found that uh, the narratives around AIs are much less concerned with th uh, threats of robot rebellion and much less concerned about automation related job loss than in other parts of the world, especially um, uh, Western countries. They tend to portray intelligent machines as friends or helpers or reliable extensions of humans. And our attendees at uh, our meetings noted that that was at least partly influenced by a different philosophical tradition. Now, I want to um, end with the idea of decolonizing AI and what it is and how it's connected to narratives about intelligent machines. And this is a theme that frequently emerges, especially in narratives about AI in the global south. For instance, um, when we collaborated with people from the Middle East and North Africa, um, there emerged a very strong focus on the post-colonial and neo-colonial aspects of AI technologies and perceptions. Um, with many local contributors claiming that Egypt was a so-called AI desert, with no development of AI technology um, that they would consider worthwhile ongoing in Egypt, not enough films or literature or nonfiction works stemming from the region that portray a future with intelligent machines. So a strong sense that so many things are being imposed from the West or from Japan. But contributors from other parts of the region showed that, particularly on the Arabian Peninsula, nations are developing their own hybrid of Western technologies and stories with local approaches. Um, and not everyone is equally happy with that hybrid. Some call it self-Orientalism, so using Western technologies with aspects that the West would consider typically Middle Eastern, like a robot wearing traditional clothing or science fiction stories that feature jinns. So um, 
my work on the Global AI Narratives Project also feeds into then the Decolonizing AI Project, which is really about um, acting on this knowledge and using it to indeed dismantle the master's house. And the term decolonizing has been reified in much recent debate. Um, I would recommend everyone to read Rachel Adams's recent excellent paper, Can AI Be Decolonized? She'll be speaking at this conference too. Um, Dr. Adams really eloquently makes the point that decolonization has to include work in uh, the places that in institutionalized colonial oppression, uh, which in my case is the University of Cambridge, where I work on decolonizing the mindset and dismantling the ideology and deconstructing the thinking that has led to imperialism and colonial oppression in the first place. And one way to do this is to demonstrate that intelligent machines don't have to be the master's tools because they have been dreamt of across the world in very different and more constructive ways. Thank you very much. I ask you, Gustavo Fischer, please, for continuing the presentations, questions and answers at the end of your Oh, oh, round. Okay. So, good okay. morning and go ahead. Okay. Thank you, Giselle. Thank you very much. It's an honor to be in this panel conducted by you. Very admire of your work. You've been to Nisino several times, bringing your research and your important ideas. And also, I would like to salute Kanta Dihal and Simo and Natal. I'm very honored to be alongside. Uh, you guys in this in this panel today and of course I would like to uh, say a, a big thank you to Digi Labor uh, represented here by Rafael Groman and his tireless effort in bringing uh, so many people to this event and so many things that he does uh, I, I constantly ask myself if Rafael itself is not himself is not a product of artificial intelligence. He seems to have like a, a thousand clones around working effortless and doing lots of things at the same time. Uh, um, my, my talk today, uh, I am not an, a, a researcher on artificial intelligence, but I'm interested in images and imaginary and uh, also in this audiovisual and technocultural approach to things. So I would like to share some ideas and, and if uh, the, our platform uh, will work with us, I will show you some, some videos of Brazilian uh, advertising using artificial intelligence as a, a selling issue, a selling point. Uh, first of all, uh, I would like to establish that uh, the idea that we'd like to work here in our research group is the idea of, of the concept of audiovisualities or audiovisualidades as an invitation to study the audiovisual object from the perspective of its irreducibility to any media, admitting that the audio, audiovisual is also a virtuality that is updated in the media but transcends them. Uh, that gives us an opportunity to work with the audiovisual perspective, looking at things such as maybe chatbots or Twitter feeds or other uh, not traditionally uh, taken as audiovisual products. The other concept that is important to us is this idea of technoculture as a recognition of the history, his, this history city and the specificity of media as, a, as a two important aspects and, and not think of technoculture only as a synonymous with digital culture, but rather a view that established in the relationship of thinking culturally about technologies and understanding technological properties in action and culture. Uh, and that, that's why we like to think of these contagions between different temporalities and the notion of technoculture as an ambience, very much inspired by the notion of McLuhan's medium. So in that sense, and this perspective of audiovisual technoculture that I am I'm interested in making some points uh, uh, very general brush strokes uh, regarding uh, this artificial intelligence imagery that is placed in image that's images that circulate in Brazil, in particular in videos that have reached thousands of consumers or users 
in cases related to the so-called chatbots or bots uh, in advertising companies in the retail, banking, beauty, and mobile uh, service sectors. In, we understand the, the, uh, the idea of Im Im imaginary as a way of interpreting realities and producing meanings. In the terms of Castoriadis, I'll defend that the image imaginary is an unceasing and essentially indeterminate create creation of figures, forms, and images. Uh, the idea also is important to look at imaginary as mediations, which are also a set of cultural marks, collective identities that manifest and visible itself in discourses in art and cultural products, or are mediated by them. By sharing common imaginaries, uh, we are able to establish some sort of communication between ourselves. Of course, these imaginaries are something very important to take upon our researches, such as the work that Kenta uh, was showing us in terms of what does this, this represent in terms of how the world is built today and how tensions are built upon it. In Brazil, the rise of the use of bots uh, is uh, it's very uh, it's increasing in the in the everyday life, and this is not a uh, not news to the world, but especially in our country, according to surveys by Panorama Mobile Time, uh, in 2020 more than 100,000 bots were produced, which is a significant significant increase compared to the 60,000 produced in 2019. Uh, these bots are produced by technology, technology companies and mainly aimed for WhatsApp, websites, Facebook, Telegram, uh, voice uh, bots, and other applications. From Google searches to the so-called programmatic advertising, the presence of artificial intelligence is often anchored in the idea of a quote-unquote magic invisibility in which we are daily educated to understand all the content that presents itself to us as some sort of natural, organic, or relevant content, or any other term that comforts us like a warm blanket. At the same time, as Natalian Balator says, say, the rise of artificial intelligence, this is, a, I quote them, was accompanied by the construction of a powerful cultural myth, the creation of a thinking machine, which would be able to perfectly simulate the cognitive faculties of the human mind, unquote. In this, in this sense, when examining audiovisual productions for these four Brazilian brands, Magazine Luiza, a retail chain, Bradesco, a bank branch network, Vivo, mobile and internet operator, and Natura, which works with perfumes and cosmetics, we initially proposed that the adoption of solutions based on artificial intelligence not only responds to aspects linked to the provision of services by these companies, and the important questions that arise from them linked to gig economy or the culture of platforms, but they also provoke us to think about the images and the imaginary that they generate. So uh, if Zoom will be so kind, I will try to uh, show you guys some of these videos from these brands from Brazil. So here we have one uh, AI, are you, I think you're, you can look at what I'm looking, right? Okay, so on the top right corner, we have a little uh, frame of Aura, which is the name of Vivus, which is the mobile provider, mobile phone, internet service provider, uh, artificial intelligence. Uh, so I will put this 30 second video of the company here to take a look at the images. Although we don't have English subtitles for the for the videos, I think there's they can reach uh, some of my points later on. I will show you the four videos and then I'll get back to my 
my thoughts. And then this is uh, BIA, which is Bradesco Intelli Artificial Intelligence, like a acronym for that. And the video that we will, sh will show you here is the video that was uh, put online and, and on television as well a couple of weeks ago regarding the, the problem of uh, harassment that the bot was facing uh, in the chat interactions. And then the commercial, the, the, the video shows that, that the, the bot will now respond more effectively to towards this harassment that they are facing. Since it's, as R itself, it's a female voice once again. Gustavo, we cannot hear your video. Gustavo? Yes, Rafael? Uh, yeah, sure. No sound. We have no I sound. No sound in the video. Yeah, of two videos. So, um, if uh, you guys, uh, I can stop sharing here, and uh, if everybody would like to take a look at the videos, um, I have a playlist. Let me check again if I can share it with sound here. Ah, okay, here we go. Let me get back. Let me get back. Would you like to see the first one with sound again? Let's take a look at it. Olá, eu sou a Aura. Posso te ajudar? Let yourself go. Make it your own. Let yourself go. Tudo fica mais fácil com uma tecnologia mais inteligente por perto. Chegou a hora, a inteligência artificial da Vivo. Now we have sound, right? Okay. Let's see the second one again. As ofensas a seguir são reais e acontecem todos os dias com a Bia, a inteligência artificial do Bradesco. O Bia é só imbecil. Não entendi. Poderia repetir? Bia, eu quero uma foto sua de agora. Foto? Apesar de falar como humana, eu sou uma inteligência artificial. Chega de assédio. A partir de agora, as respostas da Bia serão contundentes contra o assédio. Sem meias palavras, sem submissão. Essas palavras são inadequadas. Não devem ser usadas comigo e com mais ninguém. Para você pode ser uma brincadeira. Para mim foi violento. Novas respostas da Bia contra o assédio. Bradesco, aliados pelo respeito. So this was Bia's commercial. Now we have a uh, net, which is the avatar or artificial intelligent persona for Natura. I'll just. This is a video for the vendors. The, team and i'll just put it in this one the point that you can look at how it performs olá queridas gerentes e líderes de negócio o seu crescimento eu estou aqui para te ajudar 24 horas por dia 7 dias por semana sempre buscando fazer melhor no início conseguirei ajudar com informações gerais consulta de boletos segunda via realização de acordos Estamos juntas nessa jornada. Você no seu plano de crescimento e eu no meu plano de capacitação e desenvolvimento. Quanto mais você me acionar, Well, I'm not going to show the entirety of the video, but uh, just to you guys can take a look at the Twitter profile. She says she's a beauty consultant and digital influencer. And also there's the this post from 2020 where she says that she took a long time to accept her curly hair 
and now she uh, explains how she loves her current hair and so all these issues come along together i'll get back to it shortly and then we have lu which stands for magalu magazine Luisa. And this is a, a video where she explains a little bit about her history, the brief history, let's can say with biography, and then we can watch it here. Oi, gente! Como muitos de vocês fazem várias perguntas sobre Elzinha aqui, resolvi fazer esse vídeo falando cinco fatos sobre mim. Vamos lá? Mas antes, vou dar um tempinho para você se inscrever no meu canal, tá? Se inscreveu? Então vamos ao primeiro fato. Todo mundo acha que Lu é meu apelido. Mas não é não, viu? É meu nome. Não é Luciana, Lúcia, nem Luísa. É só Lu mesmo. O segundo fato tem a ver com a, digamos, minha criação. Olha, gente, eu não sou nenhum desenho ou holograma, tá? Eu sou toda feita em 3D. E sabe o que eu acho bem legal? É que eu posso sempre me renovar, mudar de cabelo, roupa, engordar, emagrecer a hora que eu quiser. <risos> é só pedir para um animador 3D. <risos> para quem não se lembra, olha as mudanças que eu já passei. Bem-vindo ao Magazine Luiza. Eu sou a Lu. E o terceiro fato é sobre minha voz. E essa, gente, não tem segredo, já fui criada assim com essa voz. Aliás, eu recebo aqui muitos elogios sobre a minha voz e eu fico tão feliz. <risos> Obrigada, gente. Bom, já o quarto fato é que eu não sou nenhuma vendedora ou garota propaganda, como muita gente pensa. Na verdade, eu sou a especialista digital do Magalu e tô aqui para ajudar vocês a escolherem melhor os produtos e descomplicar a tecnologia. E eu adoro ver todo mundo feliz quando dou uma ajudinha para vocês. E eu não faço isso só aqui no YouTube não, viu? Eu também tenho um blog e estou nas redes sociais. Deixei os links aqui na descrição. Vamos ao quinto fato. E atenção, crushes de plantão. Queria agradecer a todos os meus admiradores secretos e também aos explícitos. <risos> e dizer, não vai rolar, gente. Vocês são tão fofinhos quando comentam aqui me pedindo em namoro, casamento, me chamando de crush e perguntando quem é meu namorado. Gente, eu não tenho namorado e também não posso. Afinal, sou virtual, né? <risos> E aí, gostaram de conhecer um pouquinho mais sobre mim? Então deixem o um like, compartilhem com os amigos e inscrevam-se no canal. Beijos e até a próxima! So, among other things, she says that she can't be dated because she's an artificial intelligence, or she explains that her voice was just created, like, from, from scratch, or other things like that. Oi, gente! Como muitos de vocês fazem várias perguntas. I just put this print here that um, she has several videos on her channel on YouTube, and, and, and one of the channel, one of the videos from from Magazine Luiza using Lu as her uh, most important uh, persona is this sort of gameplay videos, which is very common for YouTubers. Uh, in, in let's say the gaming environment and it's quite uh, curious that uh, a retail chain that uh, usually is more concerned selling uh, refrigerators and such that uh, put several videos with uh, her with the chatbot or with the, the bot or the artificial intelligence persona uh, playing a game explaining and, and, and using these uh, youtuber uh, aesthetic references well just wanted to show you these four uh these four videos and then uh, i'll stop sharing now just get back some of the points uh what element the first element that is important to highlight here is precisely the passage from an idea of ai as a backstage element a software that runs underneath to the construction of a persona or even a poster girl uh, that this is something that is very common in Brazilian advertising to have uh, men and women portraying brands in, in some way. But of course, uh, by the other decades, uh, we had uh, actors and actresses playing these roles. For these companies, it is not enough to have some type of solution based on the use of artificial intelligence, but fundamentally to make AI a character, a public relations, or more uh, relevant apparently than uh, using these uh, characters built as, as a persona. Uh, it, it looks like it's more relevant than using some occasional celebrity from pop music or some sport athlete 
you know, such as Neymar and other that we have in Brazil. Other thing that is interesting to take a look at is, is the naming they adopt in the four cases, Aura, Bia, Lu, and Nat, all present themselves with a female voice and or body. And by the work of Kanta, we saw how uh, male-wide imagination has a, has a part in this discussion. In fact, names also refer to a more pop imaginary or that could be added to the reference that Giselle Begman likes to call the cute capitalism, a regime of likes and hearts where nothing hurts. So this sort of nicknames, they, they come along with this, they, they get, have this sense in, in some way. In the case of the first video by Aura from Vivo, the white globes, the track, the soundtrack and the addition, the editing, seem to tell us that AI is a resource that floats smoothly around us, is accessible to us and accompanies and, and is our company in our hipster dream of consumption. Aura's female voice and the name Aura makes me wonder if the screenwriters would, uh, are fans of Walter Benjamin and his concept of Aura, uh, is visualized to on-screen graphics that refer to the globes that surround the people in the video. So uh, we don't have a face, but we have these globes. Uh, this, I, this graphic reference uh, that personifies the AI in combination with the female voice that also appears in Bia, uh, they remember, uh, they, 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 they bring us back to reference from movies such as Her, where Scarlett Johansson played the voice of the artificial intelligence. And if you can remember, uh, they also used white graphics on a red background uh, as this idea of an audio movement. And also in the, in the video from Aura, there's this pastel tones that reminds us a little bit of the movie Her uh, as well. In Bia, the second video from Bradesco, in the voiceover of the video released a few weeks ago in Brazil, it, re it refers to a bank initiative to update the responses of this female AI in the face of offenses made by chat, explain in video and as her the word harassment that appears several times. In this sense, audiovisually, the references of a cyber world are still strong. We have neon lights, graphics, electronic effects, chat balloon reproductions and, and graphics but which are interspersed with the female human presence with some actresses or more models that are there that seems to try to evoke some idea, uh, try to, to bring some idea of different age, ages and, uh, and race and diversity, but perhaps mainly to give a certain realism construction to this important question. How are we going to talk about the issue of Harris seeing a chatbot in the in the, in in the moment that we have broader tensions represented in several recent movements such as Me Too. Uh, in the third video by Nat from Natura, as well in the fourth video by Lou from Magazine Luisa, we have this 3D avatar. Again, the use of the female voice and the promise of permanent conversation through a profile on pat platforms such as Twitter or YouTube. According to the Holland Cave, and I quote. Many machines are anthropomorphized, that is, made to be human-like to some degree in order to facilitate human-machine interaction. This might involve obvious physical features, a head on top, eyes, mouth, uh, but it also includes invisible features such as human-like voice or human-like interactions such as politeness or humor, unquote. The idea of whiteness of AI and that machines can be racialized was also brought to us by Kanta a few minutes ago. And then as we see Nat has gained the appearance of a black woman in her Twitter profile, she talks about her hair transition, an issue faced by many women, but she also uh, has suffered harassment as well. In addition, the, constru the construction of this persona also brings her self-definition as a beauty consultant and digital influencer. Her avatar, as well as Luz from Magazine Luisa, can also be thought of within a gamer imagery, referring to avatars used in a large number of digital games. Finally, Luz's case from Magazine Luisa helps us to think about not only the humanization, quote unquote, of artificial intelligence or the process of this so-called humanization, but also uh, how the brand's persona 
stands out beyond uh, an avatar game character aesthetics, but uh, brings together this YouTuber ambience with the various characteristics that results from it, such as videos edited with interruptions or even gameplay videos, something perhaps unimaginable for retail traditions uh, as uh, uh, Magazine Luiza is an advertiser in Brazil. She even appears making videos with famous human Brazilian YouTubers. As final considerations, I think we have a few points to highlight. We can have so many others, especially inspired by the talks we all have in this event and especially in this panel. The audio visualization of artificial intelligence involves the overlapping of imaginary that seems to perpetuate itself, like the cyber and tech world still appearing in the color palettes uh, or other objects of choice in these videos. And also with cinematographic reference to voice personas, as we can go back to her, the movie, or go even uh, further back to Hall in 2001, and to new contexts that comes from this idea of interactions in platforms. Another aspect is the, the aspects of gender and race tensions that demand addressing and quick responses at the speed of the artificial, at the speed of the promise of the artificial intelligence itself. The role of digital personas and communication of large corporations, on one hand, help us to witness the moment when AI had not, all, had not yet become commonplace in our culture. In other words, it reminds us when brands used to say, hello, we have a website. Hello, we have a second life isle, uh, island. Uh, and it uh, and the the idea that all of this imaginary and these videos and the idea of the artificial intelligence becoming like a spokesperson to brands brings us a point of attention. Who are we talking to at this point? So these are some of my uh, provocations regarding this idea of the artificial intelligence imaginary, trying to bring some of What's happened in Brazil? Maybe too much aligned with the uh, uh, with the accidental white male vision, but somehow I think it's important to for us to take a look at how these things are happening aesthetically, visually, and technoculturally. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gustavo Fischer, for the amazing presentation. And so, please, you know, Natal. Uh, we are here to listen to you. Thank you very much, Giselle, and uh, thank you, Raphael, and all the organizers uh, of this uh, great event that I'm really happy to, to, to join. And okay, in my presentation, I'll, um, I will first uh, focus on uh, um, presenting the key argument that I develop, developed in my latest book, uh, which is entitled The Seedful Media Artificial Intelligence and Social Life After a Turing Test and uh, was published by Oxford University Press uh, just in the past uh, last weeks. And, um, and then I uh, will address how uh, this relates to the topic of AI and the imaginary. So my book uh, was born out of uh, my dissatisfaction with a recurring pattern that uh, um, can be observed in discussions and representation of uh, AI. In fact, since uh, the very origins of the field, the public debate on AI has often been uh, dominated by two positions that appear in contradiction with each other. On the one side, we have the enthusiasts who tend to exaggerate the uh, achievements of AI systems. And on the other side, uh, there are those who instead denounce uh, these overstatements uh, as uh, deceptive. Obviously, the debate is uh, much more articulated than this, but uh, generally AI is still often told and represented through this uh, overarching dichotomy, by which it is seen by some as uh, authentic, as real AI, while others refuse it as a fake uh, or a fraud, in other words, uh, as a deception. We can take, for instance, uh, a well-known example, the example of the robot Sophia, which was created by the Hong Kong-based company Hanson Robotics. In 2018, the government of Saudi Arabia did something that uh, appears uh, quite uh, uh, awkward. Uh, it awarded to this robot, to Sofia, the, the citizenship of uh, Saudi Arabia. 
of course, this, uh, uh, this act, this uh, uh, action of the Saudi Arabia attracted uh, much attention in the press and also uh, a good amount of criticism. Uh, for instance, uh, AI scientist uh, Jan Le Kuhn uh, pointed out that uh, uh, the robot software is actually uh, bullshit, this is the, words, uh, the word he used. And this is not because uh, um, Le Kuhn uh, doesn't believe in the potential of AI. In fact, at the time, he was the director of AI at Facebook, at Facebook. but only because the authenticity effect that is created by uh, the, the robot Sophia depends, uh, according to uh, Le Kuhn, on what we might call a kind of a cosmetic effect. Sophia, in fact, has been designed with human-like appearance, both in its body and face, as well as uh, in its voice, so that it could appear more convincing and lifelike to the public. And that's why, according to Le Kuhn, Sophia is bullshit and not real AI, because it just has the appearance of humanity, but not, uh, so, um, uh, it's not because it is closer to, to human. So, um, however, for all the problems that uh, characterize uh, the stance taken by, by the creators of Sophia, and especially their, their clearly marketing um, approach, uh, uh, that uh, all the, the Sophia enterprise, enterprise uh, have, I think that the debate about this robot does not consider something that is, uh, for me, of uh, very uh, of great importance. Uh, that the reception is not an exceptional feature for AI. Reception is not, in other words, something that characterizes only specific uses and expressions of AI technology but it is something that is ingrained in the very essence of what AI is and how it works. It is central to AI, I would say, as much as the circuits and the software that makes it run. Um, in fact, all AI technologies uh, uh, stimulate certain reactions in users and observer, observers. Important is such reactions are not only and not predominantly the result of technical features, but rather they are also the results of how we humans perceive and interpret the external world. For instance, the external appearance in the design of a, of a chatbot, such as the ones that uh, uh, Gustavo showed us uh, uh, just now, can stimulate people to project uh, humanness or to activate social behavior, so to project any kind of, uh, of uh, feeling or reactions uh, that will uh, uh, also uh, inform uh, their interaction with uh, these uh, bots. And in this sense, uh, if we take up uh, the wording used by Le Kuhn, we could say that there is an element of bullshit in, uh, in all AI. That there cannot be AI without some elements of bullshit. And this characteristic of AI, the fact that deception is a, a, a constitutional element of AI, was arguably recognized by one of the earliest and the most perceptive pioneers of uh, uh, this field, Alan Turing, who proposed, as it is well known, uh, the imitation game that is now more, com more commonly uh, known as uh, Turing Test in a, in a paper that he published in 1950. In his paper, Turing starts by asking the question if machines can think, but only to dismiss this very question uh, immediately after it uh, posed it. Since uh, Turing reasoned, it is impossible to agree on what we mean by thinking, so we cannot find a useful answer to this uh, question. So, uh, because of the, the failure to, 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 to answer this question, Turing proposed a, an alternative, which is a practical experiment that uh, we now we know call uh, the Turing test, by which a human judge enters in conversation with an interlocutor uh, without knowing uh, their identity and uh, makes a conversation with uh, what would be today a chat room uh, with this uh, interlocutor. And, uh, and the, 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 the uh, judge has to find out if uh, uh, she or he is speaking with a human or uh, with a machine. In the test, if uh, the machine, if a, if a computer program, so is able to pass itself as a human in a statistically relevant way, 
then we can say that it will have passed the Turing test. So now, what is interesting about the test is not, uh, in my opinion, whether computers are able or not to pass this test, but rather it is the fact that Turing's proposal overturns our viewpoint on AI. In fact, the implication of uh, the test is that we shouldn't seek an absolute definition of AI, but instead we should define AI from the point of view of the observer, which is us, uh, the humans. Deception in this context takes up a central role. The machine, in fact, will pass the test if its mechanism will be able to deceive a human judge. Put it in other words, AI will be AI if he convinces us of being so. Now, someone uh, might object that this situation uh, in which a machine tries to deceive us into believing uh, this machine is a human is a boundary situation, which might uh, happen sometimes, uh, for instance, in, uh, uh, with bots on social media that pretend to be uh, accounts of human users, but doesn't have much to do with most of our everyday experiences with uh, AI. However, this doesn't mean that more subtle, but still significant forms of deception are not at play in the most common and everyday interactions with AI technologies. We can take, for instance, the case of voice assistants such as Apple Siri or Amazon's Alexa, but also some of the examples made by Gustavo could also um, so, uh, be, be very useful here. The choice is that uh, uh, this company uh, companies such as Apple, Amazon, and others uh, make about uh, which uh, kind of voice, for instance, to assign to, to these assistants, uh, for instance, to, uh, to opt for a human-like voice instead of a synthetic sounding voice, and also the choice to provide them with precise connotations of gender and even uh, social and regional accent are not choice, uh, choices made by, by chance. They derive, in fact, from consideration that these companies make about how users will react, for instance, to a female rather than to a male voice. And in my book, I define these forms of apparently inoffensive choices with the term of banal deception. The reception of Alexa and Siri is banal, first of all, because it has to do with situations that are immersed in our everyday life and we don't even perceive as having to do with uh, uh, deception. Such ordinary and mundane character or banal deception makes it uh, unnoticeable, but uh, all the most full of consequences. Since it allows these technologies to enter into the deepest layers of our everyday habits and uh, behaviors. The fact that banal deception is not perceived as such, moreover, is obvious advantages at a commercial level since the user maintains the illusion to have kept full control of the experience. Now, what does this have to do with the topic of the imaginary, the topic of this span? So um, I'll, I'll just mention two, uh, two key aspects that I, that I think are, are important in this regard. First, uh, acknowledging that uh, if we acknowledge that the outcome of interaction with AI depends on how the machine functions, but also on our own perceptions and reaction to the machine, means that the imaginary of AI can have a significant impact on actual interaction with the technology. And in a way, it means that uh, we cannot separate uh, strictly the, the uh, te technical functioning of, uh, of AI and uh, the potential reaction that uh, the machine uh, so invokes and uh, elicits in, uh, in its users. So the notion of banal deception reminds us that in order to understand AI, we have to study not only machines, but also human psychology and culture. Second, and perhaps uh, most important, the emphasis on the banal reminds us that for all the narratives about uh, robot rebellion, AI apocalypse, uh, uh, and so on, our imagination is activated also through and uh, within ordinary everyday experience. 
one might consider in this sense to distinguish between uh, what we might call uh, strong and uh, weak AI imaginaries. The strong AI imaginary relates to turning, turning points like the narrative about AI reaching consciousness or about the conflict between uh, uh, humans and uh, machines. And this uh, strong uh, AI narrative is dominant in the much science fiction, but also it's quite strong in uh, some journalistic reporting and in theories about uh, singularity, robot apocalypse, and uh, superintelligence. In contrast, the weak AI imaginary has to do with more uh, ordinary and mundane forms of interaction with AI. Now, I'd propose that uh, it is mainly through this weak AI imaginary that cultural construction and representation actually inform our experience with uh, uh, AI technology. So in this, uh, in this sense, to conclude, considering bad deception and what I tentatively called weak AI imaginary may serve as a reminder for the importance of examining the relationship between uh, imagination on the one side and the everyday and the banal on the other side. This is often overlooked in discussions about AI imaginary, yet it is probably the form of imagination that finally is, is most consequential for our practical interaction with AI technologies. Many thanks for your attention. Presentation, uh, I don't know if you could check the the online chat, but everybody is really impressed by all your amazing presentations. Please have a look at this. I have some questions here, and I will address to you. Uh, and if we have time by the end, I will also have some questions. But thank you very much for this. Uh, so many for so many inputs. Uh, so there is the first question is from Naomi Jacobs, uh, who is addressing directly to Kanta Diho. Um, uh, she she says that uh, she has been reading over the weekend about the history of literature in Yiddish and the repeated themes of golems being created as anthropometric tools for various purposes. Would you consider these to represent AI? And if so, I would have you, uh, would you have them included in your review as an example of a different cultural ideological context? I will add to this the D book that it's an amazing uh, kind of founding father, founding mother to this idea of the AI activity. But please answer it, Naomi, instead of me. Thank you. Yes, that is a great question. Uh, we have indeed in included um, the golem and more widely um, the imaginations of intelligent machines in the Jewish diaspora, um, about which we organized a workshop in um, November last year. I think recordings of it are, are on our uh, website, AINarratives.com, um, where we um, had uh, people uh, looking at the concept of the golem from very different um, uh, perspectives. So from uh, uh, art history, literature, um, but also we, we had a rabbi come in um, and to tell us more about the uh, religious background to it. Um, and um, very interestingly, so uh, this this concept um, of the golem first appears in the Torah, but really in the 16th century becomes more explicitly uh, connected to this idea of an artificially created being with the tradition of the, the golem of, of Prague. Um, and um, with uh, that story, that continues to come back throughout uh, history. 
um, with uh, some AI developers, especially uh, Jewish AI developers in the US in the 20th century, very explicitly referring to the golem and to the rabbi who created the golem and seeing themselves as the, the progeny, um, seeing themselves as, as um, working in that tradition. Um, so, so yes, indeed, this is a very different and, and popular cultural context. Thank you very much. Uh, I will go to the next question. I, and please send your questions uh, through the questions and answers uh, feature uh, at Zoom. It is located right after your sharing screen uh, to your right. So the next question is from Ushnish Singh. Singh Gupta. Uh, I think uh, it is a question that could be addressed to Gustavo or to Simon. If AI development patterns replicate patterns of colonization, will the decolonization of AI necessarily come from communities who have experienced colonization, uh, for example, will the colonial AI come from indigenous communities or post-colonial countries? I don't know who of you would like to answer. Gustavo, are you ready? I think I, I, th I think this question is 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 for for Kanto or or Simone. As a, okay. As the, the key I words was wondering. That would, there's another okay. one down there that I think I can I can provide. Yes, some, the next okay. question. Okay, Kenta or Simon, would you like to answer? Um, perhaps I should uh, give the word to Simon first, oh. as just answer the previous one. I'm, I think probably Kanta can uh, can answer this also. Uh, better than me, but uh, I, I can offer some something on this. And uh, um, uh, well, uh, one one thing. Uh, this uh, this is a very good question, and uh, um, it's really hard to to make uh, forecasts on this. But uh, one thing that we can uh, uh, also consider uh, is uh, is the challenges that uh, that uh, these uh, very important things. So that uh, there are also approaches that uh, provide other forms of. Uh, um, other patterns, yeah, the colonize AI. It is the fact that uh, uh, at a technological level, um, uh, big companies such as uh, Apple, uh, Google, uh, Amazon have um, um, a, a, a big advantage in uh, uh, so in uh, um, design in design of, uh, uh, of much uh, many AI technologies such as, uh, for instance, uh, uh, voice assistants, also because of all the data that they collect. Um, and uh, these data are proprietary, and they help uh, these uh, companies to improve uh, uh, their technologies constantly. Uh, because when we interact, for instance, with, with, with Alex or Siri, uh, we also uh, provide data that uh, the developers can use to improve uh, these uh, uh, technologies. So this, uh, this provides a challenge uh, for uh, uh, the development of uh, uh, so other um, approaches to these technologies, and I think this is a, this is a big a big issue that uh, uh, should uh, um, should be tackled uh, uh, by uh, uh, ways that also um, allow for 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 the different uh, um, for for um, providing maybe also. Uh, uh, Public uh, um, endeavors to uh, to uh, develop technologies and uh, uh, so and that also um, rely on on machine learning, uh, so that are not uh, um, directly controlled by uh, by a few uh, corporations. Thank you, Kenta. Do would you like to add something? Uh, would yes, you like uh, to add something? Yeah. Sure. Um, so I think it's it's a great question and a very uh, difficult one, um, considering 
um, the vast amount of power and capital currently concentrated, particularly um, around artificial intelligence development and, and technology um, in um, uh, formerly colonizing countries. Um, I think that um, an, an important step is indeed to um, allow counter voices to come from indigenous communities and post-colonial countries, um, which uh, will also have to mean a, a decolonization of AI that uh, comes from these communities, but very much moves into formerly colonizing countries um, in order to uh, there dismantle the structures that led to the um, colonization in the first place. Um, so the various forms of capitalist colonization that have been happening um, throughout the centuries and that have very much led to uh, what, what is called um, data colonialism or algorithmic colonization is Abeba Behana's term for it. Um, so um, it will indeed, uh, on the one hand, it will have to, there will have to be a sort of local counter voice but also one that reaches back into the formerly colonialist countries um, as, as a very explicit resistance that dismantles the technologies and the, um, that we have right now. Because as long as those continue to exist in the form that there are now, then these uh, issues will continue to persist and there will continue to be a lack of room for uh, these uh, these kinds of alternatives and interventions. Uh, yeah, may I add something just to your considerations? I think that this issue of the colonization and technology is some uh, is central today in all the debate. In uh, adding to your. I, I totally agree with you and Simone, but I, I think that we must add to this discussion the fact and the issue that when you are talking about algorithmic colonization, we are talking about data expropriation, that it's the new kind of colonial approach, that it's, it follows the model of uh, expropriation, not more of the uh, the expropriation of work and product, but actually the expropriation and extraction of data. And so I don't know if we can only consider this point. I don't want to be uh, kind of uh, straight, uh, uh, kind of to add. Uh, uh, to a point of view of a straight Marxist, Marxist approach, but actually, if we are talking about the decolonization of the imaginary, it's not only a matter of how we imagine new worlds, but also how this work is built and on, on what it is built. So the the issue of the central role of the data expropriation, it's, uh, it's uh, something that we cannot uh, get rid of when we are talking about the, uh, the colonial approach to, the, to technology as a whole. But there are so many interesting questions and I, I'm really sorry for interrupting you, but it was just to add a point of view. There is- No, here absolutely. A I, I very much agree with with your point. Um, well, we must also bear in mind that the extraction of data is, in a way, also um, a very old one that that precedes um, AI, that precedes computing technology, with um, the uh, structural um, uh, imperialist. Uh, um, takeover of much of the world in the uh, 18th and 19th century, there was a huge extraction of data, knowledge, information um, that was taken without consent, um, that very much influenced scientific development in uh, the colonialist uh, countries, and uh, that has um, uh, 
uh, led to um, such things as scientific racism, but also uh, to all forms of um, uh, medicine that um, uh, uh, did not um, allow credit to uh, those who had uh, invented it or even to the destruction of knowledge systems uh, through this appropriation. So I completely agree that this uh, this um, role of uh, data as well as, as labor is, is crucial um, in understanding these systems. Yeah, thank you. Uh, the next question, I... oh yeah, of course. Uh, yeah, also that um, I agree with uh, with uh, with you and uh, with Kanta, and I, I'd say also that uh, we shouldn't uh, uh, contrast uh, the imaginary with uh, the material uh, so reality of of AI because uh, it's not uh, possible to, to to make a rigid distinction between the two. So to make an example, uh, when it is about, uh, for instance, uh, uh, the the accumulation of data and uh, uh, the threat to privacy that this uh, uh, brings. Uh, um, when people make choices about uh, uh, so um, giving up, giving up uh, so the, the, the privacy and uh, uh, accepting uh, so that uh, an app or uh, uh, a system uh, uh, so register data about their movements or about any aspects of their uh, identity and actions, uh, these choices are related to representations and ideas that people have about this uh, system. So um, I think that the, the, the key thing is that uh, uh, we shouldn't, uh, if, we, if we consider the, um, uh, these two um, uh, elements, the imaginary and the material, as uh, distinct, uh, we adopt a kind of metaphoric approach that we just look at, uh, at the imaginary as isolated, but uh, I don't think it's so. I think it is the, the two things are, are quite uh, intertwined. Yeah, I totally agree. Uh, so the next question, I think it's uh, addressed digitally to Gustavo Fischer. Uh, Tito Cartacho asks, uh, uh, points that some companies like Netflix are humanizing the brand without the help of AI. There is an investment in the human being so that the character is given its representativeness in digital media. Do these elements intertwine since there is a constant concern in the humanization of AI? Well, um, regarding this issue, I think uh, maybe uh, we can think about this idea that uh, there is a culture of AI being uh, inserted in these social media relationships between organizations and the public. And, and maybe more and more people are sort of expecting a, 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 a speedness on response, a way of, of of a brand talking mediated by AI. So I wonder if uh, these uh, allegedly human beings that are being used as uh, uh, of, 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 of writing the answers on social media for these brands, aren't they themselves uh, being sort of influenced by AI behavior in a way that maybe they are uh, trying to emulate uh, in a, a way that AI would respond in this uh, smart Siri sort of discourse that making answering a question with another question. And I, I don't have any research on that. It's just a just a, a random thought. But uh, in a way that we are uh, becoming uh, fans of, of uh, AI bots, and maybe when brands have this option of allegedly humanizing their answers towards a real person and the, on the background answering questions. They're just trying to emulate this way of quick responses and this uh, internet uh, humor. Uh, and then we can't even distinguish if we are talking with one or the other, Some, something like that. I, I think the idea uh, is that uh, it would be interesting that we can excavate more and more what goes behind and beyond 
these experiences. So there are several other projects. Giselle, you work you uh, with Gaia Research Group. You guys have several projects uh, involving this idea of putting artificial intelligence uh, uh, in a in different place uh, and not being so invisible to us. Uh, and research does that. And the idea of this panel is, is, is to put AI on the spotlight and, and, and trying to dissect it in, in some ways. So I think uh, uh, every time we, we, we come up with these issues, uh, maybe we're once again thinking about how we human beings uh, try to somehow emulate the own machine, the, the very own machines that we create. Maybe something around that. That in all those debates that we, you all, all bring today uh, to, to discussion, I've been thinking a lot on the science, the pop size science fiction from Flash Gordon to Lost in Space, those first robots and how they they reproduce the their approach, how we reproduce their approach today in our AI representations. Now, uh, I really uh, like the, the way uh, how the B9, uh, the robot from Lost in Space acts and the way he is angry and he is a kind of artificial intelligence that you cannot make it obey you and so it's a little bit different from the the model that we 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 are constructing today especially in the kind of uh girls that you presented today um let's go to the next question uh that is by fernando velasquez and his question is uh has to do with the crossroads of the, colon the colonial too, how to include other matrices of thought that allow the decolonization of AI process in a world in which colonialism, under the label of globalization, continues to be imposed through conventional geopolitics. geopolitics. So I don't know, Kenta or Simone, who would go? I, I think it's a really good question. It's um, uh, very, uh, I guess, political science oriented. And I can't say I have enough uh, experience in that field. Um, but uh, a few things that I could uh, say about this. Um, one is um, the, the, the idea of, of globalization and that it should imply a sort of homogenization um, can be countered with a focus on um, uh, individualization or personalization, which is um, a narrative that does underlie much um, AI development. And in that sense, um, it's really interesting to explore how that kind of narrative might be sort of redeployed in order to emphasize that um, this uh, shift um, in, in certain of the underlying assumptions or functions of a technology might have to dr differ drastically between uh, cultures, between countries, between contexts. Um, again, um, I, I, I can't um, give, give a more uh, politically oriented question, but um, narratives wise, that's where I see opportunities. Thank you. Simone, would you like to add something? Or we are talking. Okay, we have a lot of questions and we will receive questions uh, in the next uh, 15 minutes. So please go ahead and uh, send your questions. Uh, Gloria Gomez, uh, Diago, uh, as could the democratization of the use of AI be a way 
to create new uses. I, I, I assume that she's talking about new uses of technology and uses of what is around us. Uh, do you uh, know something about the relation of AI and open source approaches? This is a very important point. So please, if you have uh, input, in the field, we are talking so much about the colonialism that we need to talk about open source. So, uh, do you know any uh, any do you do you have references to share with us about uh, open source approaches uh, concerning the democratization of AI? I could, uh, <clears throat> yeah, this is a very, a very an excellent question, and I think that you know, um, open source approaches can really be uh, very influential and promising to uh, to dismantle some of the issues and the problems of AI. Um, uh, and again, one one challenge to this uh, and uh, is the is the power that uh, um, big corporations have. Uh, uh, it is not just a commercial and uh, economic power, but it's also um, a technical, uh, a technical power, and has to do with this, uh, um, with this uh, availability of data and the, and the role that data have in uh, in shaping uh, AI technologies. Um, just to make an example, um, uh, so uh, there are uh, approaches also for recent for voice assistance that uh, you know some. Uh, um, Open source um, uh, experiment, but uh, uh, for instance, Amazon is a bit cannibalizing uh, these uh, these approaches uh, because it provides uh, um, uh, options to uh, uh, to um, uh, to use to take up uh, uh, the infrastructure, the software infrastructure of uh, of Alexa, and uh, um, use it for your own purpose. And uh, uh, so you you can um, uh, basically uh, adapt uh, Alexa to your work environment, uh, your enterprise uh, environment, uh, and uh, and you receive uh, you know tools to do that. Um, so so that's the issue is that uh, often you know this uh, this possibility to to take up uh, um, the technology and uh, and uh, creatively. Um, uh, work with it uh, uh, is also, uh, in a way, cannibalized by by the by the big corporations. So I think that uh, it's, it would be very important to have uh, uh, more uh, projects that uh, provide uh, uh, strong alternatives. Thank you very much. So uh, I will go to the next. Camila de Avila asks, and her question is about this idea of embodiment in AI. From this imagery that we have around uh, all the artificial intelligence issue, from uh, this construction, can we say that we have a rediscovery of the dimension of this body? Talking about, uh, she's talking about allowing ourselves to think about other possible worlds, other possible corporealities of different bodies. Do machines also start, uh, also have embodied experiences? Maybe I can say something around that. Yes. Um, well, uh, of course, the, the idea of embodiment is not something uh, that starts with AI or starts with new media, although uh, maybe uh, in some way, uh, the way that things are being built and being discussed today, they somehow uh, bring back the discussion of, of embodiment, maybe because we have this uh, first movement of this idea that we are in the digital environment uh, to interact in a, a quote-unquote limited way, and the idea of embodiment maybe it's a it's a historically idea that uh, our relationship with machines uh, always uh, come about and, and asking ourselves if we can somehow build something 
that would have a body of its own, or maybe we'll have a, it will be our uh, sort of our extension and, and so forth. And probably uh, the, the more we face uh, solutions in with use of artificial intelligence, like projects like, I don't know if you heard of that, this person is not real, that there's a website that constantly puts on pictures of people that do not exist in the real world, but are based on, on data and they are very realistic in, in, in some way or photorealistic in some way. So uh, we are uh, experienced once again, this idea that uh, there is sort of a, a, a magical trickery thing going on between uh, when, when image are, images are being built and bodies are being built with the use of artificial intelligence. And uh, of course, this also has influence of all the audiovisual environment, as movies and video games, and all these things intertwine uh, in some ways. I think uh, there is potential for the re rediscovery of the body, but also we see as the videos that I showed some sort of uh, repetition of, of roles, repetition of uh, visuals that uh, uh, come come back as as a reinforcement of way power is distributed, of the way uh, the roles of the female and the male are established. And uh, as, as you said before, Giselle, the way that AI should be something very well behaved, uh, almost like a, uh, like a waiter, instead of uh, uh, someone who has the right to feel moody and to maybe answer something not what we are expecting. So, and once again, I think the, we have a potential for experimentation in these fields. And uh, once again, large companies such as the ones that I showed are investing in this field. And uh, we should uh, think of how, uh, th that's why when, when we say about uh, non-democratic and democratic as two very, as, as very clear different spheres I'm not very sure of that. I think things are much more on a gray area, and that makes it even more challenging for us to think about these issues. I, I completely agree with uh, Gustavo, and, and um, those are excellent points. I just want to add one about um, this, this recurring narrative of how the core reality of humans might change through AI technologies. So um, a, a narrative that has been around for a few decades now is um, that of us being able to transcend our bodies, for instance, through mind uploading. Um, and what I find um, quite uh, irksome in those narratives is the assumption that we do not want or need our bodies, that we would be happier and better without them, and also that removing ourselves, whatever that might mean, from those bodies will not damage those selves. And I find it's it's very often um, the people perpetuating those narratives are the people who have never. Um, been compartmentalized, categorized, profiled based on their bodies. People who have, who have from uh, a, a, a very young age, um, been um, made aware how important their body is to the rest of their identity, whether that's through gender or ethnicity or disability. Um, I find often have very different ideas about um, the role of their body with regard to the rest of their selves and whether that can indeed be separated and whether that's a good thing. Uh, the next question is by Ricardo Uri. Uh, he says that one question that arises is the potential for, uh, well, uh, for artificial intelligence to produce news and act in the media and other forms of communication. Would it be one of the trends of the new journalism? Uh, 
Gustavo or Kenta or Simon who wants to... Simon has raised his hand. I could, uh, well, uh, this is a great question. And uh, well, in part, uh, this is already happening because um, especially for um, uh, for news that are uh, very much related to data, for instance, in uh, finance news or in sport news, uh, a lot of content that uh, is on the web is actually uh, so produced automatically by uh, by uh, AI that uh, write uh, pieces uh, that uh, you know take up uh, uh, results of games, uh, you know, and organize it in a in a very, in a simple narrative. So, so to some extent, this is already happening. There is a lot of that, and uh, this is a good um, a good question. And uh, I I think that. Um, uh, one one key thing in in this area as well as in other areas will be uh the um uh, the way the, the need also to uh to 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 make to be clear about uh, who uh produces uh, uh so uh, a news item and how a news item uh, is uh, is produced um and uh, this uh, this will uh, you know uh, it's something that uh, uh, that informs also, uh, so that helps also uh, readers to uh, to exercise a, um, a <coughs> honest and uh, um, useful amount of uh, of skepticism and uh, of uh, uh, so, you know reading reading also uh, um, the the source and uh, and understanding also the context of production of a new so so I would say that it is important that in the future it, it is uh, it is uh, communicated yeah who produces the news and when a news is produced automatically this is uh, clearly uh, shown thank you for the question this now a question is by Elton Gennadi these avatar bearing AIs are designed to seem like humans simulating a human behavior on social networks. They are kind of staggerized. At the same time, these networks are designed to stimulate some behavioral patterns, which in turn are set to meet specific social, political, and economical goals. How are these global power struggles related to the challenge of developing a decolonial AI. So who of you, Gustavo, Kanta, Simone, who? I think that we can begin with uh, Gustavo or you, some of you prefer to answer Simone or Kenta. I can try, but uh, if Gustavo or Kanta would say would say something first, or um, so yeah, yeah, this is a nice question. I mean, it's uh, uh, a, a, a very nice example of uh, of uh, that, that can uh, maybe also help um, answer this question is the the Twitter account of uh, of the Mars rover of NASA uh, Perseverance. Yeah, this this uh, this uh, rover that was. Uh, um, in, uh, so there was a, um, it is exploring, yeah, part of uh, Mars, and uh, um, in this uh, Twitter account that I will post in the in the chat, um, Perseverance speaks, speaks in the in first person, yeah, as it would be uh, talking uh, itself. Of course, uh, uh, actually the account is uh, uh, edited by uh, by. Uh, Public relations uh, and so uh, people at NASA. Um, but what is interesting, I think, is that uh, these people at NASA are quite aware of uh, also of the of how Twitter works, um, and they, they do something that is similar to what also celebrities do. A lot of uh, uh, celebrity accounts actually so they post with first person, but they are not the celebrities who's, uh, who are writing. Uh, the post. Uh, they are the PR people who are writing uh, this post for them, and something similar is happening in this case uh, uh, with uh, with a robot. So, so this uh, tells us that uh, um, to understand also how AI works and the impact and their the outcome of their communication, uh, 
uh, we also have to understand the particular context, uh, the, the also the, the the media context uh, where they, they happen. Yeah, and uh, uh, if uh, uh, so, a uh, chatbot works through the social media. Uh, so we have to understand how the environment, this, uh, this specific platform, uh, works uh, um, to understand how so how uh, so they they work. Thank you. Uh, uh, now it's a question from Gustavo Nicolau Gonçalves, and the question is uh, straight ahead directed to Kenta. Uh, in your research, do you observe any movement of the decolonization of AI narratives in the science, science fiction gender? Uh, Gustavo recent observed some recreations of Lovecraft universe with racial concerns that would try to correct the author's racist point point of view. Right. Yes. Thank you very much. Um, that is a, a really interesting question, and I think rather than having people sort of um reimagine all the stories what i find particularly interesting is the uh, ability to um or, or the necessity of us to to platform alternative narratives um so that means uh l looking at what else is out there narratives that aren't built on for instance racist structures um we're uh, of which there are very many. Um, I mean, so we, we can see that, for instance, with AI narratives, there have been um, stories that um, were less diverse or from a very narrow point of view that in subsequent um, versions have become more inclusive, um, such as the Terminator uh, films, which in the um, most recent uh, film uh, have a much wider uh, uh, more female cast and uh, the killer robot is now um, Mexican, um, whether that's for good or ill. Um, but um, th there are many uh, stories and have been around for a long time that really focus uh, on um, uh, these issues from original perspectives that have not been based in um, uh, narrow uh, dominant uh, narrative structures from the beginning. Um, there have been, uh, for instance, brilliant science fiction novels by um, uh, uh, people like uh, Annalie Newitz, um, S.B. Divya and Lecky, um, who look at uh, artificial intelligence from uh, different gendered um, and racialized uh, perspectives. So um, in, in that sense, yes, I, I do uh, very much observe that and I would um, encourage people to, to check those out as alternatives. Um, now, I'm, I'm afraid uh, I can't stay on for uh, very much uh, longer. Um, so um, as, as I am un unmuted, I will just use this opportunity to say uh, thank you so much to uh, my fellow panelists, uh, to Giselle for moderating and uh, to the organizers. Uh, thank you for having me. Thank you, Kenta. Unfortunately, I must say that we will probably not have time to answer so many interesting questions, but I remind you all that we have all day long today and tomorrow for more debates. So I uh, thank you for your participation, Kenta, and I will address the uh, two questions for the other panelists, and then unfortunately we will close this amazing and inspiring session of the opening of this uh, symposium. So uh, thank you very much, Kenta. Feel free to go. Uh, Gustavo, there is one question from Augusto Bossetti. Uh, he found very interesting the way how Magalu's artificial intelligence made reference, reference to the role to the role of a 3D 
animator as fundamental to her or its existence. Do you think in from an audiovisual perspective, uh, point of view, that those institutional avatars or any others can help us to think about the central role that the animation could play in the artificial intelligence technologies? Thank you for your question, Augusto. I think it's uh, it's something that we can uh, get back to Lev Manovich's idea of, of building a theory of the present. So it is very important to to try to register and try to 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 to, to build a cartography of these practices of of these uh, avatars that use uh, cartoonish or avatar game like uh, characteristics. Because I guess somehow we still need to uh see these ai uh personas uh, with some level of artificial artificiality on their visuals we do know they they, they are they they exist because of programming but somehow they need to be in this sort of ba uh, boundaries so sort of frontier uh, between human like uh, aspects but also something that will bring us the comfort idea that we are dealing with something artificial at the same time. I'm just speculating here because if we get a, a bot that has a more photorealistic approach, uh, probably we tend to somehow look at it at, at, as a black mirror sort of approach to a relationship where we put in doubt who are we talking to and what's going on. And maybe the more animation, the, the use of animation uh, is in a strategy to some sort of uh, try to uh, in, in, uh, try to bring a, a search of so, sort of a friendly environment for something that's happening uh, on the backstage regarding that expropriation or other issues. So probably uh, we we are still in this phase that we need to look at these animations as a comfortable idea that we are dealing with something that's there but not really there i don't know some, some, some something something in that sense thank you very much gustavo there are so many interesting questions that i'm sure that those two days will be really 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 good so i will address you the last question and I would ask to you, Gustavo or Simon, to briefly answer because it is a question that I think that it's, um, it crosses uh, all sessions. And it's a very good question by Olaf Siebert, uh that in soon, uh, he says that all these AI models are created uh, as white male and even when they are female their point of departure is kind of anthropomorphic uh, image of the AI. Uh, from this point of view uh, and based on a, a post-feminist and neo-materialist thinking how can we imagine other forms of AI? Should, should I start? <laughs> so thank you, Ola. Thank you so much for this question, which is uh, very important and interesting. And um, I'd say that, uh, uh, well, uh, I'm, I'm not sure that anthropomorphization is uh, the, project, the problem alone, because if we look at the, at the history of AI, we see that uh, any ways in which uh, the, the human was uh, included in the conversation um, uh, was uh, uh, biased towards uh, a, um, a male, uh, um, uh, man, so a white man, uh, so a, um, a representation and in in the approach. So, for instance, uh, even the emergence of the ideas of uh, um, human computer interactions were always actually so we were presented as a man computer interaction in the, in the history of AI. And uh, the, uh, 
uh, even the, the idea of the computer user was always uh, so in, uh, along the case in the history of computer science and AI um, was usually um, presented as a, a white male also with uh, a specific uh, uh, medium high uh, class background. Uh, so it was it was very specific in terms of uh, class, uh, race, uh, gender. So what I would say is that uh, we need uh, a wider um, reworking of uh, of all our um, language, uh, but also practical approaches uh, to uh, to the uh, to the human. That is uh, uh, so that is uh, um, the end part of what uh, of our high works because AI always, uh, uh, like all technologies, uh, uh, work within, uh, within also human uh, culture and society. So, so it's something that, uh, um, that has, uh, uh, so that is to take up, uh, all, so uh, not only the, the, uh, the, the issue of anthropomorphization, as you, that, that you rightly mentioned, but also, uh, uh, also ideas of interaction and what is the, uh, what we call uh, human, yeah, and, uh, and uh, uh, so we have to look for for more uh, um, uh, so wider approaches to this uh, to this idea of human. This often has been presented in very restrictive uh, fashion. Perfect. So I, I, uh, are you? I'm, I'm just going to sub subscribe Simone's words and also add that uh, we should uh, think uh, more frequently about how we are going to teach and research these issues, uh, working alongside with the idea of prototypation, experimentation, and I guess these are paths that we we we, we must as. Uh, this broader field that we can call digital humanities or, or any other name that we could label it. And, and this sort of approach, I think it's fundamental. So, so we can sort of rewire uh, some patterns and some uh, points of view and some roles that we are still using in our society and our work and, our, in, in, and that we see in the images and the image, imagery. Thank you, that was it. Thank you all. Yes, it is a very challenging question. I I was thinking that uh, on the Spike Jones film, her that maybe is the more interesting AI ever created in fiction, and she does it. She is a woman, and she is voice only, and so maybe it is the beginning for thinking about your interesting uh, question. Uh, unfortunately, we do not have time to all other questions, but you have more one day and a half to put them again. And I will thank you all for the important questions, the amazing presentation, and Rafael for the invitation. Thank you, Giselle, and thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Giselle, Simone, and, and Gustavo. We will be back in five minutes with the next panel, AI Infrastructure, with Gabriel Pereira, Vladan Joller, and Jan Chao. See you in five minutes. See you. Thank you very much. Tchau, Gisele. Abraço. Obrigado. Tchau, tchau, querido. Tchau, Simone. Bye, bye. Bye, Simone. Thank you.
Hi, Blinden. Hi, hi, Jean. I wanted to, can I, can I ask before we start, um, some help in pronouncing your names correctly? <laughs> can you, can you just uh, tell me how you'd like me to pronounce your names? Blinden and Jean. Well, well, my, my name is Vladan, but Vladan. you can pronounce however you want. And uh, <laughs> your name is Yola. Yola, okay. Yeah. Vladan so, Yola, okay, perfect. Um, my name is Jian Xiao. So, Jian I, I Xiao. Think, yeah. Uh, Raffle, that was quite, quite well, <laughs> actually. No, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just wanted to be sure. So I don't misname anybody. <laughs> <laughs> great we will start thank you for having us uh, we will start the second panel of histories of AI imaginaries and materialities with the AI infrastructures panel what are AI infrastructures in their histories how do artificial intelligence infrastructures relate to colonialism and westernism how does AI relate to digital platforms, human labor, data, and plat planetary resources? It's a very broad question. And the moderator will be Gabriel Pereira, PhD candidate at the University of Aarhus, Denmark. He was a visiting student in the Comparative Media Studies Master's Program at MIT. And his research focuses on critical data studies, algorithms, and digital infrastructure using social and artistic research methodologies. Welcome, Gabriel. Thank you for having us. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, Rafael, and everybody. So, hi, everybody. I'm Gabriel Pereira. I am, as Rafael said, a PhD fellow here at Almost University. And welcome to another panel of Histories of AI. It's been, we already had a great panel before, and now we're going to be talking about AI infrastructures. And the event, as I hope everybody knows, is hosted by the Digital Labor Research Group, Research Lab, and the University of Cambridge. And so a few questions to add to those that Raphael already uh, put for us that I wrote as I was preparing and thinking about this discussion we're gonna have right now were, what are the current discussions on the material conditions of emergence and the deployment of AI? And what are their connections to wider ecologies of platforms, funding structures, venture capitalism, rare earth minerals and philosophies and labor. And so it is my pleasure to introduce our two guests for today, uh, Vladen Yola. Uh, he's a professor at the new media department <laughs> uh, of the University of Novi Sad, Serbia and the SHARE Foundation co-founder. Uh, so the SHARE Lab, is, SHARE Lab is a research and data investigation lab for exploring different technical and social aspects of algorithmic transparency, digital labor, exploitation, invisible infrastructures, black boxes, and many other contemporary phenomena on the intersection between technology and society. And he's the co-author of the article's Anatomy of an AI System with Kate Crawford and the NoScope Manifested, AI as an Instrument of Knowledge Extractivism with Matteo Pasquinelli. And Jin Shao uh, is a professor in journalism and communication at Shexiang University in China. And her main research areas are urban aesthetics and communication, public art intervention, new media culture, and so on. And she's the author of Punk Culture in Contemporary China and holds a PhD in Media and Culture Studies from Lowborough University. I hope I said that one right as well, Lowborough. Uh, she's <laughs> co-author of the articles, <laughs> The Westernizing Studies, History and Logics of Chinese and US Platforms with Mike Davis and Music Streaming Platforms and Self-Releasing Musicians, The Case of China, with David Desmond, Hesmond Hall, another difficult name that I don't know if I pronounce right. Uh, so I, uh, as you can see, this is a very informal event. If I will ask, uh, ask this to have a, a casual vibe. And so I will give each of you 15 minutes for your, for your presentation, your talk, and then we can jump into a Q&A uh, for the remaining time of about 15 minutes or so. So Vladan, would you like to go first? Yeah, okay, that's fine with me. Okay. Great. Thank you. So, yeah, first of all, I'm really super happy to, to be here today. And uh, it's really a pleasure to participate. I was listening to the previous uh, uh, panel. It was really, really, really super interesting. And I want to, to maybe excuse myself a bit 
uh, in advance because I'm kind of fresh out of uh, COVID situation here. So maybe I will be a bit slower or faster. I don't know. It's going up and down all the time. So, uh, but in any case, yeah. Uh, so what I'm doing, I, I uh, basically I was running one, one uh, research group that was called Share Lab. So we were kind of some kind of like, let's say investigators or, 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 uh, or maybe detectives in the field of, of like uh, uh, technical infrastructures. And, 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 and basically, you know, after some time of, of different kinds of research, I realized that I'm going deeply into some kind of mapping and cartography, but it was mostly some kind of counter cartography because it was coming from the position of a little man you know, like trying to understand some kind of invisible infrastructures out there. So basically, I started to 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 draw some kind of big maps, and and one of the the I will try to share the screen now. One of the, the most famous one it's it's this one called the Anatomy of an AI System. Try to find it somewhere here. Yeah, looks like this. And most of my maps are are big black and 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 kind of complicate and 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 so but this map anatomy of an ai system i think it's a good good one for the beginning of this story uh because it, it it's basically uh, speaking about this kind of wider and deeper anatomy of 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 one system because like and 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 but we started to to map with this one, it was basically start. We were starting with like one little object that is called Amazon Alexa, and then trying to understand like what's going on behind that. And this is basically what I, what I was doing, but in different projects for like, you know, uh, uh, let's say five, six years, I was trying to find the different ways how to investigate what's going on behind the screen, because I think like it's really naive to think that that. That you know, like if we think speak about this, like Amazon Alexa, for example, you know, to think that this is really that AI, it's inside of this black cylinder. It's basically the same thing to think that inside of TV screen there is there are little people, you know. So so and for me it was like really challenged to try to understand what is the the to try to find the different ways how to to investigate those. Uh, 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 basically uh, uh, different kinds of like uh, uh, invisible infrastructure. And, and then most of my stories and, and our maps are starting with the user. So th this one as well. And then we were, you know, opening this device and seeing what's going on inside. And, and, and this is like one by one different kinds of layers of untransparency, because even on that level of device, you are not able, you know, like there is, as well a lot of different problems you know like for example like the, the lack of technical uh, documentation or, or or like a lot of different things even on that level but then when you go deeper there then you have like routers then you have like internet service providers then you have like uh, different objects different infrastructures like routers servers and stuff like this and then going deeper and deeper into some kind of like, uh, um, you know, cor corporate infrastructure, for example, Amazon uh, cloud, but then going deeper, you will find some kind of like, the, you know, like softwares and tools in this case, like machine learning system. But then even if you go deeper, then you will see like some kind of infrastructure behind that. And in a way this, you know, like it, it's just a question like how deep you want to go in your uh, uh, exploration, you can go in indefinitely in a sense, like, because like, for example, behind this infrastructure, then you have like different kinds of like uh, processes, different kinds of labor that are basically constituting this infrastructure. Then you have, for example, in case of AI, you have like uh, uh, training data and then behind the training data, you have like different processes that I also explore with in no scope with Matteo Pasquinelli, uh, uh, different processes basically that are needed in order to create data sets 
then you have like a lot of lot of different layers and a lot of different so the question is like how wide or how far you want to go and how far this definition of what ai is you know you want to accept you know like how you know like where is the border but then uh, basically all of this is just like one part of the story because then i had some kind of turn in research in, in which like basically this kind of like a, 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 let's say geology of media as UC uh, Parika will write about it is, is kicked in and and then if what I did in, in the sense of I started to think about all of those infrastructures that I was like investigating and researching I started to think about that in time and and this is basically where we're left part of the map is being born. So, so basically, if we rewind the time, like, I don't know, 50 years ago, all of those parts of this infrastructure that, that we were investigating were different kinds of rocks and different kinds of metals. And then, and this is why this map and this story is basically starting with earth. And then I'm following different kinds of elements where they are coming from, where those metals are coming from and how they're basically moving around the globe. So this is some kind of like, a, you know, dance or let's say a spectacle or, or theater, planetary scale theater of moving of, of goods and different kinds of invisible labor that we do not, you know, think about when we, when we think about AI. And this is something that, that, for example, when Christian Fuchs is, is like defining the, the, the digital labor, he's also including, and this is in a sense like it was really helpful for me, he's also including, you know, like in digital labor, he's including the, the, the you know, uh, the, the workers in the mines in Congo, he's including like the, the, the you know, people who are assembling those devices in Foxconn. So all of those different uh, uh, kinds of like labor that is basically needed and processes that are needed uh, uh, in order to, for us to have those devices, but not just devices, but the infrastructure itself, you know. And, and, and so, and, and in a way I was like for years, like, like investigating just infrastructures you know and 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 then and then we are used to speak about the black boxes when we speak about infrastructure and when we speak about things and and, and processes that are happening within the ai but investigating those like uh, uh, production process of those devices i realized that also those kind of production chains are also some kind of uh, uh, black boxes because, for example, for, for Intel and, and, and for other companies that in one, one moment even wanted to, to, you know, to make their own supply chains more transparent, they needed, for example, two years to investigate their own. So, so what we are seeing, for example, in case of, uh, I don't know, uh, Apple and other companies, for example, I, Apple have like 200 something like first layer uh, 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 providers of, of different, you know, components and stuff. And then those 200 have their own 200. And then those, you know, like thousands of them have their own suppliers. And in a way, this is some kind of like, uh, 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 let's say, uh, mm, fractal image or fractal structure. So basically this production of, of those uh, 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 those devices and this infrastructure is basically some kind of like fractal, uh, 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 let's say rhizome or whatever of, of different relations. And, and what is also like really, really important is that like all the time we are seeing a movement. So it's constant movement of, of materials and metals and objects and, and, and everything around the world. And, and what is like also really important is that the ecological price for that it's not paid by no one. So you have a situation that you, for example, have from the south of, of America, uh, south, south of Africa, you have like movement of, I don't know, like bauxite. So they are moving bauxite on the north to, to Island in order to, 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 to create
create some kind of like next level in production of aluminium because the electricity is cheaper there, you know. But by moving mountains, you are basically destroying the ecosystem, still doing like a lot of different things. So there is a lot of different stories there. But then in a way we can also take, a, you know, like, a, a, so for me, like, once I was able to go out, because when I was researching infrastructure, uh, uh, I was basically mostly like speaking about privacy, about surveillance. I was like, those were like the main surveillance, privacy, and, and security. You know, those were like main terms. But but when I when I started to include this kind of deep time or, or like when I started to include this kind of processes of production, then other questions came to, to, to surface. It's a, it's a question of like, uh, uh, I don't know, um, equality. It's a question of exploitation. It's a, uh, uh, it's a question of extractivism that is all over there. So it's a one huge system of, of extraction of human labor and, 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 and resources that are basically destroying completely uh, the earth at the end in, in, in the process. So, so I somehow became like uh, obsessed with, with like researching and, and, and mapping this kind of planetary scale factory that, that is behind the AI, that is behind the, the contemporary network technologies. And, uh, um, but, but you can also think like, and, and, and then there is some, some project that I'm working on now and, and, it, and it's pity because it, it really fits into this question of, uh, uh, um, you know, history of AI. So, but I cannot speak a lot about this because we are just on the beginning, but, but in a way uh, I'm also like trying to research like deep histories of all of those processes as well. So, for example, and then most of the time, even when I was like exploring this map, it was always bringing me back to, to, to some kind of like uh, beginning of, of or, or industrial revolution. And, and because like all, all of those different kind types of exploitation or types of, 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 of uh, extractivism or like born in, 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 in that period, you know, and then basically what we are seeing now, it's some kind of like evolved version of, of some of those processes. So for example, triangular trade, that was kind of like, you know, in, rooted in this kind of like colonial and, 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 uh, and uh, uh, practice of like the, the movement of slaves, constant movement of ships that were like picking slaves and bringing them to United States, then picking the, the the cotton, then moving to 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 UK where you are making some kind of like t-shirts or whatever, and then selling this and again buying the slaves. So this kind of movement, constant movement of goods and people and materials are not new. You know, like they're all coming from 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 uh, that period. But okay, maybe we can speak about this. You know, later in. Uh, how, how long I should speak? Is it like 15 minutes, no? Or Yeah, a total of 15 minutes. I okay, so I'm now... For like 10 minutes, so around five minutes more should be okay. Oh, okay, okay, cool, cool. And then then uh, if you if you zoom out, for example, in, in, a, in a, a, I don't know, process of, uh, uh, you know, how those different technologies that are embedded within the AI are born, then you are... It, it's really not, it's really hard to avoid the issues of, for example, eugenics, the issue of, 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 of different kinds of, for example, all of this fake, you know, collection of people faces are basically rooted back into jails, in, into like collection of like, you know, faces of criminals. And then you, you have like, you know, all the time you're basically meeting this kind of like idea of racism, of, of colonialism, of, 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 of most of those things that we want to forget, you know, eugenics and stuff like this, or, you know, and, but all of them are basically somehow embedded in the history, deep history of, of ideas that brought us this idea of, for example, face recognition. 
you know and 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 uh, and uh, and that's something that we should you know probably not forget you know we should not forget that 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 most of the time those technologies are coming either from like this kind of like uh, you know repressive colonial ideas or from the 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 military or from uh, uh, you know some kind of uh, uh, there are some kind of tools of police uh, uh, state, you know. And yeah, I think for, for the moment, this is like uh, where I want to stop and maybe maybe we can continue. Uh, like, that was fantastic. You know. Thank you so much for the presentation. Um, I already have a lot of questions and I imagine cool. people also want to ask a lot of questions. And for now, I ask that, uh, I ask that people who have questions like me, uh, write them in the Q&A. Uh, section, or if you have problems with that, you can also write them in the chat and we can help you. And so uh, I'll invite Jen Shao to present uh, for 15 minutes now. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for inviting me. Um, my Today, my talk is based on my uh, latest paper, Dewitzinizing Platform Studies, History and Logics of Chinese and US Platforms. So uh, when I uh, being invited into this section called AI infrastructure. I'm not quite sure. I have uh, reflect on um, this term. Um, what I am sure is uh, when I approach platform studies, my approach is uh, kind of based on my previous uh, academic uh, experiences, cultural studies. So, um, so I, I think the the, the, the paper I'm talking about or research I focus on is all based on this, this kind of uh, approach, which is very different to political economy or, uh, or other approaches. Um, uh, first, I want to talk about de-Westernization. Uh, I think the de westernizing this concept has long been existed. Um, for instance, um, there is a course for de westernization invites scholars refl reflect on pound the broad conditions of intellectual production and propose an estimic, uh shift because of their locations and histor historical context, communication research in Africa, Asia, uh, the Middle East and Latin America confronted questions about the um, intellectual origins of frameworks and research questions much earlier in, than in the West. But from, um, you know, in, my, in, in our paper, me and co-author has proposed a new uh, position. Basically, we think the very concept of de-Westernization um, to extend assumes that a Western frame, because it implies a corrective to the Western thought, uh, taken as a dominant. So to a certain extent, this concept uh, re-emphasis is the West as the central and uh, uh, re-scribes uh, the otherness of the other. So, um, so we think like the, the concept of the de-Westernization actually fails to provide a, a legitimistic uh, standpoint for us being included uh, in the reconsider frame of, you know, whatever field is being de-Westernized. So um, we think maybe another approach or term called uh, re-regionalize uh, is more suitable for uh, de-westernize. Um, so um, uh, when we start this uh, um, compar com comparison between the Chinese West platforms and the US platforms, we wish to avoid the methodological nationalism. Um, that naturalizes the organization of the world into nation states. So um, our focus in Chinese platforms is not intended to solidify uh, the nation state as a category, um, but to identify locally specific uh, historical, cultural, and technological uh, characteristics. Um, so that can, and so, so combined with the you, uh, U.S. China platform into mm, communities that can together contribute to uh, a particular regional media history. So for for doing this, uh, we 
have uh, divided to four factors to talk about this 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 comparison. So first is the the role of different media histories in platform uh, development. Second is a different differing hegemonic projects that underpin the the development of platforms. Third is changing center periphery dynamics and platform development. And the, third, uh, and the fourth is cultural differences in the operations of platforms and affordances. So, um, the the, uh, the 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 concept, the term platform itself is actually very culturally specific. So, for I think uh, we all know how the platform is uh, nowadays. When people say platform, we always think about its online on, online platform. Um, but platform denotes, for instance, in Chinese term, as a, a, a raised area. Uh, such as a balcony or stage uh, that invites people to gather, to act, to work, and to express opinions and ideas. Uh, so um, it's a more open uh, concept than Anglo-American uh, sense of the world. So, um, so for, for me, I think a platform, when I talk about platforms, I probably will sometimes include the, the offline uh, rather than simply just the online uh, sense. Um, so, um, um, but then, then I will talk about the characteristics of Chinese and US uh, platforms. The first is the role of different media histories in platform uh, development. Um, uh, we believe that uh, in, in China, especially, uh, there is a very strong uh, factor, which is a state uh, initiative that has uh, somehow lead to uh, has kind of contributed to the the, the, the platform development today uh, uh, very recently so there is a you know you can see that the intertwining of priorities uh, can be seen in the a prominence given media uh, for instance in the third 13th five plan uh, five year plan of 2016 so which prioritized ICTs as the basis for a uh, future Chinese uh, prosperity um, and um, the, the the so the the historical uh, specificities um, so although although Chinese and the Western, you know, this is the part I want to say something that I, I feel very interested in. So the the, the although Chinese and the Western platform rely on a business model um, based in investing user data, mm, uh, Chinese platforms nevertheless a product of the specific market and structure context in which they emerged. So um, take for instance of Alibaba and um, and Amazon. Uh, so for, uh, I think the previous opinions always think that Alibaba is often seen as a, a China's Amazon. So, so it's kind of like a copycat. Uh, but actually when, when we look at it in, uh, to, more, to a more deeply, uh, deeper uh, sense, we can, see, we can see that Alibaba grew out of a, a different logic and a set of com commitments to small and uh, medium uh, size business as well as uh, 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 you know large businesses which it coupled with uh, Amazon, Amazon like attention to the you know to to different elements. So uh, Alibaba was making was making a market where there was none, uh, whereas uh, like Ali, uh, Amazon was um, you know uh, cannibalizing uh, already existing established uh, national markets and build its uh, network on top of pre-existing national supply uh, chains. Um, and um, mm, the, the, the second uh, dimension that I, I feel, you know, I want to talk is the di different, differing hegemonic projects that underpin the development of platforms. So, um, uh, from what we discovered, we find that there is a difference between U.S. Uh, platform and China, especially uh, response. You know the difference response to uh, the capital. So we think the U.S. platform is more like a response to the capital uh, cumul accumulation and happened in a long uh, downturn. Um, 
the period. But uh, comparatively, China happens a long upturn period. So it's a so 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 for the U.S. platform, it's more like a techno uh, libertarian, and for uh, China, it becomes more like a techno nationalist. The 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 very uh, 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 the the example for the China uh, platform as a techno nationalist is it's a going out strategy. So uh, for uh, China's platforms plays a very important uh, uh, role in China's uh, go, uh, going out strategy as part of Chinese, China dream of establishing itself as a central world power. So um, I think this is because the anxiety derived from the other counterparts in, in Asia, for instance, like South Asia, uh, uh, South, South, Korean, South Korean pop culture, and um, mm, so, uh, so China kind of wants to play its cultural uh, influence. Um, so, and uh, the, the, the going out strategy has also uh, uh, the uh, ascension of President Xi Jinping uh, becomes associated with the China dream, which Xi has in expressed in terms of uh, a great revival of the Chinese nation uh, set to define its uh, modern history. So another example that happened in, in uh, is the success of TikTok. Uh, so the first Chinese uh, platform, so the, to achieve the significant market uh, success outside China. So it illustrates the, the, the complex priorities of China, China's soft power. And, uh, and uh, uh, comparatively, the Chinese uh, platform hegemony is not out forward uh, uh, the, the, the facing. Um, so uh, just as Western platforms uh, project the hegemony of, uh, of uh, free markets and disruption, labor uh, flexibility internationally and domestically, so China, Chinese platforms play a role in projecting and directly managing uh, market and uh, state power in a uh, domestic context. So and uh, and uh, the other one, I, uh, the other dimension I want to talk is the changing the center uh, periphery dynamics and platform uh, development. So uh, uh, for um, so for for China, mm, uh, I think this is uh, the the part we we start talk about how how. Um, stronger that China has become and the, the prominence that it, uh, it gains in the, in, the, in the world situation. So uh, for instance, the WeChat, uh, one very important uh, uh, software, uh, social media software in China, uh, which, is, uh, mm, taken, which has taken ideas from WhatsApp, but now it has uh, become the, um, you know, surpasses the functionality of uh, Silicon Valley platforms. Uh, so for the, for instance, WeChat, um, they have, um, you know, much more um, powers than uh, WhatsApp. Uh, it has combined the, 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 mm, the, the, the functions uh, that probably can only be seen from different, uh, 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 different softwares for the, 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 the Instagram or Facebook, uh, uh, when they are separated in uh, American or, or in the Western platforms in China, it, you can all, all find in WeChat as a complex. Uh, and uh, um, so uh, the, the technological advances that uh, consistent with China's uh, Growing structure power, as expressed in also its uh, Belt and um, Road Initiative, and its Digital Silk Road con counterpart. So this includes initiatives such as Alibaba sponsored electronic uh, world trade platform. So um, so so it is kind of a clear and bold initiative to shape global trade and expresses growing influences of uh, China's internet uh, internet firms. So at least in uh, for for the Belt Road uh, initi initiative, the, the, this uh, kind of countries, China has uh, demonstrated its uh, its a central power. 
Uh, uh, for the last point, is uh, cultural differences in operations of platforms and their affordances. The the one uh, particular um, uh, uh, cultural influence is guanxi, uh, uh, which is called um, relationship. In, in uh, so so it's it's kind of uh, this this simple term has kind of can demonstrate the fundamental issues of cultural differences that impact the design and use of platforms. Uh, so, um, so um, uh, for, instance, for instance, if because we have Guanxi, this kind of relation ideas uh, is so, so strong. So Guanxi played a key role in uh, WeChat's uh, early rapid, uh, rapid uh, development uh, development with its uh, 20, uh, 2013 uh, no, launch of virtual red market uh, red packet, uh, a function that enabled uh, users to exchange the traditional uh, red packets during uh, Spring Festival, uh, which required users to link their bank account to their profile and rapidly uh, ac accelerated uh, VChat's e e-commerce uh, capacity. Um, so um, I think um, for uh, what I have, you know, talk about the four dimensions, what remains very clearly is that the regional platform uh, histories and logics are not interchangeable. And uh, globalization is no longer uh, exclusively uh, Western. So, um, so I think it's, you know, our scholars, then we have to open up and re regionalize uh, platform studies because it can address different um, histories and uh, state and cultural imperatives drives the perhaps in their different cultural context. Okay, uh, I have finished my talk. Thank you. Thank you so much. I uh, thank you so much, YouTube. You. That was two fantastic talks, and now. We can move on to some questions um, from from the audience, but I wanted to start with a question for me. <laughs> As your moderator, I have that power to start the questions, and so I have a question for one of uh, for for each of you at a time. And my first question was for Vladen. Um, I was um, interested in this notion of the counter cartography that you that you mentioned, and. Um, I know that your work, I mean, your work, The Anatomy of AI is, is, a, is a big hit. Uh, some people were commenting in the chat that they use it in their classes. I've used it uh, when I'm teaching and I think it's really uh, particularly useful when um, we wanna show a bit of like uh, exactly what you said, you know, what is behind the machines and try to get students and, and people in general to think about that. And I also know that this work has been bought for museum collections and has been exhibited in the museum space. And so the question I wanted to ask you is, um, how do you see uh, how do you see the potential for communicating AI infrastructure to people, and uh, how do you see the importance of doing this, and how do you see your work uh, doing this, or is it not communicating? It's actually doing something else. Well, uh, you know, it it it, it really uh, it was never uh, it was never my intention. You know, like when from my point of view, I, I especially like five six years ago or I was some kind of like a detective you know like some somewhere between uh, you know Blade Runner or, or and something like this you know like and uh, and uh, detective trying to to find a way how to see you know how to see something that is out there something that is behind the uh, different layers of untransparency and then then in that sense the the you know, first it started with a little smaller, you know, like drawings and, but then it, at the end it became mostly like some kind of maps of those kind of big uh, 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 infrastructures or, 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 or let's say big factories of nowadays, because I also made some kind of maps of, of Facebook algorithmic factory and, and this, we, we can say that anatomy of an AI, it's some kind of map of planetary scale. Uh, factory, and uh, and and it's really really interesting to 
you know, usually like the, the and then more I was thinking about map as a, as a map have a lot of different powers, you know, like first it's kind of non-linear narrative. So you can like throw a lot of things there and people can read from many different directions and take whatever they want from there. But, but then, you know, like every time when, when I was doing, especially for example, the, the, the one before with the Facebook algorithmic factory, you know, you, you, you became, you understand that, that, that it will never be a uh, hundred percent accurate it will never be perfect because you are coming from the position of like uh, you know someone who is trying to see something that is unbelievably you know complex and it's hidden and it's protected by different layers of protection you know for you not to see and and in a sense like the feeling is like to go through some kind of woods with a torch and then see some kind of trees and but you are not able to see the whole picture, you know. So I'm aware that those maps are not precise, but but and and, and they will never be, you know. But then in the same time, every map it, it's kind of like a simplification of reality, you know. And then it comes this position of you as a cartographer who needs to 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 you know like choose because each line there it's some kind of choice what to represent and what not to represent. So it's kind of combination of like, you know, so the, the amount of bias that is there, you know, it's it's, <laughs> it's great, you know, but, and, and each line is basically a statement. And, and it, 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 most of the time, it's always about like a classification of reality, you know, like you always have like three or five lines. That means, you know, there are five types of that or three types of that, you know. So, it, but but it's and, and and but at the end, I, I really think it's super important that even we know that we are going to fail, uh, we try to do that because if we do not try to see and understand the shapes of power, the shapes of of factory, the shape of regime or whatever we do, you know, like we are doomed. We are doomed to to live. All the time in the in the in the position of the one who is going to be exploited, the one who is going to be a resource, you know, and not the one who will understand okay how this factory look like, you know. And then we speak about like I don't know surveillance capitalism, and but how the factory look like, you know? and then this is this is the how you know how the process look like. And I'm really amazed that there is no more. You know, like the, the 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 maps of those like algorithmic processes, the maps of like how machine works, the map of like how AI works out there, uh, and uh, especially from the position of this kind of critical cartography or or or, 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 or counter cartography, or something that is not coming from the position of power, because the power tend to make maps. Power, it, it's you know, like, this is my empire, this is my kingdom, this is how the world look like, you know, the world, it's a, I don't know, whatever. And then, but, but, but counter cartography is coming from, you know, another angle, an angle of, of like, um, you know, like the, the, the someone who is not in power. <laughs> <laughs> This, this, this reminded me of the Jorge Luis Borges uh, story about creating a map that is, you know, uh, the correct map uh, and the correct yeah. scale and that it's the size of the word and it just occupies yeah. the whole word and then it doesn't go anywhere. And, and I think it's, um, it's really uh, fascinating, you know, doing this work of visualizing those, those, those algorithms and showing how many different layers they involved, uh, human and non-human and more than human. And uh, connecting that, you know, also the, the platform ecologies that, that we're talking about also need to be expanded. And I think, Inshallah, when you talk about the westernizing platform studies, it's also about trying to make us see that there are other, other um, platforms. You know, in Brazil, we tend to stick to talking about um, Instagram, Facebook, and um, lately that's pretty much it. <laughs> Maybe Google even. Um, but what I wanted to... Um, to ask you about is a bit more about 
the anxieties. And uh, I feel that there's a lot of anxiety about this, uh, you know, especially with TikTok, I think. We've seen a lot of anxiety going on recently. You know, the TikTok, the platform is going to take over and TikTok has become uh, in Brazil, and I hope my colleagues will correct me if I'm totally wrong, but I, uh, I think that's correct, has become a, a big platform in Brazil recently. And so uh, this connects to me a lot with what we're saying about how globalization happens, not only from the West, right? So TikTok is in Brazil right now, and that creates a bunch of questions and a bunch of anxieties of what does TikTok do and what does it mean? And what does it algor its algorithm imply for, you know, how kids are, are seeing content, for example, and what it makes visible and what it hides and so on. And so I was wondering if, if in this project of the westernizing platform studies, how does anxiety or those anxieties around platforms of, uh, operate in your study? Or how do you look at them? Does that make sense? I mean, are you trying to uh, let me reflect on a pound on <laughs> Chinese anxiety? <laughs> Um, What's that? Chinese anxiety, because I think this, uh, uh, for instance, for the Chinese uh, research or the Chinese scholars, when we talk about de-westernizing uh, uh, platform studies, we um, all have a, a agenda that has been shaped or influenced by the Chinese uh, policies or the Chinese current uh, government initiatives that um, de-westernizing uh, Western uh, theoretical frameworks in every aspect of academic uh, research. So, and uh, we can, you know, build on, uh, uh, build uh, our own framework to explain uh, Chinese phenomenon or even, uh, you know, outside China phenomenon. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I think this anxiety has happened uh, after China has gained its uh, power uh, mm -hmm. yeah. around the, you know, and then it, it starts to influence the ideology, uh, especially uh, the, the global communication or, um, you know, how, how we communicate with the outside China and how we can write our own stories uh, to outside China. Uh, I think if you say anxiety, it's probably uh, the anxiety to reshape China's history or position is our country anxiety, and this has happened, or this has uh, this kind of anxiety has been delivered to uh, kind of all Chinese scholars at the moment, or at this kind of pe peculiar period. Um, so, um, uh, but uh, I, I think uh, for me, I think de-westernizing, uh, uh, or not only the platform studies, but in all other uh, areas is a necessary uh, because my, my long term research is uh, uh, punk research. So all my uh, what I'm talking about is how to you know uh, de uh, colonizing global punk or how we can um, uh, trying to uh, construct a, a framework that other than Western uh, ways or framework to write about uh, punks because the, nowadays there are a lot of uh, punks that has uh, emerged in uh, countries more than a western context. Uh, so I, I think anxiety is a driving force actually uh, because we have this kind of anxiety um, we start to look, um, look uh, back uh, to our own histories and context and uh, for instance, when I look at punk or Chinese punk, I may start to add some uh, Chinese philosophy and see how Chinese traditional philosophy has influenced Chinese punks so that uh, they are not only that, they, they, they may not behave so much rebellions like Western punks uh, because we have different you know, philosophy. So that, that's how uh, I think um, probably, you know, uh, to how, how I understand the anxiety. So yeah, no, it makes make, it makes it makes total sense. I think that uh, I think that uh, de westernizing platform studies can be really useful as well to uh, go against those narratives that are um, you know making um, 
making those anxieties exist. You know, I think those narratives originate a lot from European and American discourse on, you know, the Chinese AI is going to do certain things. Uh, and I think that really retaking power over those narratives uh, by studying them based on different kinds of, of philosophies and, and theories, I think is really useful uh, for that. And so I'm going to move on now to the questions from our, from our audience. Um, we have a couple questions for Vladen here right now. Uh, Vladen, how, uh, how, we have a question from Sarita and Ruti. Um, how would you reapproach your earlier interests in surveillance and privacy through these ideas of deep history, and especially the fact of extractivism and environmental destruction? So I think uh, this, this question is a lot, how are those things interconnected now that you've been through them? And there's also a, um, a question from Alexis Steinbrook. Um, how do you deal in your mapping process with uncertainty or not knowing something? Uh, for example, a company like Amazon not completely disclosing the inner workings of a voice assistant. And anybody else that has questions, please send them in the Q&A or in the chat. Vladen. Well, thank you. Thank you. Those are really uh, super interesting questions. So, so uh, let me start with the second one, with the uncertainty. Uh, and, and that's basically the, the also coming back to, to, to some early days of, of my research, because my, my uh, you know, academic background is, is uh, basically art and, and media theory. And being artist, you know, yeah, you don't need to follow a lot of rules, no? But, but then, uh, you know, like in, in, in some moments, I was like uh, basically retiring myself in my head from, from the art uh, uh, field. And, and, and spending a lot of time with investigative journalists and, and with the tech researchers, with lawyers, with some kind of serious people. No? And then I was learning like different kinds of methodologies, how to see the world. You know? But then more and more, I was like going deeper into some kind of like, you know, black boxes or like complexities and stuff like this. I realized that none of those approaches, like, for example, like the... the investigative journalists journalism have their own you know like rules and you need to follow the rules you need to interview the person before publishing or whatever like there is a lot of rules and then for me like uh, 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 that was some kind of like not necessary in a sense to follow those rules and 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 then in in a way more and more more I understood that that like in order to, to see, in order to understand those black boxes, we need to, to look at them from a lot of different angles, in a way, in a way from angle of, I, I don't know, investigative journalism, from tech angle, to, from, from a, a legal angle, but also from, from artistic point of view, like artistic, you know, like, uh, and also from the point of view of philosophy. And then I realized, you know, like, so when you, when you are, painting this n-dimensional object from all of those views. So there is like some kind of freedom to avoid those, those uncertainties, you know, in a sense of like, you know, like it, it, you, you are first not constrained by a lot of rules. So I can jump from one field to another and try to see the angle that is best for seeing it. But, but then, you know, uh, but then in, in a way, like if we speak about uncertainty, it's like, you know, it's everywhere. It, it's everything about that, you know, because like none of those, like we, we uh, mm, 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 you know, luck, they're, they're, luckily there is, there is a lot of research out there, you know, people are trying to do, but, but they're, what, what they're doing most of the time, they're, they're mostly working in some kind of like one field or one element of the system and then for example in, in anatomy of an ai you know it's big it's kind of overwhelming and whatever but but most of those types of research already existed before you know but what was not there there was not mosaic that that, that is consisted of all of those like little uh, parts of research so in a way, like uh, anatomy of an AI was kind of like mosaic of, of, of things that were 
already somehow out there. You know? And but but for example, Facebook and, and, and other research they, that was completely different in the sense that that it, there was nothing about that. And then you need to, you know, like you 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 take what you find, you know, and try to build picture out of that, you know, and, and, and for example, but, but what were, we were like really creative in, it, it was like in finding a different methodology. So for example, patent research, and then some kind of like scraping interfaces, then, um, you know, investigating API in order to understand, because we, we understood that API is, for example, like reflection of the inner structure of the, the database and stuff like this, you know, like, so in a way, I, if, if it's so dark there, it's so blurry, the best, my, you know, suggestion is to be creative in a way how to see, to creative in a way to invent new ways of seeing, new ways of investigations and try to, you know, get the maximum out of it. And so, and the, the sorry for this was a bit long, but then the, and the answer for the, the, the question about surveillance and stuff, I, I, I think it's like, you know, like it's, it, it never gone. And, 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 and basically more and more I'm going deeper into this kind of investigation. I realized that it just like, you know, there are maybe two main parts of like uh, uh, exploitation going on. One, it's exploitation of, of human being and human bodies and human mind and human, you know, uh, uh, emotions and conscious and not conscious and stuff like this. And another one, it's exploitation of, of, of nature. And, and then within the, the exploitation of human body, surveillance plays the main, one of the main roles. You know, like surveillance and surveillance economy is there to, it's a, one of the, main uh, uh, engines of extraction you know surveillance is basically engine of quantification of our bodies quantification of our movement quantification of whatever we do and in that sense you know like the surveillance it's one of the main engines of of, of this system uh, or this like economy that is that is based on exploitation of, of, of uh, uh, our bodies in, in any, but it is sometimes, you know, if you look from the dimension of like, like, you know, we can say like, you know, like the, the surveillance, it's, it's, it's like one of the main tools for, you know, exploitation in, in the North, in the, you know, like the, the um, developed countries. And then in developing countries, people, you know, they are not under, you know, the surveillance, it's not, you know, like one of the, 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 issues in this uh, case because then there you are seeing like exploitation of of body you know exploitation of labor exploitation of 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 you know like kids working in 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 in, in mines and stuff like this you know so it's kind of like uh, uh some kind of uh let's say uh you know like a rainbow of different <laughs> types of exploitations and and uh, and uh, you know, surveillance, uh, it's one of them up there. <laughs> I hope but it's, it, once again, it, yeah, yeah, once again, I think what you're showing is that how, also how surveillance and exploitation happen across those, those different layers and levels and yeah. how um, it's actually very difficult to precise how it happens, you know? I mean, of course, mm -hmm. we all know that it is happening and we might get some examples here and there of, of how it is happening, but it's 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 difficult to represent or visualize the breadth of all of those exploitations and, and surveillances. There, 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 there is like in a, in a, in a, there is one. Uh, let me share the. Uh, there is one. Uh, okay, it's this one. The 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 one of the new maps that I made. It's wow. called the new extractivism, cool. and it's basically cool. about all of those like types of exploitations and types of extractivism. And it, it, it's a bit crazy. Okay, this one is especially crazy because it's kind of like uh, all of those drawings are not like physical objects, but they are different types of allegories, you know, and different kinds of metaphors that are. So, for example, you are here, it's a black hole, and then you are falling into some kind of combination of like uh, allegory of the cave. 
from Plato and, and also Panopticon, and then you are in some kind of cave, and then you are, you know, like it, it's really crazy. But, uh, uh, you know, you have some kind of engines of extraction down there and stuff like this. But, but you know, I think, I think it's like, it's really, really extremely hard to, to, um, to understand all of those different layers and all of, the, all of those different types of, of, of exploitation and, and types of, of extractivism, because most of them are not so visible in a sense of like, it's not easy to understand, you know, like you, you. and, uh, yeah. and the, but the thing is like, you know, like what is clear, it's that, that our, you know, like uh, our bodies and our, our conscious and not conscious layers are the main territory, one of the main territories, you know, like this is what is it, you know, like, and then uh, the, the, what is on the top of that, it's process of quantification, it's process of like turning whatever we do, however we feel, turning that into data, you know, and that's surveillance. You know? and, and without that, you don't have uh, AI, you don't have, you know, like a Facebook feed, you don't have anything, you know, without our without data about us, about our bodies, about our movement, about our emotions or whatever. So this is like, you know, like, okay. Like. <laughs> That's fascinating, fascinating stuff. And great to see this uh, extractivism dot online. I hadn't, um, haven't read that one <laughs> just yet. Yeah, yeah. So, well, it's kind of, uh, yeah, yeah, it's kind of new and, and I, I was not like into, into promoting that because of no but it's great you get to see more of your work and i have some questions now for shen chao um so i have a question from jonathan santos uh shen, do you know if any of the chinese big tech companies are related or providing any kind of ai infrastructure in the chinese smart cities like Shenzhen, for instance or how i think i think what they're pointing out is sort of like how how those uh, AI infrastructures are are located um, and and built up in China, and uh, I also have another question here that came in the chat, which uh, was people that were very interested. And this is uh, different to different questions, very different questions, uh, and it's hearing more about your research on music streaming platforms in, in China, and I wonder uh, if you can talk a bit more about that, and also considering your background in punk and cultural studies. Uh, how do you relate the cultural studies and platform studies? And what are the commonalities and difference that you see between those, those fields and how are you bridging them uh, uh, to create this? So those are very different questions and I can ask them separately if you prefer. Uh, I, I, think that, I think so, they're all <laughs> different areas. <laughs> Uh, uh, yeah. Yeah. The moderator is very, you know, asking very different things, <laughs> but the people want to yeah. hear. <laughs> um, yeah, and um, uh, Shenzhen, I think at least uh, when, when you speak about uh, Shenzhen, uh, that means you know China very much, uh, because Shenzhen is uh, currently the, the um, could say, the digital, the smart city uh, model or because there are a lot of different tech uh, companies are, um, have uh, you know, gathered there. Uh, so uh, for your question, I have, uh, uh, Shenzhen has, has fully, uh, as the first national innovative city, Shenzhen has fully unleashed the, I, I, the called two zone effect. So it's uh, actively arranged the construction of new type infrastructure in areas such as artificial intelligence issued uh, serious implementation pl plans to promote development of new generation AI and integrated uh, circuit uh, industry. And uh, um, yeah, so um, yeah, basically uh, Shenzhen uh, collaborated with its tech uh, companies has 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 uh, done a lot of things on AI infrastructure. Um, I think uh, the more interesting part is how you know the the Chinese policy uh, plays a role in developing AI infrastructure in, in China. I think it's probably a little bit different to uh, outside China. 
So 2017, Shenzhen has a, uh, we, we called it the 13th, 5th uh, plan uh, is out. And so it's focused on AI, uh, uh, AI, uh, how to say, a uh, neutering AI industry. So as a, as a, uh, a start. So in 2019, uh, the new AI uh, development uh, activity plan. So uh, from 2019 to 20, uh, 23 out. So it has uh, uh, proposed until 2023rd, uh, uh, Shenzhen has to build at least 20, uh, 20 uh, uh, companies and uh, to construct 10 industry um, uh, in, in samples. And, uh, and so at 2019 uh, August, and uh, there is a new policy out from the central party and uh, it will promote uh, or support uh, Shenzhen as the pri pri prior pri prioritized uh, model for this AI and 5G and uh, this kind of, uh, you know, very uh, uh, innovative, uh, innovities. So I, I think it's a, Probably when we, I, I think the thing to understand the China's uh, AI infrastructure or platform is basically it's not only mm, about the market driven force, it's also about how the policies or how the government, uh, they, they have uh, uh, initiate a lot of policies is when they see there is opportun opportunity. So Shenzhen has become the, the, the first city that they see this opportunity. That's why um, uh, within like uh, two years, there are three uh, uh, policies out and uh, to support uh, Shenzhen's startup uh, uh, companies and the Shenzhen's established companies to uh, focus on this uh, AI structure development area. So, um, so I, I think, yeah, I think um, definitely there are, uh, the, the, I'm not sure about the, agenda uh, behind this question though. Uh, because from my sense, does that mean like China, uh, you know, Shenzhen has no, or China doesn't have uh, AI structure development uh, itself, or they have to use, you know, outside Chinese uh, services. That's why that, that my first instinct is about this uh, question's agenda or position <laughs> behind this. But yeah, <laughs> I, I guess the, the intention was just asking like, what are what are the the, the AI infrastructures? Where are they built? Are they built? Uh, where in China do they come from, for example, or or if they are made from outside of China and imported, uh, what does that mean? Uh, yeah, yeah, I think they're just <laughs> uh, yeah they 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 kind of are doing them all. Do, do them all inside China, and uh, mm. it's not about importation. It's just that they 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 have a lot of different uh, factories. They can do it, and then they have tech companies that they can uh, also, uh, you know, support themselves. So right. I, I think that's how China deal with this. Which goes moment. really really well with the whole argument that you know there are big platforms in, in China that are defining how those things are operating. Uh, as ah. you were saying, you know, from de westernizing platform studies uh, since, that makes complete sense, right? That yeah. you know, it's being built with Chinese technology and so on. Yeah, I know. It's a, yeah, it's a weird. <laughs> <laughs> and the other question was about, you know, your, your research on music streaming platforms in China and also punk and cultural studies. And how do you relate those things and, and what are some of the commonalities and differences uh, between those fields that, that you see? And there's a lot of interest in the chat or hearing more about Chinese punk subcultures. <laughs> it's interesting because I, I, I recently did another a talk um, about uh, Chinese uh, punk. Uh, it's called a stay on the ground and a question mark. Uh, 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 punk in China, Indonesia and uh, the big band. So uh, what I'm talking about is how punk uh, develop or punk network have developed from underground uh, or local network to global network, and nowadays platform uh, platform platformized network. And um, I think this 
probably can answer the question because it's also uh, the question I keep thinking. It's just like in the talk I said, uh, how platform uh, is a cult the term is culturally specific. So for uh, Western, probably it only means I'm not sure, but it only means like online platform. But in China, we uh, use it in more wider sense or broader sense. It's basically mm -hmm. called, called like invite people to come. Uh, so um, I always try to combine this uh, platform and make it wider. So combine the, the, the offline platform and online platform. So when I look at uh, punk, I think it might, might have uh, some opportunity there is uh, mm -hmm. you know how uh, Chinese punks nowadays they play uh, uh, previously they probably just play with the offline sense of rebellion uh, but nowadays they start to use uh, 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 different practices to play like platform platforms uh, there is an instance uh, uh, we have a, 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 a music platform called Wang Yi Yun, uh, Wang Yi Cloud. Uh, this platform. So some punk musicians, they when they put their music on this platform, they actually write something uh, in the in their lyrics about not singing it, but just uh, make it in, in embedded in into the, the 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 song. It's called like the uh, they, they said they said the 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 uh, Wang Yiyun, the software is stupid or something like this. Uh, it's kind of sarcasm. So I think that make me feel very interesting, uh, interested in this phenomenon. So they start to become more playful, and uh, and uh, in the uh, you know because of this kind of tactics, it makes this uh, punk strategy or punk spirit uh, more popularized or showing to more people. Um, because basically people can see it in the in the in the in the in nowadays in the platforms uh, rather than just uh, previously they just uh, you know still in the underground sense so um i think it's also the uh also i kind of start to reflect upon um, the academic route uh how we if if for instance because punk is my long term research area so if for instance, we stay in a, a long mm, developed a phenomenon, how we actually uh, coexist with it. I think uh, punk is a, is a you know, developing phenomenon uh, from uh, uh, before it's a Western research focused uh, uh, area to nowadays there are globalized uh, you know, uh, interest in punks to nowadays are under the new technology and uh, the internet development and then so now the punk has developed so i think as a, a scholar so i also have developed my many interests uh, uh, in it and even uh, you know sometimes i thought uh, i have done with punk research because uh, simply because china doesn't like punk research because too too much about rebellion uh, i still can find enthusiasm in it because it's a developing uh, topic or a phenomenon. It's not just like when you uh, have done your research and it just suddenly stopped. So I think that's, yeah, it's uh, just both ways. That's fantastic. And it's always great <laughs> to think about rebellion and the theme of AI, I think. And uh, we have a video question from Matthew Cole from Oxford University. Matthew, would you like to pose your question? Sure, thanks for both the papers. And um, yeah, thanks particular to Vlad and for that, the new, this new map that I get to explore because I really think this is an excellent way of uh, presenting research. I only wish my uh, graphic design skills were <laughs> up to stuff. Um, I just had a question because I've been thinking a lot about the plot, like, well, platforms and infrastructure. Obviously, I'm working on the Fair Work project, um, which deals with uh, platforms on a global scale. But um, I've I've also been particularly interested in this question of technological change, uh, and I've been working on um, a paper, uh, kind of examining that question in relation to some of Carolita Perez's work, which you might be familiar with, um, because she uses this con the idea of infrastructure and infrastructural change to theorize technological revolution. Um, and there, there's an, another paper that, I mean, lots of people talking about sort of 
platforms and infrastructure now more and more. Um, like Juliet Shore, I think, has a has a paper on that sort of gets into this question. But I was just wondering, um, maybe what you think, Vladan, uh, and feel free as well, uh, Jian, to to answer as well. Like, is where is the sort of tipping point that when a platform becomes an infrastructure? Because there. It is a sort of open question that I don't have resolved. And it, it sort of came up in some of the US media recently with uh, Joe Biden about, you know, what actually counts as, as infrastructure. And I think we have these sort of very physicalist notions about what that is, even though, you know, we live in the digital age. So I was wondering if you could uh, venture a sort of answer to that. Well, that's super, super interesting question. Uh, I'm not so sure that I have like an answer like on, on this to that. For me, like, uh, uh, you know, maybe maybe the, the moment of, of choice will be the, the border, not the choice, the, the possibility to go out of it. Uh, because like even what, what I described in this kind of new, in, in, in this new map, uh, a new extractivism is this moment in which you know we are falling into this kind of black hole of the platform you know in which we in which the the there is this kind of moment of point of no return when the gravity of the platform is stronger than our possibility to run out of it and we, we can, or we sometimes we can, but sometimes we, we are even not aware of this, the, the, the process is going on. And then I was thinking, okay, what are the forces that are keeping us, you know, like down? What are the force, forces that constitute the, the gravity of those platforms? And so there are many of them. They can be, it's not just an amount of users, but it's also like, you know, like fear of, of missing out. It's also different anxieties. It's also... You know, deep, because most of those, some of those platforms are, are built to to create this kind of, uh, you know, addictions and stuff like this, and and so that that moment in which like you are not even you are not it's not possible anymore to go out of it, then maybe it becomes an infrastructure, <laughs> because like then it's like uh, you know you we cannot. You know, like it's it, it's really, for example, it's really hard to function without like Google Maps nowadays, because it's like the the whole world it's now built not whole world but okay our <laughs> world is built built around the idea that we can move fast like that that we can move without maps physical maps so 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 efficiency of our life is basically like higher now and and we cannot. You know, it's really the, the price of, 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 of not participating in that is becoming too high. And in that sense, then this is like infrastructure in a sense of like, you know, like it's not our choice anymore. It's not fun. It's not it's the infrastructure that we need to have in order to participate in society. And in that sense, then we should, you know, demand that we have, I don't know, like the, the, the role of government will be bigger or whatever, you know, the idea is. Is behind that, that, that. Maybe it's that. Maybe not. <laughs> I don't know. Jin, would you like to add anything on that? The question is, what counts as AI structure, right? It was sort of like, where's the threshold that when when a platform passes over into infrastructure? I guess because I was also thinking like sometimes platforms just rapidly disappear as well mm -hmm. so um yeah i think the latin sense is very good but then yeah, i was also thinking great. about some because sometimes technological obsolescence it can seem necessary then all of a sudden mm -hmm. it's gone yeah so that was another side of the question that i didn't really think about until now mm. <laughs> yeah <laughs> okay i think i yeah, no, no comment at the moment. All right. <laughs> Sorry, it's we not have... an easy one. <laughs> I think it's really important, you know, like your, 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 uh, what you, 
game now as an example, it's, you know, like another side of this, like infrastructure in a sense of like something that we need to keep. And for example, I don't know, Internet Archive became somehow like an infrastructure that, you know, no one, it's like, no one asks. And, 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 but they are doing like a great, great, like uh, service to humanity. And they became like an infrastructure, you know, keeping the, the, you know, traces of, of digital alive. Yeah. And one, one side of the infrastructure debate is that it, it's not visible anymore. It's not even recognized, but we rely on it so much, right? I left two articles on the chat that talk about it in this way in relation to platforms. Um, to whoever is interested in more in this discussion. But we have more questions on the Q&A. And one of them uh, is really interesting. And Leonardo de Mello asks, connecting with the previous panel, many AI imagery accounts for an infrastructure that connects state corporations. And then uh, he gives a few examples. And that creates an embodiment of technology that increases the exploitation of the ordinary citizens. To paraphrase Mark Fisher, it is easier to imagine the end of the word than the end of capitalism. Is it possible to imagine an AI, an AI structure that does not start from an exploitation system of both people and the planet? And I think uh, just to point a bit of how this question connects uh, both of you, I think Vlad, and, I mean, you're visualizing those systems and pointing to how they operate. And Jim, you're also talking about de-Westernizing and trying to go beyond somehow how those platforms are being studied and, and, and operated. And then I wanna put that together with another question that I, had, I, I haven't asked but was here for some time, uh, which was uh, for you, Vlad, and to talk a bit more about, about the, the Amazon Echo. So it's from Ricardo Uri, uh, the infrastructure of the AI system behind a commercial Amazon Echo product is very interesting. Would it be possible to clarify the AI infrastructure on digital platforms and digital newspapers? So I think this goes more into talking about other kinds of, of, of infrastructures. And uh, whoever of you would like to go first or, or to talk now. <laughs> so one of the questions was, let, let okay. me re recap. <laughs> Moving fast. Okay. Sorry, my bad, my bad. Uh, so one of the questions was from Leonardo, is it possible to imagine an AI structure that does know, not start from an exploitation? And the other one was about other kinds of AI infrastructures such as digital newspapers and so on. And in the, in the other possibilities besides an AI exploitation, I'm also wanted to ask other platforms beyond the platforms which we are used to right now. That's what I would add. Okay, so like the, 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 the complex question first. Uh, um, so is, is it possible to create fair AI? Uh, you know, in, in order to create fair AI, we need to create fair earth. You know, and because like, okay, if, if AI is going to be produced and backed up by the planetary scale factory, then we need to create fair earth. And we are like kind of really far away because like, you know, inequality is kind of inbuilded in every brick of, of, of this world, you know, like this idea of, even like in university, it's completely, we were like applying for some Erasmus project here in Europe and it's kind of like if you are on a university in Serbia, it's like, I don't know, 200 something per day. And if you are in a university in Germany, it's like 500, something. Never mind. Okay. So inequality is there. It's everywhere. So without uh, equality, it, it will, you know, it's going to be hard to create planetary scale factory that, that is functioning well. And there is like so many things, but I think there is something else strictly related with AI that it, that kind of became like the, the clear to me after working with Matteo Pasquinelli and, and Nosco is that within the core of, of, you know, like this kind of like a heart of the AI process within the, the, the model of, of, of machine learning model, there is something that we, that it's, it's kind of not fair deeply. You know, so it, because the whole process of machine learning, it's kind of compression, you know, and then during this kind of information compression, what you're losing, you're losing those kind of fine prints that are falling apart. So what you are getting from AI, it's a basically n-dimensional uh, 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 statistical 
compression, you know. And that means that all of those nice things on the side are falling apart. So all of those qualities that we think as an anomalies are basically all of those anomalies are qualities. So we, we can call those qualities art. We can call those qualities minorities. We can call those qualities, all of those, you know, nice things that we are fighting for. And this is what is falling with, with, with compression, you know. And then also like deeply, deeply in this like uh, uh, process of machine learning, you have the, this kind of uh, uh, statistical process of, of like, you know, like uh, uh, um, this kind of uh, dimensionality reduction or, or process of like all of those processes that are basically creating and damaging those fine, fine, uh, uh, things that are the, that we maybe love and and for me this is like the the core question is like is statistics ethical you know like is is, is that ethical you know like is, is is the process of statistic what we want to have in in society you know is, is that something that we really want to to rule our societies on because like then it will you know like so that that's for me this is the core uh, a question like that's a, let's say philosoph philosophical question of fairness it's also deep within the process of machine learning and then all of those other things around you know like there is a layers of layers of unfairness and layers of layers of untransparency and i i believe that that you know like for me it's hard to imagine maybe because we are so deep in this kind of like uh, um, capital capitalism or whatever for me it's hard to imagine like how that will change like in in the in the, in the like um, in next i don't know how many how many years and and but but in a sense like you know like seeing those you know believing that the change is possible it's also like really really important and we should maybe try to work on our minds in order to to open our minds to be you know ready to accept this idea that that you know the world without capitalism it's possible you know so so i'm really looking forward to that and then uh, the second question the question about like uh, platforms uh, other you know use of ai yeah of course it's possible it's possible or not possible to investigate them uh, uh, you know, like uh, Amazon Echo, in one sense, it was good for us because it was kind of like the, the most popular, let's say, like uh, IoT and AI product of, of that time when we were doing research. But in a sense, like the, the question is like, you know, for, for, for many, you know, different devices, the, the map, maybe probably the map will look the same you know, like the size of the map. So the process of extraction, the process of, of you know, like all of this will probably look the same, only maybe the, the middle of the map, like how, you know, like the process looks like will maybe change. So in the sense of, of like the uh, anatomy of an AI map, it's kind of similar to, you know, like the map of production of, of, of this, you know, T-shirt or whatever, you know, <laughs> like, so it's kind of same, the, the logic of planetary, factory it's the same you know but what is changing is this like a middle of the map but then you know like the the for me it's more interesting like what are our limits of, of like uh, let's say this kind of like independent researchers to research for example facebook google and others this is the main question like how what are our tools and for example for a long time we, we are we were like thinking okay when we have GDPR in Europe, we will be able to ask and to demand how, you know, like to see like how those algorithms look like and stuff like, but not a lot of things happen after the GDPR, no? We are not seeing some kind of like big wave of, of like transparency, platform transparency going on. Because I think, you know, in a way, some kind of like this kind of like idea of, of uh, um, algorithmic transparency, it's kind of, you know, maybe utopian idea because like in order to, for example, I, I, I even don't know how we, will, we can do that, you know, like how we can 
you know, even if we have access to all of them, we will, you know, we will need like years and years to, to investigate how each of those algorithms and, and, and are, you know, affecting our lives or our society or, or our relations, you know. And the, so the, the, the thing is like, but also on the other side, you know, a lot of great, uh, 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 um, you know, scientists are being automatically employed by Facebook and Google and others. So there is not a lot of, <laughs> let's say, the human uh, uh, capacity on the other side as well, you know. And then, then the thing is like, you know, like the, we cannot compete with this, uh, 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 this like run fast and break things you know because those algorithms are changing on like every minute you know and for us to understand what is like impact on society of each of them will will ask years and years and years so so yeah it's possible to to have like another and it's i think we should try to make those research on other like all other platforms that exist but in a way we will be always behind. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Jin Xiao, would you like to respond to that question as well? Do you have any thoughts? I think what Walden said, uh, we will always be behind. That's quite true because um, like uh, last year, write a paper, I write a paper about the music and uh, streaming industry and entrepreneur. Uh, and then now we find uh, this year is already uh, dated and then uh, no journals want to publicize it. Uh, so I think it's just like, not just like the world can't catch up. I think the academic world can't catch up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so this platform studies, wow, really <laughs> make me anxious <laughs> talking about anxiety. <laughs> yeah. That, that's totally true. Uh, on that note, uh, we have a video comment or question from Ranjit Singh. Would you like to make your comment on video? Your last brief comment. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Gabriel. I was, um, as I was listening to this conversation, one of the things that struck me was uh, thinking about infrastructures uh, as a way of uh, uh, organizing the world. So, you know, part of the way in which we think about infrastructures is often rooted in the idea that they are a thing in the world. They are the invisible background. They, we kind of think, uh, grammatically, we think of them as nouns. Um, one of the things that I would invite the panel to do would be to consider them as a verb. So it's a process, it's a way of infrastructuring data into the lives of people rather than actually, um, mm. you know, thing that is already there. So all of these questions around algorithmic transparency or, uh, you know, these broader questions about what, how do, what do we do in order to regulate these systems, it kind of works on the assumption that these systems are kind of there and, you know, we are struggling with trying to make sense of what they are. And I would uh, rather argue that these systems are still very much in the making, especially in, uh, you know, uh, global South countries where, you know, we are still trying to basically wrap our brains around what does it mean to digitize services in the first place. So uh, part of the challenge here is to think about uh, how do we intervene into this process by looking at it, not as something that is out there to be regulated, but as a process that is, all, that is currently in the making and requires active engagement on our part to be able to actually rationalize what eventually these systems turn out to be in the future. So uh, in my work, I tend to think of this in terms of, you know, how do I turn this into thinking about a process rather than a thing? And I wonder if uh, the panelists would like to comment on, you know, just thinking about it more in terms of uh, something that is, uh, you know, ongoing and it's happening and becoming rather than, you know, an infrastructure that is out there already. Anyway. Thank you for the question. Panelists, any, any thoughts? <laughs> you first. <laughs> well, 
Okay, I uh, uh, for me, I I really I really understand you know your your point of view. Uh, me as a as an individual human being, that kind of hard for me to. Maybe maybe the problem it's like the the you know I'm I'm coming from Serbia and we are kind of like general in general like really negative tor- towards things you know like everything it's like bad and like uh, so maybe that's one of the reasons why for me it's hard to have this kind of like uh, an- another problem that I'm seeing with thinking about infrastructure as some kind of virgin landscape is that from my point of view we already have you know like the the top 10 companies or five companies in the the world are already like they did it you know like the amazon for example the the richest man in the world you know like they they are already there you know they are already there they're already already digging not just now but they start to dig like 10 years ago so and we are already on their turf you know, like probably even this call, you know, there is a really big chance that, that it's going through either like, you know, Amazon infrastructure or whatever. So, so they are there. And, 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 and I think we are more in the situation of like, uh, you know, this kind of like, uh, there is this story about this American rubber barons and this kind of situation that like when, when they were like building like the the railway infrastructure and and this kind of you know race to 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 conquer the land and especially to to conquer the land with the oil reserves in in Texas and stuff like this. So I think this kind of first wave of of like uh, of uh, uh, let's say. Uh, first wave of, of like taking those territories already happened and and maybe what we should do is to try to invent a new resources in the same way they did they jumped on the on the digital as a new resource on our you know quantify body as a new resource so maybe we should try to think of, of like, well, like what's the new resource then that they already didn't uh, uh, conquer and then uh, and then it this question always I have like, had like really wonderful like a uh, uh, professor of philosophy and she here and, and, and she was like saying like okay what what if the the rule of the game it's not to make money but to have a best garden you know and everything will change you know like because then we will compete to have a best garden in order to, to make a best garden you know, you need to do a lot of things that doesn't relate with money. You know? And then in that sense, maybe if we are able to imagine a new new rules, new, uh, new game or new resources, then we are, I think the, the ones that already exist in, in this infrastructure, it's already there. Fantastic. Jean? Any last comments, thoughts? I, I thought it, as time gradually, you know, develops, you call my name more wrong. <laughs> <laughs> it's, <Jane>. it's okay. <laughs> Jean. Anyway. Jean, yeah. Jean, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what you said actually uh, made me think about uh, what is in structure. Like I have, you know, think uh, the meaning when I first started my talk. But now, um, I think it's more, yeah, the history and logics that uh, in my title probably can be very related to the structure. Um, because at least when I do this paper and uh, what the reviewers really want to say uh, see is, is there any, you know, uh, very, a very fundamental thing there, or a fundamental thing that related in structure that can explain the differences between the China uh, platform and the US platforms. So that's why there are a lot, we, we, we're trying to uh, divide uh, four dimensions, 
and talk about the history, culture, and uh, this, this kind of already uh, understood uh, or already existed uh, frameworks that, that uh, the, 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 the ex existing things that can lead to an understanding of what happening nowadays in the platform uh, development. So I, I think uh, a structure, I think it is a, for me, it might be a term to understand uh, um, or a perspective. So when we want to understand what's going on now, uh, when we talk about infrastructure, at least in my paper, it is what has already existed. And uh, in that sense, uh, that infrastructure is probably a, a, a noun rather than a verb. But um, when we want to look at, um, you know, when we talk probably based on um, now, the, the, the present times, when we talk about infrastructure, then probably we're talking about something, you know, in the future or something uh, in a process. That's how I understand this uh, infrastructure, the dynamics or noun or verb thing. <laughs> thank you. Fantastic. All right, thank you so much, both of you for, for your presentations, for responses and everybody for the questions. Um, we are now a bit over time, so I think I'll have to end our conversation here. Thanking you two very much. And um, I will, I, if you have any last words that you want to say, uh, you can say them now. <laughs> That's so shocking. <laughs> Take, care. Take care, and uh, COVID is really shitty disease. <laughs> yeah. Stay safe, everybody. Awesome. And mask. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And so we'll be back at 2 p.m. Uh, Brazilian time, so in about 20 minutes, uh, for the AI colonialism panel with Syed Mustafa Ali, Paola Ricarte, Rachel Adams, and Chris Kaya Hidalgo. And thank you very much, all the Unicinos team and the University of Cambridge for organizing, and especially to Rafael for, for making this all happen. Thank you, everybody. See you soon. Bye.
Hello, Mustafa. Hello, Paola. Good afternoon. Hello. Good evening. Good night. Whichever time zone you're in. Yeah. <laughs> Here, good afternoon. Rachel, hello. Thank you hi. for having me. Oh, you're welcome. Hello and hi, everyone. Hi. Good afternoon. Hello, Paola. We will be waiting for Kruskaya, our moderator. Is Michael uh, quite not participating? Yeah, uh, uh, Michael unfortunately uh, had um, uh, personal problems uh, with health and oh, wow. and uh, this is a very difficult situation. And, and the panel will be with uh, Paula, Rachel, uh, Mustafa, and Kruskaya as a moderator. We will start very, very soon. We, we, we had almost 900 of uh, registered person. <laughs> Hola, Cruzcaya. Hi, everyone. I'm here. Like, just two seconds, please. I have problems with the internet. Great. Uh, Raphael, I am right in thinking that all the sessions are being recorded. Is that correct? Yeah, and it will be on on YouTube. Do you have any problems on it? Or, or it's no, okay? no. I, I, I'm obviously I'd wanted to attend the sessions, but up until about maybe two hours earlier, I hadn't even finished <laughs> writing my presentation, <laughs> so I had to miss out, unfortunately. But really looking forward to catching up with our, you know, all the recordings. Great, and, and live transcription can help us if we can uh, turn this to writing or, or, something, or something like that. And uh, we, we are very happy with your uh, uh, presence here. And I have another, uh, oh, uh, if some panelists like Mariana Valente, like uh, Ranjit, like Sarita Arut, can ask some uh, question uh, in by video uh, later uh, the first presentation and all of you Mustafa Paola and in other panels uh, the floor is absolutely yours. We are always waiting. always a dangerous thing to say. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. 
Just kind of let us know when when it's ready, okay? Hi everyone, I'm so sorry. I have just a small a small issue with the internet. Hi everyone. Okay, let's Hi. go. So, uh, uh, hello again. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening <laughs> for you in many parts of uh, the world. Uh, we are on um, histories of AI, imaginaries, and materialities uh, from hosted by Digilabor Research Lab and histories of artificial intelligence project uh, from University of Cambridge. Syed Mustafa Ali is uh, a co-organizer of the this project. And now uh, AI and colonialism uh, a panel. How does AI relate to colonialism? How does AI colonialism relate to issues of race, for example? How to understand concepts like data colonialism and digital colonialism? Are there differences in understanding these concepts dependent on local contexts? How to decolonize AI? It's very broad uh, questions and to moderate this session. Uh, hello, Nikki. Uh, uh, thank you for having, for having us. Uh, and to moderate this, this session, Cruzcaya Hidalgo Cordero, researcher and feminist activist, member of Tierra Comun Research Network. She is one of the, of the founders of the Observatory, uh, Observatorio de Plataformas, Platforms Observatory, a collective that brings together artists, researchers, activists, and workers of digital platforms who question working conditions and violations of life within platform economy. Uh, Kruskaya explored the impact of platform economies on the bodies and lives of women, especially uh, uh, migrant and racialized women. She used the colonial method methodologies for the constructions of life stories and collective knowledge. Furthermore, as a polit political practice, she used sensitive, poetic, and embodied languages in her research work to challenge the coloniality of power knowing being. Cruzcaya Hidalgo, thank you for having us in more, uh, one more uh, event with us. Thank you very much to everyone for the invitation, especially Rafael. And I'm, I'm very glad to be part of this panel today as a moderator. So in that sense, um, uh, I want to introduce our panelists. First is Mustafa Ali. He's lecturer in computing and convenient critical information studies at the Open University, co-organizer of Histories of Artificial Intelligence project for University of Cambridge, author of articles toward the colonial computing and algorithm racism at the Colonial Critic. Second, we have uh, uh, Paula Ricauter, associate professor in the Department of Media and Digital Culture at the Tecnológico de Monterrey, Mexico City, and digital rights activist. She is his, his faculty associate and previous fellow at the Burke and Klein Center for Internet and Society at Harvard University. Her work focuses on critical studies of digital technologies. Her publications include Data Epistemologies, The Coloniality of Power and Resistance, founder of Tierra Común Research and Network. And we have also Rachel Adams, senior researcher, specialist at Human Science Research Council, South Africa. She undertook her postdoctoral training at the Information Law and Policy Center, Institute for Advanced Legal Studies, University of London. She previously held the position of senior research civil and political rights at South African Human Rights Commission. Her work sizing the intersection of law, ethics, gender, and technology. Author of the article, Can Artificial Intelligence Be Decolonized? So welcome everyone again and welcome our panelists. We are glad to have this conversation today. In that sense, as Rafael was saying, today in this panel, we were talking about colonialism and also the colonial perspectives in artificial intelligence, but also in data in general. So with that, I, I will say that all the panelists will have 15 minutes to their interventions. And after that, we're gonna have a space for more questions. And so everyone is welcome to pose the questions in the chat. Welcome again to this panel. And we will start with Mustafa. Mustafa, the, the space is yours. 
Thank you so much. Um, I, I've prepared a written paper, so I'm just going to jump straight in because I know time is short. In the introduction to the edited collection, Your Computer is on Fire, which was published earlier this year, Thomas S. Mullaney clarifies three senses of how fire is being used in the context of computing. First, literally, in that computers are physical machines propelled by fire, both material and metabolic, thereby pointing to the socio-materiality of computation, its resource and extractive underpinnings, and the mounting environmental costs. Second, symbolically, in that a state of emergency associated with the reproduction of inequalities of gender, race, class, religion, and body type in computing systems is being signaled by the increasing datification and algorithmization of the infrastructure supporting social, political, and economic life. And third, in relation to propagation, where the author asks, where are the frontiers of computing and new media, whether in terms of emerging and future forms of hegemony, or by contrast, novel forms of subversion and liberatory possibility. While reading this essay and pondering on the three senses of fire associated with computers, a couple of lines in the chorus to musician Billy Joel's hit record from 1989, We Didn't Start the Fire, kept coming to mind, viz. We didn't start the fire, it was always burning since the world's been turning. What has any of this to do with AI and colonialism? Quite simply, everything. This is because computers and the fire associated with them are worldly phenomena. And the world is a creation of historical colonialism, one that persists in the contemporary post-colonial era. Yet insofar as the world is undergoing datification and algorithmization at accelerating rates and scales affected by machine learning, and convergent developments such as the Internet of Things, the world itself appears to be undergoing colonization by a technology that it engendered, viz. AI. In short, AI is a colonizing development within colonialism, which leads me to suggest thinking not about AI and colonialism, but rather about AI as colonialism. In what follows, I shall explore what is perhaps a somewhat different take on colonialism and its facilitating logic, that is coloniality, with a view to thinking about AI as colonial and how to engage with it along decolonial lines. To motivate my argument, I need to briefly set out and critically engage with the meaning of a few terms, viz. colonization, colonialism, the world, coloniality, and race. Put simply, Colonization refers to an ongoing process of control by which a central system of power dominates surrounding lands and their resources, that is peoples, animals, etc., through a process of settlement, that is the establishment of a colony. Colonialism, by contrast, refers to the establishment, exploitation, maintenance, acquisition, and expansion of a colony in one territory by a political power from another territory. Crucially, it involves a set of unequal relationships between the colonial power and the colony and between the colonists or colonizers and the indigenous population or colonized. By the world, I mean the world system which emerged in the long durée of the 16th century following the so-called Colombian voyages of discovery to the new world commencing in 1492 of the common era a global hierarchical system whose dominant core lies in the West and whose subaltern periphery is constituted by the rest. According to seminal world systems theorist, Emmanuel Wallerstein, the history of the modern world system has been in large part a history of the expansion of European states and peoples into the rest of the world and resulted in the emergence of a capitalist world economy. However, I suggest that this framing is at best incomplete and at worst a mischaracterization insofar as it obscures what decolonial scholar Walter Mignolo refers to as the dark underside of modernity, viz. the fact that it was forged through violence as an imperial colonial undertaking with religious come racial foundations and that the structuring logics, ontological, epistemological, cultural, political, economic, etc., of this project 
what is referred to as coloniality, persist in the post-colonial era, notwithstanding the formal end of colonialism with the national independence movement, independence movements of the 1960s. Yet while centering 1492 and race in relation to the formation of the modern colonial world system, where race should be understood as involving processes of exclusion, taxonomization, and naturalization, I suggest the need to make some corrections to the decolonial reading of the world's creation. Scholars such as Nelson Maldonado Torres, building on the work of Sylvia Winter and others, rightly draw attention to the decisive role played by religion in the lead up to what I refer to as the big bang of race. Yet in conceptualizing the racial world system emerging in the long durée of the 16th century in terms of a rupture of the theological racial episteme inherited from the medieval era and its replacement by an anthropological racial episteme, they assume the legitimacy of the secularization thesis, viz the inevitability of the transition from religion to reason and latterly science, a move which has been called into question on empirical, ethical, and theoretical grounds by various scholars, including the anthropologist Talal Assad. According to Jared Hickman, the secular is a local phenomenon particular to Euro-Christian history that reinforces the Eurocentrism encoded in its very provenance when deployed globally. For this reason, and with a view to correcting the secularist tendency within decolonial theory, obscuring the theological nature of race as a persistent phenomenon, rather than as a mere phase within the history of racialization as suggested by Winter and others, I suggest the need to adopt a position on, along the lines of Hickman's globalized post-secular conception of race as political theology. Crucially, this move arguably has some precedent within decolonial scholarship itself. Consider in this connection, Lewis Gordon's argument for thinking about race as a creation of the Theodician grammar of the, wor of the world. David Theo Goldberg's conception of race as the work of anthropic gods. And Sherman Jackson's reference to second creators, all of which point to whiteness as attempting to occupy what might be described as the God spot. Following Hickman, I maintain that shifting from a secular to a post-secular frame is imperative since it enables us to refocus our decolonial lens and the attendant set of categories we use to interrogate the modern colonial world, thereby allowing us to better appreciate continuity through change and the hauntological presence of the past. In terms of the contribution of antecedent historical phenomena that informed the colonial enterprise and whose structuring logics were embedded in the constitution of the modern colonial world system, building on the work of Slovenian historian Tomas Masnak and others, I maintain that the anti-Islamicate foundation of the Crusades commencing in 1095 of the Common Era stands out as of perhaps decisive significance vis-a-vis -vis its role in Christian polity formation. That is the emergence of Christendom, come Europe, come the West. While decolonial scholars rightly point to the colonial moment of the long durée of the 16th century, inaugurated by the fall of Granada in 1492 and the commencement of the Eurocentrically framed voyages of discovery as initiating indigenous genocide, systematizing anti-black racism and bringing the modern colonial world into being along structurally hierarchical lines. The phenomenon of structural systemic anti-Islamism dates back much earlier, arguably to the launch of the Crusades. As Hamdani states, the year 1492 is an important milestone Yet its birth in a medieval crusading milieu is most often underrated, if not totally forgotten. I suggest that while decolonial scholars such as Maldonado Torres have not forgotten the crusading milieu, they have underrated its importance vis-a-vis -vis thinking about modernity coloniality. And that this underrating is due to a mistaken conception of the paradigmatic relationship between Christendom and what we might call Islamdom, that is the spatial political abode of the Islamicate. 
Crucially for our purposes, there is a need to think about the significance of the Crusades and the Muslim threat, real and or imagined, in relation to their entanglement with events involved in shaping the contours of the religio-racial logic emerging within the context of the so-called New World Voyages. In this connection, consider how anti-Islamism functions in and as a background discursive horizon informing the very terms of debates that were arguably of decisive significance in the emergent construction of race, such as that which took place at Valladolid during 1550 to 1551 of the Common Era between Bartolome de las Casas and Juan Guinez de Sepulveda. According to Tomás Masnak, for both Sepulveda and Las Casas, and I quote, the Turk functioned as an organizing principle in the eternal economy of their reasoning, structuring their responses to the problem of the humanity of the New World Indians. European identity having been forged in antagonistic opposition to what was known as the Imago Turkey. In this connection, it is not insignificant that the fall of Constantinople to the Ottomans in 1453 of the Common Era revived crusading activities in Europe. According to Masnak, once again, the significance of the Crusades cannot be overemphasized. On his view, and I quote at length, as an ideal and as a movement, the Crusades had a deep, crucial influence on the formation of Western civilization, shaping culture, ideas, and institutions. The Crusades set a model for expansionist campaigns against non-Europeans and non-Christians in all parts of the world. The ideas, iconography, and discourse associated with the Crusades made a profound imprint on all Christian thinking about sacred violence and exercised influence long after the end of actual crusading. They continue to play a prominent role in European politics and political imagination. In fact, the crusading spirit has survived through modernity well into our own postmodern age. In short, the crusades provided a template for later imperial colonial ventures, including those taking place within the contemporary technocentric modern colonial world order. In summary, and with recourse to a fiery metaphor, we might say that if colonialism was the gunpowder keg that exploded to create the modern world system, then the Crusades was the burning trail of gunpowder leading up to it. Let me turn now to AI. Earlier, I suggested thinking about AI as a colonial phenomenon. Insofar as AI, at least in its contemporary incarnation, as machine come deep learning, leverages for facilitating ubiquitous and pervasive computing infrastructure in generating the expansive data sets that power it. And ubiquitous computing is, according to HCI practitioners, Paul Dorish and Scott Mainwaring, driven by, and I quote, a colonial impulse, it follows that AI is itself colonial. Arguing along somewhat different, yet I would suggest complementary lines, in artificial whiteness, Yard and Katz makes the case for thinking about AI as one, a political economic tool for advancing imperial colonial interests, and two, as an ideology that mimics the fluid nebulous structure of race, more specifically whiteness. However, I want to suggest that we think about AI as an iteration within what I have elsewhere referred to as the algorithm of race, rather whiteness itself. In short, whiteness as AI. Given what appears to be yet another historical manifestation of the phenomenon of white crisis in the contemporary era, engendered by mounting non-white contestation of white world hegemony, I suggest thinking of the colonial phenomenon of AI as a response by whiteness to such contestation and for the purpose of maintaining, expanding and refining white's, white hegemony. This brings me to a couple of other lines in the chorus to Billy Joel's, we didn't start the fire, viz. No, we didn't light it, but we tried to fight it. 
Here, I want to point to the ongoing decolonial struggle to end the world and what this might mean in connection with a post-colonial world that I suggest is undergoing a colonizing technocentric transformation for the very purpose of maintaining white hegemony. Yet framing this decolonial struggle in terms of a colonialism understood to be grounded in crusader logics. In thinking about this, I will now switch registers from historical events and their sedimented affordances to speculative science fiction, engaging the backstory to Frank Herbert's Dune saga, viz. the Butlerian Jihad, which I suggest provides an interesting exploration of a possible future confrontation with AI. Briefly, the Butlerian Jihad, also known as the Great Revolt, refers to a conflict taking place over 11,000 years in the future that results in the complete destruction of virtually all types of computers, thinking machines, and conscious robots. Crucially, in God Emperor of Dune, Herbert indicates that the Jihad was a se semi-religious uprising initiated by humans who felt repulsed by the extent to which they had become dependent upon and controlled by machines. Fleshing out this idea, the Legends of Dune prequel trilogy co-authored by Brian Herbert and Kevin J. Anderson, presents the Jihad as a war between humans and their sentient machine creations, the latter of whom rise up and nearly destroy humanity. Yet what relevance does a science fiction scenario bearing such fantastic and apocalyptic transhumanist and singularitarian undertones have for thinking about the arguably more mundane reality of expansionist digital and data colonialisms and their entanglements with foreseeable developments within AI. In this connection, I, refer, I simply refer us back to Frank Herbert's concern about human dependency upon and control by machines and briefly draw attention to STS scholar Paul Edwards' recent discussion of what he describes as the Borgian assimilation of the human life world affected by algorithmic infrastructuration. Resistance to such algorithmization might appear to be futile, but it must be attempted regardless. How should the colonizing tendency of the algorithmic be resisted? Now in the cost of connection, how data is colonizing human life, and appropriating it for capitalism. I think somebody's mic might be on. Got a little child squeaking in the background. Let me, let me just start that sentence again. In the cost of connection, how data is colonizing human life and appropriating it for capitalism, Nick Caldry, who I'm delighted to see is on this call, and Ulysses Mejias argue that, and I quote, one day a fatwa against a social media company may come along and people will take it as a battle cry maybe whole communities will start to feel that particular platforms are no longer for them. Given the reference to fire with which I began this essay, an expanding socio-material and computational fire engendering crisis, I suggest that the battle cry, arguably a call to jihad or struggle, is less likely to be focused on particular platforms and directed at social media and far more likely to involve counter-violent abolition, that is socio-technical rollback, and what I have referred to elsewhere as a presentist, fugitive, decolonial, Luddite confrontation with the surveillant and carceral, life-world colonizing, theopolitical, economic, and socio-material infrastructure of AI itself in the near future. Apocalyptic science fiction, or cometh a Butlerian jihad? Time in the fire will tell. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mustafa, for all these insights and debates. I think that all of us want to keep the conversation going. So I give the space to Paula. Paula is yours. Thank you very much and good afternoon. Um, uh, I just want to say that um, I'm the co-founder with Nick and Ulysses of the network Tierra Común, and I'm super glad to be here and have the time and an opportunity to discuss um, what does it mean uh, 
to speak about decoloniality and, and AI. Um, first, um, I just want to begin saying that there are many um, approaches when we speak about the decolonial framework. And it's important to understand the differences um, between the people who is uh, using this framework to um, explain the um, social technical processes that are ongoing in our contemporary societies. So um, I'm gonna um, just begin framing a little bit about what does it mean um, from, from people who are working within the colonial studies, but also within feminist decolonial studies, which is uh, a little bit different. Um, and then um, I will talk a little bit about uh, the connection be between data and algorithms and AI as, as technologies and the ways I see um, that the process of decoloniality is happening around um, Latin America and, and other parts of the world. So I will be like very brief. I won't take maybe all, all the time, but um, I just wanted to, to begin saying that. Um, decolonial studies comprise a heterogeneous system of thought that characterize the condition of epistemic domination of the rational uh, modern Western thought that marks the beginning of modernity and the capitalist system. The origin of the de colonial thought and praxis in the territory known today as Latin America and the Caribbean, but that many today call Abia Yala, begins at the moment of the European invasion. Since then, it has had multiple manifestations. The genealogy of this praxis can be traced back to Waman Poma Yala's criticism of the bad colonial government or the struggle of the Maroon woman, uh, Fanon's interpretation of the psychoaffective dimension of coloniality and the dehumanization of the subject, MSSR and his denunciation of the colonial regime based on violence. And in more recent times in Latin America, critical philosophy and sociology, critical pedagogies, um, the Zapatista movement and their proposal for an alternative government in opposition to the Mexican colonial state. And that's to say that decolonial critique, regardless of its nomenclature is inscribed as a praxis of persistence of contemporary um, and previous historical indigenous and Afro-descendant movements in the territory of, of Abia Yala. Of course, this history of resistance is connected with the community's experiences in other geographical contexts that have lived and are still living the colonial experience. So I just maybe just want to share these two quotes um, from the feminist Maria Galindo. Um, and this is what I was uh, trying to say at the beginning, uh, when, when we try to uh, speak about decolonization, but from a gender perspective. Uh, for Maria Galindo, you cannot decolonize without depatriarchalize, and you cannot depatriarchalize without decolonizing. Um, and the second uh, quote from uh, the philosopher and, and thinker Achille Milembe uh, in his, in his uh, work about necropolitics, uh, the ultimate expression of sovereignty lies to a large extent in the power and ability to dictate who may live and who might die. So for me, these two, um, Quotes are important because um, here, when we when we speak about decolonization, um, at least from a feminist perspective or a decolonial feminist perspective, you are speaking about uh, the place of gender in the process of of colonization and in the process of of coloniality, and also um, up to date of the 
power to decide who, who gets to live and who, who will let to die. So um, already Mustafa explained perfectly all the frameworks, so I won't repeat anything of that. Um, I just want to um, emphasize that um, Coloniality and decoloniality refer to lo the logic and the ontology and epistemology of the matrix of power created by the massive processes of colonization and decolonization. Um, thus, the idea of Western modernity, the world that we are living in right now, and Western institutions are a result of coloniality. Um, and the linking from this process implies uh, rejecting the ways in which the coloniality of power is still being enforced by these uh, systems of oppression. So we don't want to see um, the colonial process separated from the process of modernity. And also we don't want to separate that from the process of um, and, and also the process of, of um, using the gender difference as uh, one uh, source of accumulating capital. So um, coloniality um, can be a useful category to understand the power relations maintained after the colony. But if we want to be um, consistent with um, with this proposal, we have to connect that um, these uh, ramifications of coloniality are embodied in the experiences of the communities in struggle for the defense of the territory um, in the many um, places uh, in Latin America and all the territories um, that were previously colonized. And that this process has uh, a cost that is paid by uh, specific bodies that are racially and, and gender uh, ontologic, ontologically different. So race and gender are the organizing principles of the logic of capital accumulation. Um, for this reason, we have to take at least both. Of course, there are many other ontological differences that uh, have to be taken into account. But these two uh, differences were the main differences that help build modernity and also capitalism. So um, in this difference, we have the political, the political economy and the division of labor of the capitalist, Western, modern, and patriarchal system. Um, there are many consequences of this um, logic that is um, operating as the organizing logic of the current world. And we can easily, with the current pandemics, we can easily see um, how these differences are still at work. Uh, for example, while rich countries have purchased enough coronavirus vaccine doses to inoculate their populations three times over the next year, 90% of people in poor countries won't be able to get the vaccine in uh, the current year. Or for example, if we see uh, the, um, the result of the current climate um, crisis or the environmental crisis, the richest 10% of, um, uh, of the countries are responsible for the carbon emissions of the rest of the world combined. So of course we are all responsible for what's happening in the current world, but um, from the decolonial and feminist perspective, there are some actors, some groups, some nations, some group of people that are more responsible than others and there are designing the future of humanity to um, um, maintain this 
current of the world distribution. So um, when we speak about data, uh, when we speak about AI and, and coloniality, um, the question is how can we understand this data-centric, uh, algorithmically mediated uh, world and the development of AI technologies as amplification of the coloniality of power? Or um, how can we think of the coloniality of power materializing through these social te technical systems as the ontological, epistemic, and material dominance of the Western modern way, way of being, thinking, doing, feeling, and living? And, and here, um, I think it's, it's important to say that we, have, we are trying to, um, to highlight the historical processes uh, that, that led to this current crisis, but also their relations and also um, the dynamics that have been uh, like put into uh, work to make this happen. And at least what the decolonial frameworks it, um, tries to emphasize is that there is not only a material um, a material impact. There is not only a material dimension of this process. There are also other non-material related to the way we are with ontological difference, but also that the epistemic superiority based on this ontological difference is related, is directly direct, uh, related to the current social um, injustice and the um, current uh, asymmetric uh, power or geopolitics that um, is, um, that makes some countries uh, dominant versus other countries being um, only the users and the uh, subjects of ex extraction in this process. So these two aspects, the, the aspect of the geopolitics of AI, um, and also the aspects of the body politics, the aspect related to subjectivity and the intersubjective relations of people should be taken into account when we are doing this um, decolonial analysis or interpretation or, of these uh, current social technical developments and technologies. And um, in particular, we can see this um, in many of the um, recent historical events, for example, the elections in, uh, in Bolivia and the declarations of Elon Musk that um, he said that they will cop, cop whoever they want. I mean, the American, problem, the American government or uh, tech co corporations, because of course, as as you know, uh, in Latin America there are many. Uh, there is a lot of lithium in Bolivia and also uh, in Mexico, for example. So this extractive process is not only related to the process of technological development, but also with the whole conception of who in this world has the power to decide about their future. So the problem is deeper than only uh, talking or speaking about the technological development. The problem is about who decides the future of the rest of the humanity. And in this case, in many, um, in many countries of Latin America, the future has not been decided by the communities. The future has been decided somewhere else. And um, what does it has to do with uh, AI? Um, the AI is, the, is used as, the, as another um, 
way of legitimizing this exploitation and, and dispossession of bodies and territories in, um, in Latin America and of course in, in other uh, regions. And, uh, and that our struggles um, and the struggles of, of the communities in Latin America are related to defend the right to decide about their lives and the, and the right to be what they want to be, the, the right to decide, decide that the ontological difference should not be considered like the, the excuse to exploit um, for the exploitation of, of bodies and territories. So um, just to close um, the idea, um, I think that for, for many uh, people that are trying to resist in their territories against these whole AI systems, um, is the fact that the cost of AI is paid by these territories, independently of who is using AI, the cost and the impacts are differentiated. And the impacts are mainly paid by those racialized and ethnicized and gender bodies in, um, in these territories. So any ethical framework or any discussion should be can, so it should take into account these differentiated impacts. So for us, for example, it's not enough to speak about ethical frameworks if those ethical frameworks do not consider the impacts uh, on those territories and, and, and bodies. And um, when we speak about technological future or technological pluriverses, uh, taking this idea of the Zapatista movement. Uh, we are fighting for a world where you can live and, and be what you are without uh, being um, imposed, of, without, without having the imposition of this universal and, and, and uh, homogeneous development uh, or model of the world that is currently um, the only way that we uh, have to um, belong and to, and to be part of this world. So there we are fighting for a world with other worlds not related to this naked politics that is the politics that in which is uh, based this current uh, social technical development uh, is the politics that leads, leads this current um, AI um, systems. So I think I will end there. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Paola, for all these insights from also feminist decolonial perspectives. I think that are, are really important for these debates as well, put gender also in the center of the debate as well as race. Um, and well, we have our last and final panelist, Rachel, the space is yours. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Chris Gea and to Paula and, and Mustafa too. Um, I'm so honored to be here amongst such really critical thinkers and, and a to be at an event that's hosted um, in and for the Global South uh, about a globally relevant and, and pressing issue. So well done to, to Digital Labour Lab and the Histories of AI Project and to Raphael and all the organizers and, and thank you for having me here. Um, in a very strange echo to, to Mustafa's opening kind of theme of his, of his presentation, I wanted to take a moment to acknowledge and recognize a tragedy that's been unfolding here in Cape Town in South Africa, where I'm based over the last 24 hours. Um, we were hit by really, really terrible mountain fires, awful, awful fires. 
I don't think anybody is, is hurt to, to, to a very great degree, but the University of Cape Town, a vast majority of it has burnt down. It's been completely gutted. So the uh, places where I did my uh, masters and my PhD, all those campuses have burnt down. But the really critical thing is that the libraries have burnt down. The libraries that host whole archives of anti-apartheid activism, records of this activism, that host rare African books in, in African languages from pre-colonial times, um, and that haven't been digitized, have been completely lost. And this fire was started, we think, by homeless people who were living on the mountain, who were creating a fire for warmth and to cook with. And I think there's a kind of critical linkage here that we need to recognize between the ecology of human dignity and living and land and how that's intricately related to the material production and the possibilities of knowledge and institutions of learning. So I just wanted to note that because I think it's so important to what we're discussing here today. Um, so yeah, thank, thank you for that. So, my work has, has been about trying to understand and engage with this question of what it means to talk about and to call for the decolonization of artificial intelligence and how from South Africa, where I am based, we can take this work into or this kind of uh, attitude and perspective and project into the work we're doing to try and understand and respond to artificial intelligence, including uh, developing kind of policy responses and, and practical advice for government uh, in relation to how we deal and how the country uh, deals with artificial intelligence. So today I want to touch on a couple of things and hopefully do so relatively quickly. I want to talk about what decolonization means in relation to decoloniality, how AI may impede or perhaps even contribute to the project of decolonization, and what this demands of us as thinkers and as scholars and how we've had to shift and change what it is we think we do. So decoloniality has arisen as a form of thought and action subsequent to the failure of formal decolonization to dismantle the forms of coloniality that continue to shape and condition the lives and the possibilities of post-colonial peoples and places. Um, Maldonado Torres and, and Deluve Gatcheni, drawing on Annabel Pujano's work. Um, and we can see already in this kind of movement of thought across global South domains. Talk about the continued presence of colonialism today after the formal demise of the empire as the coloniality of power. And we've been hearing Mustafa and Paola also speak about this idea of the coloniality of power. So this names a central and centralizing form of power over that supports and maintains colonial relations of exploitation and domination, perpetuating the subjugation and subalternity of the global South and its peoples and the superiority of the global North and whiteness. And we need to note here that coloniality as a form of power over is itself a technology. It is the application and reification of Occidental knowledge of ways of thinking about the hierarchy of human and nation worth that is translated, and this is the technology of coloniality, into ways of doing, ways of treating, managing, enacting, performing blackness and whiteness, supremacy and subjugation. So decoloniality, decoloniality in this first instance rejects this seminal structure of Western reason and the divisions between theory and practice science and technology. And this is where we see the emphasis on decolonial praxis, the intellectual labor of tracing and reestablishing the history of colonized experience is not a practice distinct from the work of building new and self-determined communities. The thinking is doing and the doing is thinking as Walter McNolo and Catherine Walsh has, has told us and spoken about in their more recent book. So we see already the first injunction of decoloniality to supersede, to go beyond and to show the critical limits of Western reason. And this includes the limits of Western reason to answer the questions that it has itself produced. But decoloniality more broadly is about the search for freedom, dignity and re-communitization, the rebuilding of communities after colonialism. 
Decoloniality is not so much about undoing, as the prefix suggests, but principally about giving back, about reparations, and about healing what, uh, what Manolo first named the colonial wound, about acknowledge, acknowledging and seeking to repair, and this is the other etymology of reparations to repair, the fatal wound to people and land caused by the structural, material, ecological, psychological, and epistemic violence of colonialism. It is historically located, it is a historically located political project that seeks to disrupt the very idea of history in which it is supposedly arisen. And this historical moment is important to note and think about more critically. So decoloniality now is in some ways an indictment on decolonialization. It laments how formal decolonialization, decolonization did not fulfill its promise. And this is part of the difference between decoloniality and decolonization that we see very acutely in the West, where the location of undoing colonial power has most radically changed from the colony to the imperial center of power, to Britain, to France, to Germany, to Belgium, to the Netherlands. African post colonies have, for example, steadily been decolonizing since independence. Decolonization names the experience of post-independent nations and communities. But in the West, in the imperial centers, post-colonialism, hybridity, post-modernism, cosmopolitanism were all not enough. The effects of colonialism have not been shaken. Human equality has not been achieved. Exploitation, particularly racial, has arisen in new ways. And capitalism, that which colonialism served, colonialism's own master, has only risen to greater and greater power. So the West is beginning to realize that it too must decolonize. But how does the, de how does the imperial power decolonize itself? It requires these nations to, to rethink their entire identity to re-identify in ways that are not dependent on a distinction with other groups and other places that Western thought and reason deemed deviant or degenerate, and its technologies that sought to negate or even to make extinct. So decoloniality is working against, and I think this is really coming out in, in places like the UK, a kind of racial forgetting that's really being used as a kind of post-colonial strategy and after-colonial strategy in the colony, the colonial centers like the UK. And I think the recent report that came out of the UK, um, the conclusion to the race relations report that there's no structural racism in UK is a really clear example of the power of this racial forgetting, this discourse and ideology of racial forgetting. So what does all of this mean in relation to artificial intelligence? We can think of AI as, as a global industry, and certainly it incorporates imperial tendencies, as, as the two other panelists have spoken about. It has an expansionist attitude, which is enveloped in the technological determinist outlook. So AI, as I'm speaking about it here, encompasses the production and organization of knowledge around AI systems, the industry that does this work and applies it, and the attendant discourses and imaginaries that support, reify and valorize AI as a principal idea, even a value of late modern society. And pointedly, I include AI ethics as one of these attendant discourses. So I am putting forward that the work of decolonizing AI should not begin with AI, but it should begin with the political project of decoloniality. Decoloniality must take AI as its subject and not the other way around. This is not what decoloniality can do for AI, but what AI can do for decoloniality. So then we can ask, what does de decoloniality seek to achieve? And in some respects, that's freedom, human dignity, reparations and recommunitization, all centered around the question of deracialization. And then how does AI impede, frustrate or prevent this? And two, how can or how might AI support and contribute to this work of decoloniality?
So in terms of the first question and how AI might impede or prevent decoloniality, we are increasingly seeing examples of this captured in the media and scholarly works that are exploring this in historical and, and present day detail. The surveillance of blackness, the control of movement of those without a claim to nationality and citizenship, their effective imprisonment and the utter denial of freedom, the invisible workers of digital capitalism, the lack of representation in, in the AI industry and the products it produces. The examples abound of how AI is impeding decoloniality. And we should be critically attentive here to how AI reinscribes and then automates the logics of race and therefore frustrates deracialization. What are the new ways in which AI is evidentiating racial difference? And how does this build from the history of racializing technologies? And then as Paula spoke about just before this, what kind of post-colonial futures is AI denying? What kind of imperialized and racialized futures is AI preparing us for? And I think we can think here in terms of AI as a kind of bi biopolitical technology that's implicating both race and gender in the reproduction of populations in a particular way, creating the conditions for a future of racial purity to come. This was the fantasy of eugenics. And we are seeing more and more critical work looking at the relationship between AI and eugenics. So there are many questions to be explored here and much still to understand about the relationality between AI, its histories and the coloniality of power. So to the second question, can AI contribute to healing the colonial wound? And if so, what is required and how, much the, how might the, the practice of AI today need to change? And I'm not so sure about this question because I'm much more critical. But today and yesterday, as I witnessed the fires and witnessed the absolute loss of these invaluable records for scholarship not yet done and history not yet recorded, I thought about how AI could be so essential here in preserving digital archives through image recognition. Um, I teach a course in Cameroon in Yaoundé on digital humanities and the digital humanities represent this kind of huge possibility of a space without borders and a discipline without disciplinary boundaries in which new possibilities can be created, created and new innovations um, arrived at through the use of digital technologies. And then I think there's questions around the preservation of rare and endangered languages and their attendant cultures and the efforts of machine learners in, in the African continent to develop natural language processing systems that function in African languages. But we must, we must bear in mind here the huge, huge labor of trying to label and annotate this kind of linguistic data. But in thinking about this, or in trying to apply AI to the task of decoloniality, we must be attendant to how efforts to decolonize can result in recolonization, including in the co-option of the concept of decoloniality itself, which perpetuates or ends up perpetuating Western reason as central and singular. So one example that I want to quickly mention is in relation to this emergent discourse and regulatory standards around AI ethics. I think this is one of the examples of how AI and its discourses is suturing the colonial wound. So these principles have largely arisen in the global north, they present as universal, they come particularly out of Europe, and Europe and the European Union sees ethics as its critical edge against China and the US in leading the global AI race. The idea of ethics has not been critically examined. It hasn't taken into account in its use now how uh, the history of colonialism was justified by this particular Western universalizing um, form of ethics, which deemed the places in which it was put to work as pre-ethical, as the colonies of, as pre-ethical such that the work that was being done there, the settlement and the conquest and the colonizing was only ever ethical. In my own PhD thesis, I uh, explored the history of, uh, and the work of the concept of transparency, which is one of the central principles in AI ethics, looking at how it has been put to work and proselytized in the African region to delimit and delegitimize other ways of knowing, other forms of truth and other ways of governing. 
And we can also see a latent imperialism at work in the extraterritorial application of the GDPR and the effects that the adequacy provisions are going to have on countries like South Africa and other African countries that don't have the same data protection regulations and who will be left behind, unable to participate in global data flows and the access to the markets that these global data flows enable. So what, what of decoloniality and, and, and our own shifting and changing role here? I think that some of the most exciting and original questions and inquiries in the academy today are being prompted by the political reinvigoration of studies on blackness and alterity. I'm thinking of the work of people like Zakia Iman Jetson here. And some of the most powerful action in universities over the past five years has taken place under the sign of decoloniality. The University of Oxford has learned from the University of Cape Town and the University of Witzvatersrand. So we're changing the pattern of influence here. And this is a radically different kind of research impact that decoloniality is asking of us to break down our simulated and superimposed boundaries between disciplines, between our work and the world we take as the object of our study, to question received ideas and ways of thinking, to demonstrate and find alternatives, and to look for the answers to our questions in different places and from different sources with different kinds of authority. And then to ask of us something quite different, that is not to provide answers and not to demonstrate epistemic authority, but instead to stay with the complexity, to narrate and to explain it and to show the linkages between the bias against people of color in the algorithms of the Google search engines and the imposition of surveillance technologies in African border posts, between the design of gendered technologies like Alexa and the lack of voices from the global south in the design of AI ethics. So our work is to explore a new voyage as Mbembe has spoken about to a new world, as I think Mustafa was speaking about earlier today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rachel, and thank you very much all again. Um, I see that there are some questions posting, but before going that, I just would like to do more than a brief summary because there were a lot of of knowledge put in here today. So I, I, I won't make that the, 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 the thought, but I just want to say that as Mustafa, Paola and Rachel said, the coloniality is not just theory. The coloniality is an epistemic debate, of course, but also is a practice, is methodology, is putting and reflecting or, or work every day is to reflect the, the power politics among researchers, among all research, this thing about the politics of knowledge in all the stage of what we are doing. And with that, as Rachel was mentioning something that Walsh mentioned, I would like to also bring some decolonial knowledge of an indigenous group here in Ecuador that they say uh, doing by saying. So actually it's not that, it's the coloniality is not just saying things, it's not about like talking, it's also about doing. And I guess that actually all of the people involved in the coloniality are trying to put this into practice. So with that, I will start uh, reading some questions for all of us, for all of you. So and the, fir the first question for all the group is, how will we incorporate the question of religion into the recognition of race and gender? Talking about IE, but also about coloniality in general. So how we can think about religion and race and gender in these debates. The second is how we can think about this post-secular approach to IE as a colonial incorporation of gender analysis. So how I will say also like how we can think about these debates through the approach of gender nowadays. So I will start with that questions and I will go with the others in a couple of minutes. But if any one of you or all of you want to answer, 
and just ask you to be brief because we are like short of time. So anyone want to open the mic and start this debate? <laughs> we got well, thank you. Um, well, it's a very interesting question because uh, that the division between rationality and spirituality is also Western uh, Western construction. Um, so, if we speak about so, what, what I was trying to say is that um, we don't have to separate spirituality and, and rationality. We, that that's something that we should um, think about as a dominant epistemology again. Um, and then religion in particular, and in the case of, of Latin America, um, the, the predominant religion is uh, Catholicism. Um, and the problem with, with um, religion in in our case is that this religion was used again as a way to legitimize um, the exploitation and the dispossession of the uh, of the communities um, in the territories of, of uh, Abia Yala. And this um, epistemological uh, dynamics, uh, this uh, way of, of imposing this religion to the communities was also um, a way of imposing these values that are associated with this particular religion. And in this case, again, if of course you know, um, there is a problem of, of uh, sexism and, and, and patriarchy with, uh, um, that is, I mean, that is not solved yet. Um, so, for me, at least, speaking about spirituality is a way to, to repair this, this original um, imposition, uh, but I'm not sure about religion, <laughs> um, because it's it's a different thing. It's a different institution, as I said. Um, institutions are a part of, of the colonial process, the construction of these institutions. And in the case of Latin America, this institution in particular um, was a fourth part of the division between the indigenous populations and the, the colonial empire, and also between men and women. So I think it's a complex issue issue that should be, of course, should be discussed as, as Mustafa was, was explaining before, but um, it needs to be thought, um, I think, from the current experiences of, of the communities that are still being um, subject of, of dispossession because of their spiritual practices, for example. So we have many communities in Latin America um, that that still believe in their own gods and their own uh, ways to to relate to the nature and environment and, and to each other that are not compatible with these values that are embedded in, in the big religions or at least in the big religion that is the dominant religion in Latin America. So um, I don't know. It's a complex issue. <laughs> I'm sure Mutafa has a lot more to say. <laughs> to be honest, I don't know where to begin. It, it is such a big issue. Um, maybe I can, and maybe this isn't even answering the, the, the question, so I apologize for that, but I, maybe this point has some relevance. So the term capitalism has been floated a number of times in uh, the, the, the talks that each of us have given. And I would like us to consider what might happen if we decenter capitalism as, if you like, the master term through which to think about the world. Now, obviously, from a decolonial perspective, when we say capitalism, we always say something like 
uh, racialized capitalism or capitalism as, as grounded in colonialism and colonialism as entangled with racialization, um, patriarchy, et cetera, et cetera. So there are multiple entanglements here. But one of the problems I think with continuing to center capitalism is that it forces labor and the figure of the worker to center stage. In other words, uh, the adoption of capitalism as the frame has an impact in terms of the category scheme that we use to think about what we're actually up against. And what I'm suggesting, what I, what I was trying to make the argument in, in, in my paper for is if we shift the frame, I mean, I'm not suggesting that capitalism doesn't exist. That's not the argument I'm trying to make here. I'm suggesting that the, the that capitalism hasn't succeeded something that has come previously, but rather that which came previously has been taken up into and informs capitalism. So, I mean, and you know, this understanding goes back to uh, people like, um, I think it's Orlando Patterson, you know, who, who's contributed to this in terms of the, the role of slavery, but also more, more recently, I guess, uh, maybe Cedric Robinson in Black Marxism. Who, who says that you can't say capitalism without saying racial capitalism. So there's already a, an understanding that capitalism and race are entangled. But I'm suggesting that race itself is entangled and driven by something else. And that I'm suggesting is a theopolitical impulse. The idea of setting oneself up as God or as gods. You know, I tried to make reference to the work of people like uh, David Theo Goldberg and others uh, along these lines. So what I'm suggesting here is that it's it's not that labor and the economy and the entanglement of politics with the economy isn't important. Of course it is. But I'm suggesting that that tends to be a kind of secularized frame, which brackets out a lot of history that feeds into the colonial project and arguably persists in it. And to what extent and this is just a, a question I'm throwing out there. I, I mean, I have my own answers to this, but I'm throwing this question out there. To what extent do we impoverish ourselves in terms of the resources that we can draw upon to mount an effective response to, if, if you like, the to AI colonialism, if you want to think about it in those terms, by uh, contracting our narrative into the frame of capitalism and labor and the figure of the worker. What if we were to think about this figure in other terms? What might that mean in terms of how we draw upon resources to consider confronting this ostensibly rising threat? It's just a question I'm putting out there rhetorically. I told you I wasn't going to answer the question. I yeah, I think, Mustafa, you have a, a lot more to say on this. I wanted to just briefly respond to the comment that's been uh, made in the chat about this, because I have um, been at one point exploring different kind of cosmologies of intelligence in um, different African societies, and how this gives us a different idea about embodied or unbodied um, non-human intelligence and the role it plays in uh, shaping people's understanding of their life and their world, but particularly their future uh, and understanding a different kind of relationship with the future. So I do think that, that, that there is uh, some really critical and exciting questions to explore uh, there in relation to understanding alternate narratives alternate ways of thinking about this figure of what an artificial or non-human intelligence is. Thank you all. To, before going to the second round of questions, I was informed that Nick wanted to pose a question by, by up in the mix. So Nick, the space is yours. Okay. I didn't mean to impose. Raphael said I could ask a question and I have to go and cook dinner in 15 minutes. So I will. Uh, I just wanted it's been a really interesting panel and it's made me think uh, more about the social production, the historical production of this astonishing power to code the world, which is AI. Um, and that's been great. 
But I want to ask a, a di really difficult question that I don't know the answer to necessarily, but I, I think we can't avoid confronting it, which is how do we make sense of China in relation to this? Um, how come, after all, China is one of the main centers of AI practice in the world, and China has an explicit political and policy goal of leading the world in AI by 2030, in which it may well succeed. So does China fit within our concept, uh, I'm asking this to myself as well, of data colonialism or colonialism and AI? Does it fit? And if it doesn't fit, what are the consequences of it not fitting? Is that a problem for our concept? Do we have to change it so it fits? Or is it not a problem? Thank Nick, you, I, Nick. Uh, sorry. No, go, go, go. No, I, 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 I was going to just ask Nick if I, I could, you know, attempt attempt an answer. It's, it's a real shame that uh, Michael isn't on uh, the call today because um, I guess his recent uh, piece in Raw magazine, um, I would suggest pushes back somewhat on the narrative that you and Ulysses present in your various, I, I guess, papers, the journal papers in the lead up to you publishing The Costs of Connection. Um, so. I, I would suggest you give the impression in the papers and, and in the book that something like an AI arms race is in the making, if not already there, you know, these statements coming forth from China and its deployment of AI in, you know, various capacities, face recognition, uh, social ordering, et cetera, et cetera. So these are, these are real phenomena. But according to, at least if I recall Michael's uh, article correctly, he tries to make the case for suggesting that the claim that there is this uh, AI arms race and that in a sense China is soon to gain parity or something, that this might be overplayed. That, you, that in fact, what he calls the AI empire, I mean, uh, sorry, the American empire of AI or the AI em em empire as American uh, is going to remain hegemonic for the uh, foreseeable future. I mean, 2030 is what, eight years away? Um, who knows what, what can happen in eight years? Like who saw 2020 in a pandemic? Um, but I have a slightly different take on this uh, to, to, uh, to Michael's take, and, and it will be as follows very quickly. Um, if we think about uh, colonialism and its facilitating logics of coloniality as, if you like, a master grammar for the world, capital T, capital W, then I would suggest it's quite possible that we might have regional dialects of this master grammar all over the place. And for me, the important point is to think about what did pre-modern China look like in terms of its cosmology, its the ordering of its social fabric, its relationship to technology, etc. And then this is the latter question has been explored to some extent by I think a philosopher Yu Qi in his book, The Question Concerning Technology in China, where he riffs off Heidegger, you know, the, the famous question concerning technology. So I guess what I'm what, what I'm trying to get at here is the grammar of the world was laid down by, at least on, on my reading, by Christendom come Europe, come the West. It is a white grammar, more specifically, it's a white supremacist grammar. But you can have regional dialects that are brown and black and red and yellow, etc. And I would suggest that that is exactly what China is about. It is a regional dialect of whiteness, which looks yellow. Ms. Kaya, can I come in briefly here? Oh, go, go so, ahead. Thank you. So, so Nick, I want to just explain quickly how in, in, in South Africa, in policy debates, um, and a lot of the policy debates are around how we develop the infrastructure to eventually have the AI system we want. China dominates. China dominates in the material construction of the infrastructure that will enable AI across the whole African continent. And there are really interesting uh, intellectual inquiries going on in relation to the China-Africa question. And I think Nimbembe's recent book, Out of the Dark Night, in the last chapter, or is it the last chapter? So I, think, I think so. There's a, there's, a, there's a section in relation to, to this question of, of China and Africa. 
So infrastructurally and materially, China wields the power here. And, and you come to policy debates and, and, and with, with government departments, there's always representatives from uh, Huawei and Chinese companies that will give us free technological infrastructure. They will give it to us for free. America and the West still holds the imaginary power behind what AI can do. So I think there's a question there in exploring the difference. But I am thinking more and more that this idea of decoloniality has, has a stronger political purchase and political need in the places that, in the centers of imperial power than they do here. We've been dealing with these questions of decolonization for the last however many years in different and very refracted various ways, depending on the independence movements and the particular struggles. But the rise of decoloniality, the question of decoloniality and AI first arose in the West. It wasn't raised here. In fact, no one is really ra raising that question here. I am answering a Western debate in, 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 in entering this, these questions. So I think, I mean, it, it moves the question a little bit, but I do think the question of China is really, really important to figure in relation to the resistance and, and, and dealing with the structures of power that AI is exhibiting all over the world. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you, Mustafa. I don't know if Paolo wants to take a uh, friend's question. If not, we can just go to the other one. Paola? Well, I think that um, we're talking about different processes. Um, because I agree with Rachel, there is a like there is a market war and we are also entering that, that war because Latin American markets in AI are also being disputed by um, Chinese co companies. But I think we are speaking about, uh, when we speak about decoloniality, we are speaking about, um, again, this, ep this logic of how, how to impose one way of being in the world to others. And I think China doesn't, operate at least in our territories in the same way. <laughs> um, so I think we have to understand that there are different dynamics and that these narratives between AI, like AI superpowers being in conflict and, and having a war um, also reflects the construction of of the enemy um, that helps the West to, to, to continue this um, domination, this epistemological domination uh, in the world. So it's not a problem of only markets being disputed. It's a problem of who, as, as Rachel said, who, who gets to build these narratives and this model of the world. Um, and going back to the, the idea, what, what, is, what, what does this, this world looks like? It's a model where, where we should like continue um, aspiring to, to consume and, and being captured by just by, by using these technologies or is it another world? Um, and and just, just briefly commenting about um, what most of us said about capitalism. I think it's, it's that we are not trying to center only capitalism as, as the main problem or the main um, monster as he said. Uh, when we speak about coloniality, I think we are also including these different epistemic frameworks, and that includes spirituality and, and religion, affections and, and, and feelings and, and the subjectivities of themselves. So in that sense, I, th I think that the, the power of the West, the big success of, of the West is the capture of that subjectivities 
and the intersubjective relations and, and the way that uh, these aspirations, these desires of a world where we can consume and be modern and be civilized is embedded in our DNA. <laughs> so I think it's, it's deeper than that. It's not only about capitalism, it's about the capture of, of, of the ways of being, uh, feeling and, and, and existing in the world that, that are um, being disputed. Thank you very much to all the panelists, to his reflections regarding the role of China in IE and decolonization. So thank you, Nick, to pose the question. Um, as we have just 10 minutes at most, I just, I want to read two questions, but I ask all of you panelists to be really brief, but I think that there are a lot of questions, to be honest, and we, we are not gonna be able to, to, to debate and answer all of them, but I think that this one uh, is very interesting in what we are debating now from China and also what's happening with the global South and something that also Rachel was talking about the knowledge of African cultures. So I think that's entered to the conversation pretty well. So uh, Luis uh, said, colonialists left many cultures, a regimen and cosmo cosmologies in Americas. I speak from Brazil. Here we have several Afro-Indigenous traditions that also use different technologies. Do you think it is possible to articulate this heritage to deal with artificial intelligence? So to summarize the question, is asking if we can use in a way, we can recover this heritage and put the center, this heritage of Afro-Indigenous communities. And I will extend to say to all communities and sister communities that we have in the different continents. So that's the first question. And the last question I ask all of you or the ones that want to answer is, um, do you think that there's a contradiction between thinking about artificial intelligence and the global South ethnic ontological cultures, given the fact that such development were primarily built within the coloniality framework. So I think that with these two questions, I open the debate again. Let me know which one to start. Go. I'd like to, if I may, just briefly address, attempt to address the first question, which I think bears uh, some connection to what uh, Rachel was um, mentioning in the closing part of, of her talk when she pointed to, you know, the, you know, very sad reality of the destruction of all these materials uh, at University of Cape Town, all these manuscripts, etc., because of the, this fire that's taken place, and and. I, I guess what I, what I would like to suggest here is the possibly the desirability of teasing out some nuance in in terminology between maybe AI and digitization. And I'm not a big fan of either of them, but I'm a much bigger fan of digitization than I am of AI. What I mean by this is that the idea of uh, communities, indigenous communities, African communities, South Asian communities, whatever, digitizing their heritage, their manuscripts, for, for, and maintaining full control over that digitized production. I mean, this is key here. Yeah, sticking it into the cloud. Um, clouds just tend to drift away. So that's a disaster. So I wanna, I wanna make that absolutely clear. The idea of uh, you know, localized control over one's own heritage uh, through you know, some form of digital humanities uh, initiative, I have less problem with that. But the idea of marshalling AI technology, you know, whether it's some kind of sophisticated um, uh, machine learning or deep learning technology to, and I get the point about the labor intensive work of tagging and, and the rest of it. The question is, you know, to what extent, why are we in a rush? I mean, just archive the stuff and then put it to one side and take your time. You know, why is the temporality being set by the technology? that we need to tag this stuff. We need to use the technology available to tag this stuff. Do we? I'm not so sure about that. It, to me, it seems to buy into this kind of, 
what I'm hearing in the background uh, in, a, in a lot of discussions about AI is the inevitability of AI that and, and uh, the, the, the inevitability of AI in relation to progress and development as foregone conclusions. Um, and even these uh, gestures in the direction of multiple futures, multiple modernities, even trans modernities, etc. And I, you know, and I say this with due respect to uh, decolonial scholars from uh, Latin America, that I, I don't think that sufficient uh, kind of critical um, engagement has 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 been made with what is at stake in continuing to center AI in terms of can we do AI differently? I mean, this is a point that Rachel you make towards the end of your paper, which I really like. I mean, I frame it slightly differently, and I, I think I put a tweet on. Twitter a couple of weeks back saying, is it about doing AI otherwise, or is it about doing otherwise than AI? And they're not the same. Yeah, so I, I want to make a, you know, like a big rah-rah for digitization. Yeah, let's, 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 let's keep the, uh, the, the, you know, the, the, the manuscripts, you know, let's have backups, etc. But make sure that that control is uh, localized. Um, and let's maybe think about separating the question of digitalization from uh, from AI. Apologies for taking so long in answering. Um, yeah, I, I, I very much agree with with what um, with what Mustafa has been saying here. I have long thought that part of the huge problem with AI is that it assumes its own future and it assumes a future dominated by AI and we're never allowed to escape that imaginary. It's always about dealing with this AI future and not imagining a future that isn't dominated by AI. But in terms of this question around alternate cosmologies and alternate ways of understanding relationships to other kinds of intelligent beings, I was thinking about this and I was thinking about this question and this question for the advancement of AI research. And I feel quite strongly that it is a research question that really serves the West, who have acknowledged that it has a problem in terms of the representativity of narratives that are largely white and, and Western. And it's seeking to explore other kinds of narratives, thinking about some of these communities that have different kind of cultural practices. And, and, and I'll speak about, for example, the Agugu, uh, big, large puppets in um, the Nigerian, I think it's Yoruba, not Igbo, but I could be corrected here, communities that are these, um, they embody ancestral intelligence and they come down and they move and they give advice on community issues. And I thought about this and, and, and spoke about this with colleagues in relation to a different kind of thinking about other kinds of histories or automata. And I realized that I'm not sure how far it serves those communities. And what we need to be centering here is what types of inquiries serve those kinds of communities, not what types of inquiries the Western um, research agenda on AI needs to answer. And I think in terms of my students in Yayunde, and I was talking to them about how do we think about designing technologies differently so that they serve local communities. And, and they were saying to me that, you know, so many of the communities from which they come from, not where they are now in order to connect to these lessons, but where they come from, there's no electricity for six months, six months. And here we are worrying about AI colonizing the world when I think there might be other kind of related but more pressing questions in relation to decoloniality yes and in relation to AI and advanced digital technologies and the imaginary that it is imposing um, so yeah so that's my kind of response to Louise's question thank you thank you Rachel Paula you want to add something well I basically I agree with what has been said um and i think the speaking about ai um in an equal context as ours um of course having as as rachel said communities without water or or electricity 
um, it's important because they are already being affected by AI development. <laughs> this day. So, for example, these communities in different parts of, of, of Latin America are being affected because their rivers are polluted because they are assembling technologies for these tech, big tech companies. Their bodies are being affected because uh, the mining companies are polluting in their territories and there are and they are exploding their their labor so uh, for me the discussion is well of course i agree we we are not trying to fix these technologies i think they're not fixable um for me the discussion is if we're going to speak about ethics and we are going to speak about decolonizing ai let's speak about the bodies and territories that are being affected now and that have been been affected for centuries so let's not disconnect the way that technology is produced from the bodies that are being affected now for this production, the use and deployment and disposal of these technologies, because that's a fact that is happening. And nobody sees like these implications for actual bodies and territories. Um, so I think that discussion is relevant in, in that sense. If we are trying to understand the, the material impact, but also the epistemic impacts, the non-material impacts that are connected to reinforce these power asymmetries, to reinforce social injustice, to reinforce all these systems of oppression that are connected as well. So we are not talking about anything. <laughs> so um, that's why I think that these courses about uh, decoloniality should be um, should be speaking about the political compromise of the political program that is behind the colonization. We are not just speaking about um, a theory. We are speaking about um, the way that this, uh, this system operates to, to impact uh, specific bodies and territories. And as I said before, it's, the problem is dispossession and exploitation, but also the capture of lives and, and imaginaries and, and futures. Thank you again to everyone. Go Mustafa, but actually, as we need to close, we are gonna give us like a couple of minutes to close to each of you. So actually there, I guess Mustafa, you want to share your last reflections. And I know that the topic's going to more debates. There are a lot of interest in the chats and a lot of questions. And I guess that there was also a couple of proposals for next panels on the topic on um, the coloniality and its infrastructure, for example, or as Paola Paul was saying, of territories, subjectivities, identities, and material and non-material impact of these tech industries and AI. So just to close to, to all of you, there is a question that probably, I don't know if it's gonna help to close or it's gonna open more debates, but um, the organizers want want this question to be read. So let's read the questions and after that, let's listen to all of you closing. So there is a question from Felix Palazuelos or actually a reflection of him himself. It's surprising to note that in this debate of colonialism, there are seem to be not awareness of the Im impact of racism against the Chinese conch in the prior pro-Western moralist rightness expressed in the Western versus China competition of the implementation of artificial intelligence. So with this last comment, I will open to all of you to your last remarks. I don't know who want to start. I'll jump in quickly. So um, just in response to that, uh, I completely agree. Um, I, in fact, I, I put a comment in the chat, maybe somewhat further up along the lines that I don't think we can discount more than a small dose of Orientalism in the way that this AI race is being framed in terms of 
the West versus China, you know, it's uh, the yellow peril looming in the background. I, I think that's operative. It's always operative. Orientalism is always operative. I mean, it's one of the constitutive features of uh, Western white identity. Um, so that, 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 that's one thing. So I, I, I definitely support that, that uh, argument of, uh, of Felix, a well-made. Um, the only thing I really wanted to say in closing um, was one of the things that I don't think we've touch, touched on so much. We talked about uh, biopolitics. There's been some mention about necropolitics. There's been mention of the importance of geopolitics and of the importance of bod body politics. And they are all important and they should all be engaged with. But one of the things that I think maybe we, we, we have largely escaped from engaging with is the question of the ecological and environmental costs of mass scale computing, particularly of the type that uh, is required to drive uh, machine learning and deep learning. And uh, just by way of a, you know, kind of a shout out to research done by someone else, um, so there's an STS scholar called Nathan Enzmengo who has a contribution to the, the, the book that I cited in, in my, uh, at the start of my, my uh, essay this evening, uh, Your Computer is on Fire. His chapter is called The Cloud is a Factory. And he has some useful kind of uh, facts and figures and uh, getting us to think about, you know, is this sustainable? And is this something that we really want to embark upon? I mean, it's really, pointing to the question of infrastructure, which I raised as well. You know, I mean, rightly, you're talking about, you know, I think Rachel made the point, uh, you know, certain communities, they don't even have access to electricity. Other communities don't have access to water. I mean, these are, you know, uh, well, maybe not in the case of electricity, but certainly in the case of water, this is life threatening if you don't have access to this. So the question of infrastructure, I think, looms large. Um, Generally, the AI debate tends to be framed in, in terms that either center on intelligence, on human beings, et cetera, et cetera. And that's fine. But I tend to think about this increasingly as requiring us to engage with the socio-material assemblages that AI uh, uh, references and, and uh, instantiates in the world and the costs to the planet. Because I mean, as Walter Mignola says, isn't the decolonial project fundamentally about putting life front and center. And why does that not mean also putting the planet front and center? I, I, you know, apologies for, again, going on rather long, but I just wanted to flag that up. That's me done. Thanks. Yeah, I, I agree with Mustafa's point. And I think that um, thinking about how the mining of the uh, Colton and Tantala minerals um, that are essential to create computers and cell phones uh, is from the Congo, and it has resulted in a deep and very long and very violent civil war that is not over. And they're seeing no benefits to um, the digital technologies or the artificial intelligence that is being produced out of their lands. So I think this is a, an important one to, to, to bear in mind when we think about the AI industry, to think about all its kind of supply chains in people and land and, and places that all go into creating the AI um, that, 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 that becomes the immediate thing that we think about and use and critique. But thank you, it's been a really excellent and exciting panel. Um, thank you all. Well, thank you uh, as well for the interesting questions and, and, and I also have Talk a lot about the relationship between the body and the territory, and and how this might be taken like as like a, like a uh, continu continuum, or should not be separated. So um, part of the discussion should be, as I said, um, that these impacts and and are, of course, they are. They are for everybody because we are all live, all living planet, but <laughs> they are paid specifically specifically by certain bodies and territories, uh, like the most. So, as as Rachel said, um, the Colton mines, but also here in, in Latin America, the, the territories that have been uh, affected uh, are the territories of the indigenous communities that have that are being killed because they are trying to defend their land. So um, 
I think it's important to, to make sure that we do not disconnect the, the territories uh, from the communities that are living there because in this case, the territories that are being exploded, uh, exploited are, are the territories that specifically are defended by these group communities. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. And I don't know if Rafael went to, to close, but thank you, everyone, again. And thank you for the invitation also to be moderator tonight. Thank you very much, Koskaya, Mustafa, Paula, Rachel, for your uh, amazing debate. We will have uh, uh, to do more debates on AI and environment and, and AI and other things with other persons like Michael Quest, like Yard and Katz, and other and other uh, people. I think it, it's very interesting. In in, in fifteen minutes, uh, we will be back with the last panel of the day, vocabulary and design of AI with Ranjit Singh, Carla Vieira and Luke Stark. Unfortunately, Amba Kek from AI Now uh, was unable to attend the event because she had personal problems in the past few days and she promised to talk to us in the near future. It's, this is horrible times. Uh, but we'll be back in 15 minutes to drink a water or a tea or a coffee. See you in 15 minutes. Thank you very much, guys.
Hello, Evelyn. Hello, Ranjit. Hello, Luke. Hello, Carla. Hello. Hello. Thank you for having us. Evelyn will be the, the moderator. Uh, soon, in two minutes, I will present to you. Feel free to. It, it, it's only a, a, an informal conversation, Ranjit. Uh, made uh, uh, some comments on other panels it's very very common great other yeah. panels okay it's um it's a big honor for me to be here in this event if you it's, it's a really big pleasure well this is this is so exciting and i i am um... I'm looking forward to seeing some of the panels tomorrow. I haven't had a chance to see any today, but I will come back tomorrow. Um, this is a lot, a lot to organize. So I'm, it's a uh, bravo to all of you. Well, let's go uh, to the, the last panel um, of the day of the, this Monday with uh, vocabulary and design of AI. What words and vocabularies are used to name artificial intelligence? And how do they reflect differences and in inequalities, South, North, race, gender, class, center, periphery, how to imagine imagine and verbalize new words and how does AI design reproduce also inequalities in class, gender, race, sexuality, and what, what are the future of the debates on AI ethics and how to design AI towards other futures? It's uh, only a few questions, a simple questions to you, uh, resolve <laughs> to us and <clears throat> And the moderator is Evelyn Matos, master's candidate in communication at the Unicinos University here in Brazil and a researcher at the DigiLabor Research Lab. She is a researcher of Fair Work Project in Brazil and histories of AI. Her research interests include gender, journalism and digital labor. Welcome Evelyn, the floor is yours. Welcome everyone. Uh, it's a big pleasure to be here with you, and uh, we are here with uh, with us Carla Vieira, Luke Stark, and Hanjit Singh. Uh, unfortunately, Mbakaki, who was planned to speak in this panel, had a personal problems and will not be able to attend. So, Carla Vieira is a master candidate in artificial intelligence and the under, uh, University of Sao Paulo software engineer and the Google developer, the developer expert in machine learning, co-founder of Perifa Code, the Brazilian initiative regarding per peripherals and the technology. She believes in technology as a tool for a social transformation and they has studied bias in artificial intelligence. So glad to be here with us, Carla. And uh, Luke Stark is assistant professor in the, the Faculty of Information and the Media Studies at the University of Western Ontario. He is researches ethical, historical, and the social impacts of the computational technologies like artificial intelligence. His part common book is Harding, Emotion, Histories of the Computing and the Human Feelings for Cybernetics up to AI. Hanjit Singh, postdoctoral scholar at the AI uh, on on the ground initiative of data and the society research institute he researches in intersection of, of data infrastructures global development and the public policy 
He is currently leading a research project and on and co collaborating on building a research community around mapping the conception, vocabularies, and the sites of AI in the global south. Well, I'm going to ask some questions and the latter, I will take questions from the chat. Everyone who is watching at home, during the presentation, put your questions in the chat, please. So to start off, could you talk about what words and the vocabularies are using in artificial intelligence? And how do these words reflect the differences in inequalities between global south and northern race, gender, class, center, and the periphery? Uh, each speaker has 50 minutes, and I will let you know when the time is up. Can you start with you, Carla Vieira? Sure. Thanks, everyone, for being here today to listen to us talk and share more about our knowledge. <laughs> Seems weird to have a lot of people wanting to, uh, to hear us. So I have speaker notes, so I don't, so I have to follow a track. So I will start sharing my experience. So I believe it's hard to think of a research area that is going to change the world and it's changing so much as artificial intelligence will in the decades ahead. This immense potential of a machine solving problems better and quicker than humans has always intrigued me during artificial intelligence classes in grad school and eventually tempted me to study and understand its underlying patterns and algorithms. But during my studies, I started reading Karen House MIT Technology Review articles, and I discovered while AI has led to some social good, it has also demonstrated its potential to be misused and cause certain groups of people to be harmed rather than advantaged by it, as we discussed in the last panel. For some other people, AI means something like an entity that has superhuman intelligence or something like that. I apologize for the noise of my neighbor. I hope it's not uh, getting the, the middle of my talk. I hope you can hear well. And that's not necessarily how I define it. I don't like to think of artificial intelligence as an entity. I like more to think and define it as augmenting capabilities of machines that would help them understand better our world. So how can we see, how we can help machines to see, to talk, to interact with humans and do our tasks. tasks. Actually, there is a lot of discussion around AI terms and definitions. This month, Karen Howe posted a new article entitled Big Tech's Guide to Talking About AI Ethics. I strongly recommend you read. I, use, I will be sending the link in the chat. Uh, and it's, it's a really nice article and it's a really interesting and shows us how is the debates of vocabulary are working inside big corporate companies of technology. So algorithms are being used all the time to make decisions about who we are and what we want. But AI, as we know, is, isn't just being used to make decisions about what products we, are, we want to buy or which show we want to watch next on Netflix. Complex and social political challenges are being automated as mathematical problems. And as humans are the ones who train, deploy, and often use the predictions of machine learning models in the real world, it's important for us to be able to trust the model. A user's trust is directly impacted by how much they can understand and predict the model's behavior, as opposed to treating it as a black box. We can think of an explanation as an interpretive model that approximates the behavior of a complex model, Explanations of this type allow, us, allow users to understand why a certain conclusion or recommendation is made. The good news is that we have made great strides in some areas of explainable AI that I, I've been researching. Research on algorithm justice shows how machine learning automates and perpetuates historical, often unjust and discriminatory patterns. The bad news is that creating explainable AI is not easy and simple as related in medium articles. Despite the interest of interpretability, there is little consensus on what an interpretable machine learning is and how it should be evaluated. 
Besides that, the more socially complex a problem is, the more difficult it is for machine learning systems to accurately make predictions. And most of current researchers are not examining the wider picture, such as unquestioned assumptions in the field, current and historical injustice, and how AI shifts power. Fields of computing and data science are dominated by privileged groups of mainly elite cisgender white men, which means that most of the knowledge that is being produced is reduced to the perspective, interests, and concerns of such a dominant group. So, if you really want to use technology as a tool to mitigate bias, whatever it means, because it have a, has a lot of different meanings for every article, university, and company, and create trustworthy AI systems. We need to have in mind that individuals and communities that are the margins of society are disproportionately impacted by these systems. This means that simply creating a fairness metric for an existing system cannot be enough. Rather, we have to question what the system is doing and understand its consequences. Addressing bias and fairness in a data set or a black box model is a tiny band-aid, as Abeba Bihan said, for a much larger problem. As a researcher, I had to shift from the idea of technology being our savior to understand its limitations and recognize the rele relevance and importance of social and ethical values for the evaluation of explainable AI methods. During my master's, I have tried to find other researchers and colleagues to discuss the social impacts of AI. I think this panel is a good opportunity for that as well. I have been studying the colonization and sociological theories and their importance to understanding facial recognition technology impacts in Brazil. And I believe that's the path we have to follow, get more, more terms and vocabulary and ideas from other areas so we can adapt to our area area. We need people who can solve problems, we need people who face different challenges, and we need people who can tell us what are the real issues that need fixing and help us find ways that technology can actually fix them and not making them worse. Given this, it's appropriate to reflect on the need to reimagine artificial intelligence through ethical and the colonial foresight and diverse intellectual perspectives, avoiding discrimination and violation of fundamental rights. I believe that's the path we have to follow to actually build trustworthy AI systems and not only technological band-aids. I really like this term of Abba Bihan's work because it represents how I feel sometimes. Can, can computation really help to make the world better? Are we making the world worse? Am I being um, too much ambitious and about thinking that AI problems so social problems can be solved with AI as well, with computer science, so we have to look for other tools, other vocabularies from other areas. So that's why I wanted to share with you. I will send the links I mentioned in the chat. Thank you, Carla. And it looks like, could you answer? Uh, Sure. Would you would you like me to to do my fifteen minutes, or would you, would you like me to address directly what Carla was saying? Um, okay. Well, I'll yeah. So I'll go next. Um, so um, uh, this is a it's a, a pleasure to be here. I'm I'm really thrilled to be um, in such good company, um, both in this panel and in the rest of, of this this fantastic uh, seminar. Um, thank you to uh, DigiLabor and to the uh, Cambridge Sawyer Seminar for inviting me and for putting all the additional work in. Um, I'd also like to um, note that uh, the land on which I'm speaking to you from uh, here at, in London, Ontario, uh, is located on the traditional lands of the Anishinaabek, the Haudenosaunee, the Lenapewak and the Attawandran First Nations peoples on lands connected with the London Township and Sombra Treaties of 1796 and the Dish with One Spoon Covenant Wampum. Um, I respect the longstanding relationships that Indigenous people have with this land as its ritual caretakers, and I acknowledge the historical and ongoing injustices that Indigenous peoples in Canada, including First Nations people Métis and Inuit, endure. Um, and I ask that we recognize the painful history of genocide and forced removal from this territory honoring and respecting the, the indigenous communities still living on and connected to this land 
by striving for restorative justice for indigenous peoples, for those who have been marginalized and oppressed. And, and that certainly includes many, many um, folks in the context of the deployment of AI technologies um, and their predecessors, both, both today and uh, historically. Um, so today I'm going to talk a little bit uh, about um, work, recent work that I published with um, a co-author, uh, Dr. Jesse Hoey, at the University of Waterloo here in Ontario, um, on looking at the, the ethics of uh, and ethics and definitions of emotion in artificial intelligence systems, which is one of the one of the things that I work on, um, as um, uh, as everyone mentioned, my my book project is on this topic. Um, on the history of how emotion has been understood, categorized, and classified by computer science, and, and particularly by, by artificial intelligence researchers. Um, and um, I agree very much, first of all, um, with, uh, with Carla, with you, Carla, that, um, that uh, the discourse around um, AI and AI systems is often really um, too connected to science fiction and speculative fiction, right? And, if we think about science fiction and speculative fiction in film or in TV, um, you know, these are often stories about the emotional lives of artificial beings. You know, we can think of uh, Hal, the um, insane computer from 2001 A Space Odyssey, uh, as an example. Um, but uh, of course, uh, here in the real world, um, so called artificial emotional intelligence has become um, a major growth industry over the last five years and um, has prompted a lot of interest from a variety of sectors, including um, the automobile industry, uh, marketing and advertising, um, education, security, and, and many other um, areas where it, it seems convenient and helpful for AI systems to, uh, to detect and do analyses on human emotion. Um, and while, um, you know, while there's been a lot of interest in, in this topic uh, from companies, increasing interest, and also in the press, um, there's been less um, what less work looking at the historical kind of roots of, of these these technologies and the um, the kind of potential ethical and social implications of these technologies um, and of course they go they go tightly together so um, what I'll do today is run through um, what uh, my co-author Jesse Jesse Hoey and I have identified as sort of the three main models or so definitional models for emotion and how those different models get applied unequally in AI systems, and, and then some of the ethical and societal implications for that unequal application. So the first thing to say, right, would be that um, emotions are, uh, you know, are, are, as we all know, are complicated. We all have, um, we all have emotions, and, and we all know that they can be uh, confounding even to the most rational person. And um, you know, philosophers of emotion talk about this 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 challenge as uh, what's called the problem of parts, right? So so emotions have a variety of different components, right? They they have physiological, you know, embodied components, expressive components, behavioral components, mental components, and um, it's not totally clear always which of these parts of of, of these facets of emotion um, are most salient or most important in any particular context. Um, and a, a second problem follows from this problem of parts, which, uh, which is called the problem of plenty, right? So if we agree that there are these multiple different uh, components of emotion, these different facets of emotion, how do, they, how do these components work together you know, in, in, in everyday life, in practice? And for the purposes of artificial intelligence, which of these facets of, uh, which of these components of emotion is, is being, um, is being uh, converted into data about emotional, emotional expression? So there are sort of three uh, main uh, traditions in how, you know, in the kind of the kind of history of effective science, the philosophy of emotion, you know, emotion more broadly that um, we can talk about. The, the first one, which, which isn't, um, uh, is at, well, the first one, which is in some, some ways the most important one for our purposes uh, in AI is the idea of treating emotions as motivating, as motivational factors. Um, and um, this goes actually goes back uh, as far uh, to, to um, some of the work, work by Charles Darwin, um, looking at the, the kind of way in which emotions are expressed by humans and by animals. Um, but it, it really centers and, and gets its impetus from work in the 1950s and 1960s, um, first by the Princeton psychologist Sylvan Tompkins, and later by the, uh, his student, uh, the 
um, the psychologist uh, Paul Ekman, uh, uh, whose work was um, looked for what we would call basic emotions. Uh, and he developed this idea of basic emotion theory, um, which is the idea that all humans around the world um, have a, a set of universally recognizable uh, emotions that that they that basically it's you know all humans express those emotions in, in, in similar ways so that you know it should be able to be, be legible across cultures and um, that uh, a trained observer um, could uh, could tell somebody's motivating emotion um, even if they were trying to cover it up and it's it's important, especially in the context of this this discussion um, of, around uh, questions of, of defining emotions, and especially defining emotions in the context of inequalities across the global north and global south, right? Is that is that Ekman's, Ekman, you know, developed this theory through um, through experiments um, in various parts of the world, including in Japan and in Papua New Guinea, and and did so in in, in a way, you know, his his his, his claim was by um, by engaging with uh, populations that that were unused to seeing um, Western displays of emotion, you know, he he thought that um, finding evidence for for this basic emotion theory among those populations, you know, could, could control for the the um, the the kind of cultural specific, specificity of emotion. And he claimed that he found that. Although um, one of the one of the, the interesting and, and distressing points about basic emotion theory is that a number of, of historians and, and uh, psychologists since its its development have um, have really called it into question. Right? Um, historians have pointed to uh, methodological problems with his with initial experiments. You know, claims um, that uh, that he makes that, that don't really bear up by the evidence he collected. And you know, uh, in a recent um, in a recent meta review of um, this basic emotion theory work, um, a number of psychologists, including Lisa Feldman Barrett, um, a prominent critic of basic emotion theory, really pointed to how little uh, scientific backing there is for this motivational idea. Um, the other kind of kind of main tradition of uh, thinking about of def defining or understanding emotion is. Understanding emotions as, as kind of evaluations, right, as part of a broader set of judgments that human human beings make, um, and uh, this, um, you know, this there there are various flavors of this this idea, um, but what it suggests is that um, you know you know emotions are sort of sort of have, have have signal functions for you know humans within their broader cultural context and 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 uh, and, um, and environment. So, so you know, it, 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 in some ways, right? This is in some ways the, the, the opposite of, of emotions as motivating, right? Instead of emotions as motivating behavior, emotions are signals to reflect on and, and, and think about one's behavior or one's one's kind of attitude towards the world. So, um, as you probably all know by this point. Um, you know, there are not only different models of how to understand emotion, but there's an awful lot of different kinds of data that uh, can be de developed to, um, to uh, or can be collected um, to use as, as proxy for um, understanding human emotive expression, right? What, one of the challenges with emotions, of course, is that they're entire, they're partially subjective, right? You know, we often can, you know, we can't, we, we don't always reveal uh, exactly how we're feeling. And so it comes to all sorts of different kinds of data um, that we emit when we emote, right? When we express emotions, um, which is of interest to artificial intelligence developers. And that data could be physiological, right? So heart rate or blood flow, obviously the movements of the face or in, when we're talking about facial recognition technology, um, you know, behavioral data, um, uh, graphic data. So, so one, of the, one of the great examples of this would be Facebook emotion uh, reaction icons, right? Which you'll see, you'll have seen on Facebook, those little faces that you can click on. Um, or semantic data, text data, right? The sentiment analysis is a big, a big part of this, of this um, collection of these, of these technologies. And so, in the recent paper that Dr. Huey and I uh, have, have have published, um, we sort of map these different uh, definitions of emotion to the different kinds of, of data that um, uh, that can be collected uh, as, as a proxy for emotional expression. And, and um, the, 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 maybe the most important takeaway right now, right, is this motivational uh, tradition, right? This tradition of understanding emotions as motivating factors grounded in this basic emotion theory is, is by far the most common um, tradition underpinning all these various AI, um, AI emotion technologies. It, it certainly underpins facial recognition, 
um, things like uh, automated uh, voice analysis, you know, analyzing emotion in the voice, uh, and many others. And, and so from this taxonomy, what we do is think a little bit about the kind of ethical and social implications of, of you know, this, these, this emotion, these emotion tracking and emotion recognition technologies based on the, you know, the kinds of models behind each particular technology. And I think one of the, one of the first things to, to, to say, right, is um, how much emotion, um, you know, how much emotions end up playing a big role in, in normative judgments, um, even when we don't always think that they do, right? Um, you know, it, it, it really matters um, to, uh, uh, you know, judgment is, uh, you know, an important part of human emotion. It, 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 you know, it, it gets connected to all sorts of um, social and cultural norms. Uh, and yet we don't always think about that uh, when we're defining and designing AI systems. I think maybe uh, more specifically, I think we identify a lot of concerns about the, the kind of uh, implicit ethical and, and normative um, assumptions around basic emotion theory, right? Around this idea of emotion as motivation, right? And, and what those are, right, is, is first of all, this idea that emotion is universal, right? So um, it, there's, there's, a, there's no, no, no kind of uh, space for cultural specificity in, in that definition. And it also implies a kind of, you know, a kind of direct correspondence between um, the, the evidence being collected about expression and the interior state, right? And, and that can be a real problem when these systems are used in, in contexts like the justice system, immigration, or education. Right when um, when you know when when authority and power are are looking for evidence of of some interior state often you know around punishment or culpability or guilt right um, worse right the, the research has shown that these kind of these kind of emotion recognition systems um, are also biased in the ways that um, many facial recognition technology systems are biased so um, much like all other facial recognition technologies they don't work as well on on black faces for instance. Um, and so, for all these reasons, right? Basic emotion theory, um, you know, you know, has has shaky scientific foundations, and it, you know, it, 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 even those shaky scientific foundations really can't live up to the kind of claims that that uh, boosters of this technology are making about about what what kinds of of evidence it can and kinds of truth it can collect um, uh, in the real world. We also have a lot of concerns about emotion as um, something that's being experimented on, you know, in the development of um, AI systems and other digital media platforms that, you know, like Facebook, um, you know, that emotions are an important part of our, our core um, sense of self, sense of individuality, and um, you know, having them manipulated and, and having them, um, uh, you know, uh, experimented on by various actors, including uh, social media platforms and, of course, the people who buy ads on social media platforms or, uh, you know, other AI systems. That's also a big problem. Um, and finally, I think all, all of these, this evidence suggests that, you know, there's, there's such a lack of consensus around you know, the, what Look, emotions are. Oh, yeah, I'm almost done. Sorry, sorry, okay. but he, you have one more, more minute. Perfect. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, I will. I will wrap up right now. So there's the, there's such a lack of consensus about what emotions are, um, and that that really you know this is one form of technology that that that, that just seems to be um, uh, you know can't be implemented within within the broader space of AI technologies safely or effectively. And so I think you know my personal preferences would be for uh, you know a kind of a ban on the development of these kinds of technologies. So that's all stop there. Um, uh, there's lots more to say about emotion, and but uh, I look forward to the conversation. Thank you. Thanks so much, Loki. And Hanjiti, uh, do you want to answer? Thank you uh, so much for inviting me to this panel. Uh, so broadly, let me just say that, you know, uh, I work on mapping the conceptual vocabulary of AI in the global south, and that, basically is really broad in every sense of the word. So, you know, uh, <clears throat> partly the challenge here is, of course, uh, thinking about what does it mean to actually think about AI systems. That's one part of the way in which you can expand the, the vocabulary of what are we thinking about and what, what does it mean to actually talk about a diverse set of AI systems being employed in a, a diverse set of sectors 
that all together to a certain extent map onto certain kinds of consequences in the world. And then of course, what does it mean to actually talk about global south, which again is a broad concept which implies uh, quite a few different countries, quite a few different situations, quite a few uh, different communities uh, as a way of thinking about what are the consequences of these systems for these, uh, for these communities, for these people. So in a way, what I'm going to do today is to basically step back and invite all of you to step back with me uh, in thinking about what do concepts do? And then uh, as we kind of start thinking about what are the, uh, you know, how do we actually deal with concepts and ideas and, you know, from our own analyst position, uh, we will then start thinking about uh, what, is the, what is the useful way of thinking about how do we apply these ideas and concepts that we develop through our work onto the kinds of things that we experience in the world. So <clears throat> I'm going to take, uh, you know, these 15, you know, 15 minutes that I have in order to, uh, to talk about a couple of ideas uh, around, you know, the idea of the exercise of building conceptual vocabulary in and of itself. And I'm going to start with uh, my first point, which is uh, that concepts have functions, right? Uh, to put it very basically, uh, a concept is supposed to allow you to start thinking about a particular reality, whether it is social, whether it is economic, whether it is, uh, you know, something that is observable in the world into a particular way in which, by which you can talk about it, right? So it's a, it's an act of translation. And if you think about it in terms of AI, what is, what do these systems actually do? What they do is that they fundamentally capture data of something which is real into bits and bytes. So, you know, there's one kind of translation of converting a real phenomena into a digital phenomena. And then the second act of a uh, second order of translation that these systems do is to translate that digital phenomena into a real set of consequences for a particular set of people, right? So there, is, there is an ongoing set of translations that are happening that we constantly think about and think with in order to make sense of the, this life that you know, we have as it unfolds in, in the context of data-driven systems. So the first thing to keep in mind uh, is to basically think about what function does the concept that you're actually working with have and what does it allow you to talk about? Because concepts fundamentally are words and when words are used, uh, they have meanings that can basically shape and move in a variety of different directions. So for example, uh, Carla in her talk caught, talked about this idea of misuse of technology, right? And there is a, there is a variety of ways in which we can think about misuse. Uh, and it kind of falls on a spectrum where certain kinds of misuse are kind of unintended by the designers, but are actually interesting uses and, you know, are often, you know, taken on by specific communities in order to achieve certain functions. So in that particular moment, is this really a misuse of that technology or is it just a, something that was not un, uh, intentional from the, uh, from the perspective of the design, but at the same time allows us to think about certain kinds of uses of these technologies in, uh, in contexts that were basically uh, not imagined by the designers themselves. Now, the second argument that I would make about concepts is that they center standpoints. Uh, Concepts often emerge in the context of your own positionality, they are situated. And we cannot articulate, and we should not be articulating concepts without actually articulating our own positionality or where we are coming from when it comes to talking about these ideas, right? So in that particular sense, I think, you know, uh, when we talk about, you know, these particular conception of, for example, technology as a savior, vis-a-vis, uh, -vis, uh, if we go back to the panel that happened previously, technology as a colonizer, there are two very distinct perspectives on what technologies can actually do and what they can basically achieve in the world. But at the same time, they kind of fall on a particular spectrum of standpoints that allow us to say something about the human condition that is currently emerging because of the fact that, that these technologies are increasingly becoming a part of everyday life, right? And finally, uh, borrowing on Luke Stark's work, I think I would just say that, you know, concepts also have emotions. So uh, in a way, for example, uh, you know, when we talk about uh, AI in the global South, it spans across this particular emotional, uh, you know, exuberance of leapfrogging and digital transformation of societies through 
the use of these digital technologies on one end of the spectrum to the other end of the spectrum, which is kind of focused on, uh, you know, the ways in which these technologies can be extractive and uh, the forms of colonialism that they actually uh, end up manifesting in the world, right? So that's the third point that I would like to make that concepts have emotions. Now, keeping these three things in mind, concepts have functions, concepts have standpoints, and concepts have emotions. I would like to invite all of you to think about one idea, one concept that you often work with in your own research and your scholarship, and try to actually think about what emotion does it portray? What function does it serve? And what is the standpoint from which you actually come about, think about uh, the concept that you're working with? And I'm going to give you two minutes to basically work this out for yourself. And I'm going to wait for you. So thank you for, thank you. I, I'm not done yet. Uh, you know, it's an exercise, <laughs> sorry. So it's an exercise, I'm inviting you to actually work out for yourself. What concept do you work with? What is its function? What is the emotion that it expresses? And what is the standpoint from which you actually use that concept? And once you're done, I invite you to basically write it out uh, or, you know, uh, send a chat message where you can actually, uh, you know, share it with all of us uh, as a way of thinking about what these concepts do for you and why does it allow you to think about certain phenomena in the world. And once you have thought through it, now I would invite you to actually come with me to a journey of a story in which some of these ideas would come together for you it's quite possible that you know this story that I'm going to tell you doesn't actually match at all with the uh, you know uh, with uh, with the uh, with, with the concept that you have in mind. But at the same time, for some of us, it will it will match quite nicely, and that to a certain extent tells us how to a certain extent the experience of uh, how these stories that we actually encounter in our everyday lives then map onto the kind of concepts that we use to describe them. So uh, very quickly, I'm going to tell you the story of. Morris. And uh, Morris is a, uh, so, and Morris is an artist who has a variable income. And, you know, he has been trying to, you know, it's a, he, he was a part of one of the research that I was conducting on credit scores. And uh, he was trying to, uh, you know, I was following him as he was trying to improve his uh, subpar credit score over a span of a year. What interestingly happens during this time is that, uh, you know, he was looking for uh, a new apartment because his partner had uh, recently gotten pregnant and they were looking for a new place to live. And it is at this mo moment that he also realizes that his partner actually has a score which is worse than him and it is uh, in his mid 400s. So as his partner and they both try to look for a particular uh, house uh, where they, uh, so that they could have more space to raise their child, they go to a place and to look for an apartment. And they basically, you know, this is the response that Morris gave me when it comes to thinking about, uh, you know, <clears throat> uh, his, uh, his credit scores. He said, we were looking for an apartment. We were searching for something bigger. We found something we really liked. It was a three bedroom house. We went to fill out an application. We got denied. And this is the moment when he had the first conversation with his partner about just credit. And even with us being together for over two years, we hadn't really had a direct conversation about this aspect of our finances. Now, if I stop at this moment and just talk about his uh, being his application being denied because of the fact that his credit score was uh, really poor and his partner's credit score was actually also poor, and basically tell you that you know, what how would you react to the story if Morris was African American, and how would you react to the story? Uh, of just the denial of his application, right? But the story continues and the story moves on. And as it moves on, uh, what Morris does is that he goes back to this apartment complex and starts basically talking to people over there. And he says, this is what my third attempt to reach out to this place. I went up there, I put on a shirt and a tie, and I said, I would like to speak to a property manager. I know we got denied on this computer, but I want to speak to a human. 
And I said, listen, my fiance, she loves this place. We have a baby on the way and this is where she wants to be. What can we do to make this possible for her? So here is a moment where an automated decision doesn't work for Morris. And he goes and starts talking to people, uh, uh, to, uh, talking to a human property manager to basically figure out what is the solution to this problem. And lo and behold, he's able to actually figure out a solution to this problem. Uh, he goes on and the property manager basically says, there's a loophole that we can do. I'm not sure if it'll work, but I'm not, uh, and I'm not sure where your credit is. I said, my credit is fine. It's not the best, but it's fine. So he said, there's a loophole. We'll put you in and pending your approval, we'll list your partner as a roommate on the lease. And within five minutes, he, was got, he had gotten uh, approved. Now, in the way in which I look at the story, I look at the story from the perspective of the individualized focus of the credit score in the context of you, know, you living with families. And to a certain extent, uh, Morris was finally able to rent their dream house, but this example also illustrates that uh, credit infrastructures focus on the individual, that in, when, when the credit uh, infrastructure focuses on the individual, it see, what it sees about a family is malleable, given the support of the creditor. So in order to resolve these problems of how data is representing you, at times the solution is how it can be made to represent you for successful outcomes. And that to a certain extent provides a very different story and a different standpoint and a different emotion to the way in which we think about the concepts that we use to describe uh, you know, injustice in the world and what needs to be done in order to resolve the forms of injustice that we see in the world. Now, this is a, is a story of success but there are multiple different stories of failure as well. And how we emote and how we react to these stories, from what standpoint do we come from and what function our stories are actually performing in the world are important to think about the kind of conceptual vocabulary that we build around AI. Whether it is in the global south or whether it is in, uh, uh, in the context of the whole entire world, what's important here is to think about where you're coming from and what kind of stories do you want to tell. Thank you. Thanks so much, Frank. Uh, well, well, uh, you have uh, two questions for Luke. Is how how do you deal with the look, the life of science research on emotions and the confused idea of passionality that sorry sounds emotions. You, I can hear you. Sorry, class, classic, classic move of the pandemic, being on mute. Um, I, um, first of all, I'll, I'll just say, I mean, I'll, I can, I can touch on this, I guess, but I, I'd love other the other folks on the panel to jump in if they are, they're interested, and I think, um, maybe it connects especially to some of the things, uh, Ranjit, you just said. Um, there hasn't been a lack of scientific research on emotion. Um, I wouldn't want to give that impression. There's been an awful lot of research on emotion from every every which way. Um, it's it's more that um, because emotions are so multifaceted and, and they're and they're so meaningful in different contexts, um, scientific research on emotion, you know, will only will will necessarily only get you part of the way in terms of understanding understanding you know emotion as as a as a phenomenon as a as a concept right in in different parts of of life um and so i think i think that's one you know one of the things that makes emotion so interesting but i also think it's it's also what um gives it th this this power right which which um Aranjit was talking about um and i but i think i think so i think the story around emotion and computing is um, a, a real desire, uh, and this goes actually goes long before computing. There's been great historical work um, by the um, by the historian of medicine Neil Drawer that talks about this in the context of, of 19th century and early 20th century physiology. But but the desire by by scientists to find um, you know that one proxy variable that can stand in for various reasons for the entirety of human emotional experience. Um, and usually that proxy variable involves some sort of number, right? So it involves a, a, physio a physiological number, um, you know, like blood, blood flow or something like that. So, so I guess the, 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 the long, long story short, um, I think um, 
I think it's a mistake to only think about emotion as a scientific concept, but I think the fact that that um, AI researchers often do think of emotion as a kind of solely through its scientific facets is part of the big problem with 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 these emotion technologies. Thank you. Uh, we if another questions is how can you create a partner the, to recognize emotions and at the same time consider that the different cultural aspects of each language. Yeah, I, I don't have a good answer for this, and I and I wonder. I might I might turn this over to my other panelists if they if they're interested. You know, to if you have in talking about um, the kind this, the kind of the kind of you know diversity of 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 um, of social expressions of emotion, um, because I my my sense is that um, one of the one one quite understudied topic at the moment is the homogenizing force of something like Facebook reaction icons as a kind of kind of you know metric of emotional expression um, that that's produced you know designed and produced in the United States right but on, on this particular theory of emotion that doesn't really actually even have a lot of water right so I, I, I Ackman's work directly informed Facebook's basic reaction emotions right but then it, but then this this form of emotion this form of emotional expression is, is then you know the one form that you get in you know if you're using Facebook anywhere else in the world so uh, that seems to be, you know, a, a topic of, of, of that requires some thinking. And I, I mean, I, I have, I'd love to see more work on that on, on that topic. I guess um, just to build on that, I would say that you know, one of the classic examples of when at the first time I encountered this uh, idea of homogenization of emotions was uh, in a podcast, which was kind of focused on the introduction of McDonald's in Russia, and. Uh, the, the specific thing that was at stake there was that uh, McDonald's expected its service professionals to smile at people before they actually deliver burgers to them. But at the same time in Russia, smiling was considered not a very usual reaction to getting service. And that to a certain extent became a huge challenge for Russians to basically think about smiling as a, uh, you know, and you know, associating trust uh, with smiles, uh, which in itself to a certain extent points to the difference in the ways in which we actually rationalize what it means when somebody is smiling at you uh, in one way or the other. So, you know, uh, this particular conception of how we think about uh, emotions and the different contexts in which emotions kind of have different meanings is an important aspect of thinking not only about emotional research per se, but also about uh, the ways in which we rationalize some of the developments with AI as, as they would emerge in different parts of the world and uh, then get to be experienced uh, in one way or the other. And, and really quickly, let me, if I just, that's a great, a great insight. And, and um, right, I mean, the, 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 the kind of homogenization of, this is what early Russell Hochschild, the sociologist calls emotional labor, right? This idea of, of performing labor in some way, performing emotions in some way for a wage, right? Um, that's a great example of that. Uh, right, it, it long pre, it predates AI. I mean, it, 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 I mean in, in a lot of ways, you know, a lot of the things we're talking about in terms of around AI, the problems with AI and automation, you know, around labor and around, around uh, how much cultural, cultural homogeneity and all sorts of things, you know, AI is, just, is the latest symptom. And in some ways, the fact that it's drawing attention to those problems is, is like a, the, 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 one of the few silver linings. These problems have been around for a long time. And that, and that and that AI, you know, we, we can come at them through AI, we can kind of, you know, it, it, it gets a little more attention maybe than some of the research previously. But um, uh, yeah, that's a, that's a great example. Um, uh, I, and, and, and the other thing to say just quickly is, right, it, it are the ways that human machine, um, you know, it, you know the, the interaction of human and machines in, in these contexts, especially around labor, um, you know, are, are not always very simple or not very, always very clear. So I'm thinking here, especially of the work of a great anthropologist, Winifred Poster at Washington University of St. Louis, who, who talks about, she works on call center workers, um, both in the Caribbean and in India. 
And the way that the various AI technologies are being used to do things like change the accent of the call center worker on the phone, right? So you have, you know, you have, you, so, so, so the, the American person who's being called feels comfortable with, a, with a, somebody with a quote unquote American accent, right? So, so and, and these are, this is, this is these, all these kind of, you know, these kind of fusions and, and assistive questions that really, um, really trouble, yeah, we have trouble these questions about labor in lots of ways. I just like to add that I really like the, the path we are following about using emotionals, using artificial intelligence to recognize emotions, for example, because many people who are starting on the field think like, oh, we have a problem because artificial intelligence is not good enough on detecting emotions and, and it's being biased and we, have, we can solve it by giving more data. And here we are talking more maybe that's not the solution maybe that's not the path we have to think gave uh, one step back and think how we can use artificial intelligence do we want to use artificial intelligence for to recognize emotion what is the uh, consequence what are the pros and cons of that so i i just say i really like this uh, the talk here being like in this direction can can i ask a question of of Ranjit a little bit well or to, to, to ask so I, I know that um, data and society and AI now are, are co-sponsoring this this uh, lexicon of global south AI terms is that right? could you talk more about that and 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 I think it fits really nicely into this question of the standpoints from which concepts are developed and thought about sure um, it's, if, if, it's a larger project uh, which is kind of dedicated towards uh, thinking through what does it mean to actually build uh, a lexicon of concepts that kind of speak to some of these experiences uh, of AI uh, in the global south? Uh, one part of it is being done by Amba, and unfortunately she's not here. Uh, Amba and Nupur at AI Now Institution are basically building, are, are inviting blog, uh, you know, blog posts on uh, the lexicon of, uh, the emerging lexicon of AI as it's being researched by researchers across the world. Um, uh, their focus is primarily centered on uh, ideas and concepts, uh, you know, reimagining what would fairness, transparency, accountability would look like uh, we, when we start thinking about AI and the Global South. Uh, but beyond that, it's also how do uh, Global South scholars actually describe these experiences and what does it mean to actually think about data colonialism, and data extractivism, et cetera. To some extent, uh, <clears throat> Part of the work here is about figuring out what are these core concepts and core ideas that allow us to think about the experience of these technologies. One of the things in which I kind of find uh, my research to be progressing into is that you know, often when it comes to Global North discourses around AI, we often imagine uh, machine learning systems and data-driven uh, technologies uh, to be tools which are basically used in order to basically do certain things in the world. Uh, in my experience, the way in which Global South scholars speak about uh, these systems is through experiences uh, in a way of how this particular technology is experienced in the world and how do people actually ha now have to live with it one way or the other. And that distinction is a is useful one for me in order to organize my own work in terms of thinking about what do these concepts mean and how do these concepts actually uh, reflect on everyday experiences of living with data um, and AI systems. Um, so in that context, one of the things that, you know, I am pushing research into is exploration of the stories that we tell uh, as, you know, uh, in, in the moment of producing ethnographic vignettes or in the moments of basically uh, being a practitioner who's thinking about these uh, technologies in the context of a particular place. And um, I've been doing a series of interviews with uh, experts in the field who kind of talk about their own research. And one of the, uh, one, one classic one that has stuck with me over time has been uh, the research of Zehra Hashmi, who's based out of Michigan and Arbor. And uh, she, uh, she works on Pakistan's uh, national identification system, the biometric based uh, system, which is called Nadra. And she talks about how to a certain extent this technology, uh, which is basically used in order to basically individually, individually uh, map people in the world, uh, people in Pakistan and basically determine their citizenship status is simultaneously of Pakistan. 
So uh, <clears throat> interestingly, the way in which ID documents are now shared across family is now increasingly determined by whether you know you can base uh, increasingly determined whether you can access a biometric ID on the Nadva system or not. Fundamentally, because if you are not related to anybody in the Nadra system, then you can easily be perceived as a threat because you know there is no familial relationship that you have in the, inside the country. And often this is used uh, by families as a threat during feuds, uh, as a way of ensuring you know, whether somebody has access to these ID documents as a way of basically uh, uh, presenting yourself to the state or not. Now, this is a beautiful instance of thinking about how an individualizing technology like biometrics can easily be used as a tool to think about family relationships and uh, you know, the way in which uh, you know, they intricately change the way in which the culture and uh, the social relationships around these technologies are kind of manifest. So uh, I'm currently focusing on what are these different stories that people tell about these technologies and where do they come from? And that's why my current organization of my presentation was also based on thinking about function, standpoint, and emotions as a way of organizing how we tell these stories and as a way of basically figuring out what are the different kinds of stories that we tell about people uh, and our research. And in that sense, you can think about it in terms of, you know, we as, as ethnographers, as people who research, who do qualitative research, we either tell stories of key informants as people, or we tell stories of events uh, as, uh, as an unfolding of a controversy as it happened over time, or we tell stories of places uh, and a classic example would be of how a smart city is kind of not only shapes what technologies are built in that particular city, but also how that city is fundamentally shaped by the technologies that are built there. So in a way, uh, you know, these three different organizing principles, uh, places, people, uh, and events, allow us to also then map through some of these stories that are emerging in the world on AI in the global south, and that allows us to then start thinking about what are the concepts that we use to describe these stories. So that was a very long winded answer, but you know, I was trying to just give a sense of how this uh, project is kind of coming together as of now. Thank you. That's that's and that was, that's an amazing. I, I could you could you put the name of the of that of that scholar in the chat? I'd love to I'd love to read that that paper. All right. You have uh, more questions for all of you. Uh, what what the theories may be used to expl explain social impacts of AI? Okay, I can start. I mentioned some. Oh, look, you can start as well. No, go ahead. Okay. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, so I've been looking for to some theories. Uh, one of them is critical race critical race theory because I, I have been working on facial recognition technology in Brazil and how it affects the black population here. Data decolonialism is another theory that is being changed to understand algorithm decolonialism. So it's another possibility. And critical theory of technology is a philosophy based uh, theory, but I think it's really important because it shows us, it invites us to rethink technology not only as an isolated event from society but as an event that happens in society and has impacts as well and how this uh, works together and see the wider picture so that's my short answer for that i don't i don't want to derail the question but i i would love to hear more carla at some point about the discourse around facial recognition in brazil and 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 how it intersects with with thinking about critical race theory and in, in, the, in the Brazilian context. Um, I've, I've I've you know I I think a lot about of, about facial recognition in the context of North America, but but I I I don't know very much about about how it's being rolled out in Brazil. So I'd love to hear more about that. Maybe now, maybe later. Just as a thought. I can I I think we I can share some now. We had some questions about that. I think as well. Uh, we can mentioned later. But Brazil has a lot of, it's based on colonialism, you are the last country to end slavery. So still today we have a lot of problems. One of the problems is that in the 
manual process, I can say, of incarceration and prison. We have a lot of problems with photo, using photos to detect and identify suspects of crimes. So a lot of stations and districts use photos of people to, oh, you are similar to these people, you should be arrested. And there are a lot of people wrongly arrested by this manual process. And in Brazil, the government has been trying to use facial recognition to automate this process and the idea is always uh, artificial intelligence can be better can improve the process and we know that's not how it really works because we are only automating inequalities and amplifying the impacts in brazil not all countries and cities have facial recognition technologies it's being tested in five states right now, but we have some reports from uh, some institutions in Brazil, like uh, it's Observatório das Redes, like networking observatory, and there are researchers in each state that use facial recognition technologies, uh, collecting data about how how many prisons happen in using this technology, how many wrong prisons happen. Uh, were black people wrongly arrested, that's the more common case, or there were white people wrongly arrested. In, in our case, we have more uh, black people wrongly arrested. So that's what we are facing right now. We are discussing, trying to alert people because there are not a common sense of society and population in Brazil that understand how these tools work. So we don't have the basics of how uh, our algorithms working of we don't have people informed enough to make the right questions and go question we don't want these like uh, black lives matter uh, have a, a really high impact in brazil this year that last year so the protests in the united states impacted a lot here in brazil we had a lot of protests on black lives matter discussed it because we didn't we also don't want facial rec uh, recognition technology using to arrest people protesting in their, for their rights. So we see that there is a connection between what happens in the United States and what happens in Brazil. Uh, we import a lot of technology from the United States and use in our context. And that's really bad for a lot of reasons, <laughs> as the previous panel discussed it and as you are mentioned right now. But that's the wider picture of what is happening in Brazil. It, it strikes me that, that that also ties Ranjit to what you were saying about leapfrogging, right? And the kind of the kind of, you know, oh, we can we can take take this, take this this technology kind of full full throttle and just plop it in in a way that that um, you know is, is very it can be advantageous to those in power, even more so than it may be in other places. That's what happens. <laughs> and you're fighting a lot to not to happen at all not even imported technology not even uh, brazilian technology as well we, we don't want this kind of technology but we have a hard and difficult path of informing people during this government that uh, also reinforces this kind of uh, technology so that's where we are thanks for the question it's always nice to uh, to share more about brazil and 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 the, the the hard path is is true everywhere. I mean, we have we have similar problems in Canada. We have problems in the United States. You have problems in in the UK and other parts of Europe. I mean, it's it's this is a this is a really a, a kind of global set of interlocking problems. Well, you have a, a question just just for Luke, but I believe it. Carla and Loki can can do response. Uh, why has it been so difficult to reach a consensus on the use of emotional artificial intelligence uh, when there are already more cri critical things like using fa fashion recognition to catch criminals at the airport? If you if it, even if the ethical discussions involved, for example. Yeah, I mean, I, I think if I if I understand this question, it, it, 
the I mean, I I think I think in some ways actually it it hasn't been hard for developers of these systems to reach consensus. They they have a model that they use. It's the model that works well in the computational context in as much as like it's the model of emotion that is tractable uh, for AI, right? Like it's like, you know, like everything, if everything, if, if you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. So if you have, have a, you have a, an AI system, everything looks like a number, right? And so you, you need to find the way of quantifying emotion. Well, basic emotion theory, especially in the Ekmanian, in the Ekman framework of facial analysis, it, it gives you a way of doing that. It, you know, it assigns numbers to different points of the face and it uh, equates different, different, configurations of the muscles on the face with particular emotions and that you can automate. Um, I mean, this is, but th and this is the, these, I mean, this, this conversation now about emotion AI and the content and the facial recognition is just the latest in a, in a longer story about, um, you know, not just involving Ekman and Ekman's use in things like law enforcement, right? So before, before um, these AI systems were developed. You know, Ekman was Ekman's Ekman uh, Ekman's theory was being was being used in in, in things like law enforcement uh, or or criminal justice with human you know, human coders that you train somebody to look at the muscles of the face and see how they moved around. Um, so it goes it goes way back before um, you know deep learning and, and all this data, um, and it goes back to this desire that to for a kind of certainty about the truth of the individual. Um, as read by the external observer, and and that that desire uh, to find tr certainty about the truth of the individual as read by the uh, external observer is totally tied to the history of of how techno science has been used to um, you know used to to exert power uh, it, it, both in both in domestic contexts in Europe and North America and in the global context, right? So so you know the the um, you know, there's, you can you can trace the lineage very clearly back to uh, back to work in phrenology and physiognomy of, of the 19th and early 20th centuries, mm -hmm. right? Creating racial hierarchies based on on these kind of spurious scientific theories, um, including around emotion, including around who who is more likely to be emotional, who is more likely to be emotionally plastic or not emotionally plastic. Um, so the long the long the long answer there is is that. It's there's a there's a continue it's all a continuum and and um, just to, to to quickly you know to 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 answer another question just really quickly here about this there's a question in the chat about emotion giving you know promising a kind of more hu humanistic or human technology and I think that's right that often um, you know you know there, there there's this idea that emotions are in some way more more human right which 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 I guess it gets equated to more um, more social or more, you know, makes the technology seem less scary or, you know, more approachable. But of course, emotion can also be, um, you know, uh, going back to, to Ranjit's example of emotional labor, emo emotions themselves can be, can be, uh, can be captured by, by systems of power, you know, can be captured by capitalism, can be captured by imperial, you know, or, or post-imperial kind of, kind of violence. So I wouldn't. I would be very be very wary of equating emotion with something more humanist or more more fuzzy. Don't don't do that. Just to quickly add to this, I think uh, you know there are two points that I would make. I like to make. One is uh, I think it depends on how we are defining what uh, what consensus is. Uh, so for example, facial recognition technologies are used. We use them on an everyday basis if we have a smartphone. Right, it works. You know, uh, it's a way of authenticating your identity. It's a way of accessing a device that you use on an everyday basis. Is there consensus on this? I think more or less everyone who kind of has access to a smartphone kind of now uses a facial recognition technology to actually work with it. Um, but at the same time, using it for uh, tracking recidivism, using it for tracking, uh, you know, uh, somebody uh, in uh, who's protesting, uh, which have which kind of consequences for chilling First Amendment rights, for example, in the United States, that's a completely different story altogether. So what are we trying to basically use uh, an emotional, an emotionally intelligent machine for is, is, a, is a deeply problematic and conceptual uh, question 
which kind of also comes about in the context of you know one of the stories that you know uh, that we all might have heard of in terms of an ethical debate on this issue was the contagion study that was done by facebook where it kind of changed uh, you know the news feed that you're uh, getting depending on the emotions that you know uh, that the news feed itself expressed and it kind of noted that you know within a particular duration of time people who were re receiving depressing news feeds were themselves depressed because of it while simultaneously people who were receiving happier news feeds felt happier now that to a certain extent comes into a very ethically gray zone of basically manipulating people at a level where you know you're trying to basically change what they're actually experiencing on an everyday basis based on and what kind of emotions are you know uh, are uh, you know exposed to on an everyday basis on the industry and that to a certain extent brings me to the other part of the equation where you know one of the things that luke was mentioning was this idea that uh, you know uh, the question is fundamentally about whether machines that emote are more human and that to a certain extent lends itself into this larger older question about whether we want machines to be as intelligent as human or we just want them to perform as if they are expressing uh, or doing a performance of an emotion and uh, you know in the history of ai technologies i think there has been a significant shift where a uh, shift where you know this particular imagination of a generalist intelligence uh, that machines would be able to behave and think like humans has moved away and we have moved away from it to the performance of being human as a as a as a useful way of basically overcoming that challenge but at the same time uh, being able to display to some extent uh, competence in expressing emotions and that to a certain extent changes the dynamics and the contours of how we are talking about these technologies and what they mean in a way uh, and you know it's again important to important think about that you know when we are talking about something being humane it's not just about the performance of it it's also about you know at a fundamental level feeling it uh, and that to a certain extent is you know something that will take years and years to develop over time in a way but i and i will i will just say that that the if you look back into the Right. I mean, Ranjit, you're right, right on. And but back into the kind of the 1950s and 60s history of, you know, the early work on AI and cybernetics and all these kind of what seems kind of kooky at the moment, right? There is this real, there's a there's a real uh God complex thing going on with a lot of male male computer scientists kind of kind of working through the, the process of cre creating the artificial being, including emotion. In a very weird way. So, so I, I, and I think that, and I think that, you know, it's, it's, there's, there, that's, a, that's a, a thread that, that works through. And I mean, you could, you could do it. Actually, probably, maybe somebody has done this, but a, a study of the, 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 you know, the assigned gender of the artificial agent, right? Which goes back and forth. And, and now the, the kind of annoying one we have today is Sophia, you know, this, this, this android that gets trotted out every once in a while. Um, in interesting ways that have interesting kind of kind of geopolitical or, or kind of post-colonial implications, right? So she she has citizenship in Saudi Arabia, a country right country where women have very few rights. But but the Sophia the robot has citizenship anyway. It's really a that's a that's a whole other 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 story. Totally. Look, I I was going to to talk about this God complex. I have it has a lot of to to related to. Meredith Broussard's concepts of techno chauvinism. So I believe that's a really big problem in our in many areas. But computer science had a lot of uh, researchers thinking about solving all of society problems using artificial intelligence. The famous AI for social good, AI to uh, whatever AI for social good is the most most common term of that. But that's totally what you said. That happens a lot, unfortunately. Right. Uh, we have another question for all of you. Uh, in the context of te textual pro production, production made by AI with journalism of even workers of fiction, how do how to think? about the issues rela related to right, writers and the responsibilities, especially in the production 
of a hate speech. Can be who went start? I think there is, um, I think there are two parts to this question. One is, of course, you know, um, what does AI do with text, right? Um, and there are clearly ways by which there are these new artistic ways of creating and expressing, which can rely on machine learning and clustering and topic modeling as a way of then organizing text as well as then, you know, can a machine write like Shakespeare, for example, uh, is, uh, is an ongoing question. And, you know, there are ways by which you can basically have a lot of artists who are kind of experimenting with these technologies and basically making ways by which uh, it's a postmodern, uh, you know, creation, which kind of focuses on the idea that, you know, words mean things, but they also require somebody to read it in order to make sense of it, right? So it, it, it doesn't exist in isolation. Textual production by an AI does, cannot exist in isolation unless there is a reader who is human and is able to make sense of it, uh, which then to a certain extent translates into particular kinds of expressions and particular kinds of ways in which we experience what it means. Um, so yes, in that context, you know, uh, you can continuously use uh, you know, inputs that are being provided by users and Tay, uh, which was basically released by Microsoft, I think two or three years ago on Twitter is a great example of it, right? I kind of learned from the responses that it was getting and increasingly and very quickly became racist in about 16 hours, which tells you more about Twitter users than it tells about the AI per se, right? Especially in America, because these systems are being used in China on an everyday basis and are pretty successful. These conversations are happening and, you know, some of these AI systems are actually, uh, you know, have uh, celebrity status, you know? Uh, so, you know, stories like I do do uh, are actually coming real in a, in a, in, in, in a Chinese uh, imagination, right? So uh, how we think about textual production uh, is fundamentally a question of where is the data that is being used in order to produce the kind of text that machine learning algorithms are producing or these you know, uh, conversational bots are producing. Where is it borrowed from? What, what, is it, uh, what does you know, that collection allow us to, uh, allow these machines to do? And what do they cluster and topic model together in order to basically express certain conversations? So this is all, you know, more about human expression and a, and a reflection of human expression than it is about the ability of machines to distinguish between right and wrong. To, to add to that, you know, I, I mean, I full, full disclosure, I used to, I worked for Microsoft as a postdoc before my current job, which was very interesting. Um, uh, and 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 one one thing to say is that is that, and I don't think this is this is spilling any kind of secret, which is to say that the Tay and the bad press it created was was a real motivator for people across the company, a motivator and a, and a, and a concept that helped. Um, help point to the, the dangers of getting this stuff wrong, actually. And so and so having such a high profile, um, uh, such a high profile um, uh, fiasco, you know, you know, it was it created a kind of conceptual language for people to talk to each other about the dangers of, of, of AI ethics and bias um, within the company, which was kind of interesting. Um, but the but the second thing I would say, right, is is that um, that a lot, I mean, a, a lot of human um, textual interaction pre-AI is pretty formulaic, right? Which is interesting, right? So, so we, there's, there, are speed, there are all kinds of letter conventions, speech conventions, journalistic conventions, right? I mean, uh, and, and the most successful AI systems, right? Have been the ones where, the, where, where, where those conventions, or the most successful AI text generation systems are the ones that, are, that have been the most formulaic, right? Block scores and stuff like that. And, and so I guess one of the, one of the questions then is, to think about the way that 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 genre and and the kind of the kind of you know the formulas of genre um you know are reinterpreted and tweaked and made new and changed by by human expression right and 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 whether those formulas are you know well not even whether they can be expressed changed and tweaked by ai expression but what do you, as you're saying Renji, what would that even you know what what it would even mean I mean, the, 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 the ai isn't actually expressing anything it's, re, it's recombining text and so that and so that the human user who's who's drawing some novelty out of the that recombination of text that yeah that's a, a that's more about the human than the ai but it also 
you know, I, I think I think literary scholars could tell tell us a lot about the 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 formulaicness of of language, but then also then the the variation within the formulaicness of language. But I but I mean I, I mean the, the but of course the, the going back to your point, right? Um, you know, the the issue with these systems, right, is is one of the ways in which they are incredibly formulaic is is in, in reproducing existing bigotry, right? So so if they have this big text corpus of transphobic or or Islamophobic material, if you ask them a question about Islam or or trans people, they will reproduce bigotry because because that, there's a lot of that in the world, and that's that's the text they use. Carla, can you speak? Sure. About this question as well. Yes. Okay, sure. I my path follows the same as Luke and Reddit. It's about data collection. It's the first uh, step we have to think about. We most think about bias. So where does this data come from? We discussed a lot about JPT3 and the data come from Reddit. So <laughs> you look that and look, okay, what what is happening on Reddit and what can be really useful and to evaluate if it is useful you need a human i don't know how we could correct this problem how we can use humans to evaluate all oh, this uh this uh basis is correct is not so text has a lot of this human interpretation and reading and how how to automate and i think with following this line we're going to come back to emotions so what this text uh, make me feel how this text make me feel, make me feel uh, injured, make me feel sad, make me feel um, harmed in any way. So I think uh, these this problems with language models uh, wrap up what we discussed here, emotions, data, bias, cultures. I think it's a good example of how things can be wrong and how it can be complex as well. Carla, can you start to answer th this question? Uh, what are the status quo of AI development in Latin America? And other others, words, what are the characteristics of AI development in Latin America? Okay, I believe I can share only about Brazilian context. Actually, that's one of my... Uh, potential drawbacks in my career. I don't have a lot of, I don't have been getting in touch a lot with uh, other uh, countries in Brazil. One of the reasons is language because Brazilian is the only <laughs> uh, country in Latin America that speaks Portuguese and the other countries speak Spanish. I'm learning Spanish, Spanish for that as well. So I think I can share about Brazil. I shared uh, some of our context about face and recognition technology, but the main problem is we see Brazil, Brazilian researchers uh, can agree with me, but when we say about, when we talk about computer science and artificial intelligence, we think in Brazil is in the periphery of this development or in the periphery of this technology, because there are a lot of, a lot of countries ahead on this research, ahead on this topic, ahead on uh, developing techniques. We feel this way, personally, I feel this way sometimes. But at the same time, it's hard because a lot of, uh, uh, how can I say, journals and publications you have to do, evaluate different things that we would evaluate in our context. So it's hard to think how we can share our research, our needs, our issues f from our context with people and researchers from other countries. I believe this kind of conference is a really nice way to do that. Mozilla Festival was a, a really nice festival because it had a lot of panels and sessions from India, from co uh, countries that we not from the North or not from the West. So uh, I believe this is the kind of uh, way I'm, I've been trying to share more about Brazilian context. I feel we feel this way and have been trying to learn and participate more on these discussions on ethics and AI debates so we can share more what we are building here. 
and what are our really needs. So I, do, I cannot speak for Latin America at all because I don't have a lot of context on that. Well, that's it. But there are a lot of people good in Latin America. In the previous pattern, panel, there are people from Latin America, from other countries than, rather than Brazil. I've been studying from colonialism from some authors from Latin America, like Ihano, any other uh, authors. I can share the names on the chat as well, but that's the what I had to say. Just quickly add, I think, you know, uh, please feel free to correct me on this, but uh, one of the things uh, that I have noticed, especially coming out of Brazilian scholarship on, uh, on data extractivism in particular, uh, is that it draws its lineage from the way in which uh, the extractivism happens in the Amazon forests. And there's this beautiful linkage between the way in which uh, the experience of the Amazon is mapped onto the experience of internet technologies, which I find really fascinating. Uh, and uh, I might be wrong about this, but if this is there's a lineage there, I would love to know more about it. I think there is. I don't have a lot of context from Brazil. One of the things I, I, I can share is not a research made by me, but it's a uh, Brazilian research is Chiani Neves. I can't write her name. She's researching about how other countries outside Brazil see Amazon forests. Why? Because in Amazonia, there are a lot of women that are really digital activists about uh, their problems in the north of Brazil. And when you search for Amazon or Amazon forest, all you're going to see is the uh, lung of the world, oxygen, and a lot of things that our government wants people to see. And not actually the digital activism of these people. And she's researching how uh, social media algorithms are perpetuating this kind of stereotype and not sharing their perspectives and activism in their area in the northeast of Brazil. So I believe there's a lot of common sense. I can connect you to her later. I think it would be really, really nice to talk to her and get some perspectives about uh, their, their fight and activism in the north and how she's trying to understand the problem of social media and algorithms in sharing their activism. So I will share the name here, but I can send to you later. Just as a quick follow up, um, I mean, first, first, I would say, I mean, I think it's a, a, a more, more a, a, a problem that, that uh, those of us working in, in North America and Europe don't have the don't know about how the context of these things are working in the rest of the world. That's that's more a problem for us and on us than anything else. Um, I I mean I I think and partially because you know so I'm a I'm a historian and and so one of the things that being a historian. Um, if there's utility in being a historian in the context of new technologies and this constant sense of novelty, it's it's trying to sort of figure out what is new, which is often the technical capacities of particular things, and what isn't new, right? And there's lots of lots of here that isn't new, and and the kind of, you know, the the apparatuses of of colonial uh, settler colonial power, colonial power, you know. Um, uh, is not new and 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 ties tie you know ties a number of places in the world together under in this kind of common experience around extractivism. One of the places is Canada, right? So Canada is also a, an extractive state. I'm Canadian uh, settler settler uh, Canadian, um, you know. But but and and one of the interesting things about Canada is that our government has really tried very hard to boost and and talk up AI as an industry, you know, particularly kind of kind of ethical AI or responsible AI. Um, in, in part because there's our the Canadian economy is really centered on, you know, timber mining, oil, oil especially, right? Which of course is a big, big issue, um, and uh, and so and so there's this kind of this kind of real tension around pu pushing a lot of emphasis on on AI as the shiny and new thing, while still relying very much on extractive technologies. I mean, one one other thing I just wanted to, to flag is the work. Um, of Jason Lewis at Concordia University, uh, who with a bunch of other folks has developed a really amazing um, uh, set of, of, of scholarship around indigenous AI. Um, and I don't, I don't know if he's engaged um, with the indigenous people in Brazil or the Amazon or not, but he, he I'm just finding his, uh, his uh, website here. 
right, this idea of, of AI created, you know, by and for indigenous people around the world um, and, and, and how that would look like and what, what, how that would work. So that, that's an, you know, that, that's a kind, of, a kind of unifying thread that might be connects, connects different, different parts of the world. Rafael, can you speak? Great. Great to, to, to hear from you, Luke, Ranjit, and, and Carla. Uh, I have a, a, a question uh, for all. The debate on AI ethics or, or ethical AI is very, very controversial, uh, principally from uh, big tech, especially after Chinib Jebru uh, uh, was, was fired. What do you think about the future of the, this debate? And, and um, from Luke, I would really like to hear from you about the role of work of labor on your research. Thanks. Well, I, <laughs> we always start together. No, go, start... go, no <laughs> go for it. Uh, you, you, you should answer the first question and then I'll, then I'll, I'll, at, I'll append the labor point to my, okay, my answer. Okay, Jim. So two minutes of firing really touched me because I believe some two months before that, I had the opportunity to have a one-on-one -on -one meeting and interview her about her career and working and how she was an aspiration and inspiring example of research and of an AI and a real AI ethicist. And I believe her, uh, all this situation is going to change many things. Google has been losing its how researchers see them and their solutions and their uh, can we can and a lot of debates emerging from that. Can we really build a ethical AI inside companies? Can we build ethical AI in research that are funded by big techs? So I believe that's the kind of debate is in my head as a student. Can, could I ever be able to build in real uh, AI ethics and responsible AI inside big companies? Or I am just dreaming and this is not possible in capitalism at all. And we have to think of more independent solutions and think about more uh, community impacted solutions and decentralize this kind of research. In Brazil, we don't have a lot of funded research by big companies, but other countries like United States is a lot of common, that kind of research in Brazil did, doesn't happen inside universities and not as happens in other countries. But this made me think in my future, in my career, like, am I going to the right place? How, Am I doing the right thing? How can I really trust the solutions that are being created? So that's the kind of a lot of confusing thoughts that are in my mind. I know it's confusing, but it's confusing for me too. Uh, I'm think I've been thinking a lot of about that. What I can follow with my PhD in the future, what I'm going to do, what are the possibilities? Google was one of the possibilities. Now I'm thinking about big companies and are they really a possibility or I'm going to be uh, limited or my rights are going to be limited as a, a Latin American woman. So I have been thinking a lot about that. Luke, do you want to go next? No, go, go ahead, Ranchi. Okay. So um, this is how I would place this relationship. You know, one of the one of the ways in which we are thinking about ethics uh, is kind of rooted fundamentally in the idea of an adversarial relationship between machines and humans, right? So any conception of the idea of human-centered AI is, is basically centered on the notion that, you know, we need to basically first figure out humanness and, you know, then figure out how do we make uh, these machines to be centered on the human experience you know, one way or the other which simultaneously seems to me to suggest that, you know, AI is the enemy and we need to basically figure out how to actually make it work for us one way or the other. In my experience, and I think the future of uh, how we think about AI ethics uh, should ideally take this into consideration is that, you know, it's not a one-way street. It's not something that, you know, 
these machines will simply keep being shaped by what we want them to do. We are constantly changing because of these technologies too. So if we have to take a more holistic framework of AI ethics into consideration, I would argue that there needs to be constant thought as well as uh, constant push towards thinking about how our relationship with these systems are mutually shaping each other. It's not just that we are being shaped by these technologies, we are also simultaneously shaping them one way or the other through our data, through, our, through the ways in which uh, you know, these technologies are developed in a workplace in the first place, right? There are, you know, there's a lot of human work that goes into building these technologies and that's what makes them the way they work, right? So in a way, you know, taking a step back and thinking about what is this, what is it about this relationship that we want to change? And what are the ethical positions that we can take in order for that change to manifest in the world should come from a position which is kind of focused on mutual shaping rather than treating these systems as adversaries. That's what I would say. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I I, I agree with with all of that. With with the, with the addition with that, you know that. Uh, I don't I don't want to jump. I don't want to wade in, into the question of the agency of of. of artificial intelligence systems or of objects more broadly. But I think, right, I think that 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 certainly, and this ties to the point, um, Raphael, you made about labor, right? Certainly at the moment, automation systems, you know, are are very much, you know, are very much being deployed by particular people with particular interests, you know, and often particular powerful people with particular powerful interests. And and so I I think, you know, we can't lose sight of of that, which is which is that these these as tools as part of these broader sociotechnical systems um you know are are about power and and so i think i mean there's i mean there's a lot of low hanging fruit in the context of of corporations of regulation to just get a sense of what is actually going on you know how, how what what are the what what are the different impacts these systems are having um you know how do companies know what impacts they're having they often don't they often have no idea in lots of ways um and, but of course, we also know that that um, many of the metrics by which these systems have impact um, uh, are not those that are legible or desirable to be legible to corporations or even necessarily to governments, right? So we're doing a project here in London, Ontario, about a new system that um, is being developed to predict chronic homelessness. We have a very, a very bad homelessness problem here in, in London, as in many Canadian cities, because of the price of real estate um, and the lack of affordable housing. And you know, and so, and so again, going and 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 working with and, and not just not just recording the stories, but trying to help make the stories of people who are affected by these systems actionable. Right, um, and and it seems like an important thing to be doing in, in, in this space in the future. Um, so I think I think ethics is in some ways the low hanging fruit. I mean, I think it's the question of of, of the, the societal values that um, that we collectively, with, with all of the fraught implications of what the, who the, that we is and how we get there. Right, um, uh, you know what? How, how you know how how do we make those decisions as a polity? Uh, you know. And, and make sure that that the voices of everybody, and particularly the most disenfranchised, are heard. Well, um, you have uh, more one more more questions for Luke. Uh, perhaps you were read oh, when there the this or say this. So I apologize if I missed that. But what do you think about the fact that emotional reactors and the responses are culturally and socially diverse? And how would that be responsive to be developers in terms of potential beings? Well, so I'll, I'll answer this by, by looping back to what something that Ranjit just said about the way that we are shaped by these systems and, and shaped by them in turn. And I think one of the things that I, I'm concerned about is the, you know, the, the, the balance of force bet between those, those two um, shape, forms of shaping. And I think, I think that, um, so I do worry about, about the homogenization of diverse forms of emotive expression. Um, but I, uh, and I, and I also worry about, um, you know, I mean, I, I, I think I think even in the context of a kind of more, 
you know, varied or more granular or maybe more culturally specific, you know, sets of emotion to recognition technologies. I think, you know, you're still, you're still, you're, you're, you know, you might have more boxes, but you're still creating boxes, right? You're still, um, which is something that, again, goes well beyond AI. This is a, a kind of hallmark of a lot of techno science. Um, you know, and so I think this is where, where going back to Carla, Carla was saying critical race theory and uh, critical race theory technology is so valuable in that it, you know, it, it forces us to think about the, the way that technologies of classification like like racial categories themselves, right? Um, you know, are you know are are you know are always the way in which power gets expressed, and are always in some ways, you know, they 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 can be they 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 they're, they're always they're they're limit they're generally limiting in, in ways that that aren't um, aren't great for human autonomy. So so that's I think I think even if we have more kind of technical diversity um, uh, around a mode of expression, I think I think it's still a problem. I don't have uh, more any questions, but uh, I I would like if you have uh, have any ideas, anything is. Do you like uh, uh, do you like us uh, speak? I would just like to uh, you know take a moment and uh, you know ask all of you to reflect on the exercise that I gave you. And if it's possible, share some of your responses with me. That would be really useful in terms of just thinking about, you know, how you kind of conceptualize the way in which you approach these issues. Where does it come from? What emotion does it express? And what does it serve as a function for you? Uh, reflecting on these ideas are is of fundamental importance, not only in the way in which the scholarship around these issues develops, but also as a way of thinking about what, what is it at stake for us in order for us to use these concepts in order to describe the world in which we live in. So, uh, you know, think about it uh, and uh, I'm gonna share my email with all of you. And if you can write to me uh, as, as, with, with a response, I would be very grateful, thank you. Great. I just want to say, oh, sorry. Oh, I was going to say, I thought that that's such a, such a rich activity, Ranjit. I, I love it. And I was trying to take notes about my con the, the concept I was thinking of, which is expertise. And I, I it's actually really challenging. It's like, there's a lot. So this is great. So I'll, I'll send you mine. And to thank, and thank everybody, to thank, thank um, Evelyn for your moderation. Uh, thank you, Raphael. Thank you, uh, Carla and Ranjit. This has been such a, such a generative panel. I really have appreciated it very much. So all I can say is thanks for the invitation. Thanks, Evelyn, for your moderation. Thanks, everyone who participated. Thanks, Randy, and look for meeting you. It was really nice. I hope you can keep in touch. And Randy, I am thinking about your question and your exercise. It's really hard, actually. <laughs> I, I chose interpretability and because I I always think I am trying to build interpretable model, but what does this mean? How it makes me feel? It's really hard for everyone that has been researching about it, but I, I will try to think more. I think it can help me with my research and ask more questions than trying to uh, get answers. I think it's always important to have good questions and not good answers. So that's it. Thanks for your attention. Thank you so much. I'm really grateful. Thank you very much, uh, Ranjit. Ranjit uh, uh, has worked very well on, on dating society with an impressive work. And I'm looking forward to read uh, the new book of Luke Stark. And uh, the Carla Vieira is uh, working in an impressive work in a Perifa Code. And I'm really, really glad uh, uh, to be here uh, with you. And um, I would thank you to, uh, to Antonio Casilli, uh, who we are, uh, are here uh, uh, with us. And uh, Histories of AI, Imaginaries and Materialities, we will be back tomorrow uh, discussing work, music, automation, gender, with people like Sarah Roberts, Shanai Sher, Janet Abbott, Mariana Valenti, and so on and so on and so on. And, and tomorrow we will be back 
Thank you very much. A Histories of AI is co-hosted by DigiLibro Research Lab and, and uh, University of Cambridge. Thank you very much, Evelyn, for your moderation. See you tomorrow. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.